Dr. Mondra, please go ahead. This is Arnold Monto from the University of Michigan. I'd like to welcome the members, the guests, and especially the public to this, the 182nd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biologics, uh, Pro Bro Biological Products Advisory Committee. Today, we meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of the strain or strains to be included in the periodic updated COVID-19 vaccine for the 2023-2024 vaccination campaign. I'd like to turn the chair over to uh, Dr. Suzanne Paydar, the designated federal officer who's going to give the administrative announcements, do the roll call, introduce the committee, and read the conflict of interest statements. Dr. Paydar. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Good morning, everyone. This is Susan Paydar, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer for today's 182nd Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER, and the committee, I'm happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the periodic updated COVID-19 vaccines for the 2023-2024 vaccination campaign. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on May 4th, 2023. At this time, I would like to acknowledge outstanding leadership of Dr. Peter Marks, Director of Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Dr. David Caslow, um, Director of Office of Vaccines Research and Review, Dr. Ware, Director of Division of Viral Products, OVRR, and Dr. Sudakar Agnihotram, Acting Senior Advisor to the Office Director, Office of Vaccines Research and Review. I also would like to thank my Division Director, Dr. Prabha Atreya, for her excellent leadership and my team, Ms. Joanne Lipkind and Ms. Uh, Lisa Johnson, whose contributions have been critical for preparing today's meeting. Excuse, also, me, excuse me, Susan, no slides are showing. Um, Devante, would you be kind to show the leadership slide first? Great. And then um, this is the leadership slide that I was just talking about. And then the following slide is my own DSAC team. Great. That's Dr. Atreya with the team. Um, I would also like to express our sincere appreciation to our AV team, Dr. Devante Stephenson, Mr. Christopher Sweat, and Mr. Derek Bonner in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FDA staff working very hard behind the scenes, trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one like all the previous FERPAC meetings. Please direct any press media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at fdaoma at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptionists for today's meeting are Catherine Diaz, and Deborah de la Croce from Translation Excellence. We will begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and temporary voting members. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera, unmute your phone, and then state your first and last name, institution, and areas of expertise. And when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please see the member roster slides in which we'll begin with the chair, Dr. Arnold Monto. Dr. Monto, can we start, please? Thank you, uh, Suzanne. I'm Arnold Monto. I am uh, at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where I am an infectious disease epidemiologist, and I've worked on vaccines and uh, occurrence of especially respiratory infection and their prevention. Great. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Next is Dr. Paula Annunziato non-voting member, our industry representative, Dr. Annunziata. Good morning. 
That doesn't look like my video has started. Well, good morning. My name is Paula Annunziata. I lead the infectious diseases and vaccines area at Merck, and I'm here today as the non-voting industry representative. Great. Thank you, Dr. Annunziata. Next is Dr. Adam Berger. There we go. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Berger. I'm the director of the Division of Clinical and Healthcare Research Policy at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I'm a geneticist by training with additional uh, training in immunology. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Next is Dr. Um, Hank Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra and Northwell. Uh, my areas of expertise are pediatrics and vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Next is Dr. Archana Chatterjee. Dr. Chatterjee. Good morning, everyone. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Rosalind Franklin University in North Chicago. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist by background and training with uh, expertise in the area of vaccines. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next is Captain Amanda Cohn. Dr. Cohn. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, a pediatrician and a medical epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, with expertise in um, vaccines and vaccine preventable diseases. Thank you. Next is Captain David Kim. Dr. Kim. Good morning. Uh, David Kim with the National Vaccine Program representing the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS. And my interest is in, uh, is in uh, immunization and uh, and vaccine policy. Great, thank you so much. Next is Dr. Paul Offit. Dr. Offit. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Paul Offit. I am an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. A professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and my area of interest is vaccines, specifically mucosal vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Offit. Next is Dr. Stephen Pergam. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Pedar. Um, I'm Steve Pergam. I'm a professor at Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Center, um, an adult infectious disease physician with an interest in um, infections and immunocompromised host. Great. Thank you, Dr. Pergam. Uh, next is Dr. Stanley Perlman. Dr. Perlman. Good morning. I am a professor of microbiology and immunology and of pediatrics at the University of Iowa. I am a, my specialty is pediatric infectious disease, and I've studied coronaviruses for many years. Great. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Next is Dr. Eric Rubin. Dr. Good morning. Rubin. Good morning. Um, I'm at uh, the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, the uh, Harvard Medical School, Rigman Women's Hospital, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and I'm an infectious disease doctor who studies tuberculosis. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Um, next, we will do a roll call of our temporary voting members. I'll begin with Dr. Bruce Gellin. Dr. Gellin. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Bruce Gellin. I'm Chief of Global Public Health Policy uh, Strategy at the Rockefeller Foundation with expertise in internal medicine, infectious diseases, epidemiology, and vaccine policy. Thanks. Great, thank you. Next is Dr. Randy Hawkins, our alternate consumer representative. representative. Dr. Hawkins. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Randy Hawkins, I'm an internist and pulmonary physician in private practice, Charles University of Medicine and Science. Thank you so much. Next is Dr. James Hildreth. Dr. Hildreth. Good morning, I'm James Hildreth, the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College. I'm also a professor of internal medicine. I'm an immunologist by training, and I'm interested in viral pathogenesis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Jeanette Lee. Yes, I'm, uh, my name is Jeanette Lee. I'm a professor of biostatistics and a member of Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Institute at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Next is Dr. Ofer Levy. Hi, good morning. My name is Ofer Levy. I'm a physician and a uh, uh, 
pediatric infectious disease specialist at Boston Children's Hospital, where I direct uh, the precision vaccines program and academic program uh, applying precision medicine uh, principles for discovery and development of vaccines. Uh, a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Next is Dr. Pamela McInnes. Good morning, Pamela McInnes, the retired deputy director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the NIH. Thank you, Dr. McInnes. And next is Dr. Cody Meissner. Dr. Meissner. Good morning, Dr. Padar. <clears throat> My name is Cody Meissner. I'm professor of pediatrics and medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. And I am a vaccine subject matter expert at BARDA in the Department of Health and Human Services. I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Over. Great, thank you so much. Next is Dr. Michael Nelson. Good morning, thank you. I'm Mike Nelson. I'm a trained allergist immunologist. I'm chief of the asthma allergy immunology division in the Department of Medicine at the University of Virginia. I'm also president of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. My interest is in vaccine immune responses and rare adverse events. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Next is Dr. R. Triangold. Uh, good Good, good morning, everyone. Art Reingold. I'm a, an infectious disease epidemiologist at the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you, Dr. Reingold. Next is Dr. Mark Sawyer. I'm Mark Sawyer. I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist at UC San Diego and Rady Children's Hospital of San Diego. My expertise is in the area of vaccines and vaccine policy. Thank you so much. Next, and last but not least, Dr. Melinda Wharton. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm an adult infectious disease physician, and I've been at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the Immunization Program for many years, uh, where I work in vaccine program and policy, and I trained as an adult infectious disease physician. Thank you so much, Dr. Wharton. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we have a total of 22 participants, 21 voting and one non-voting member. Now I proceed with reading the FDA conflict of interest disclosure statement for the public record. The Food and Drug Administration FDA is convening virtually today, June 15, 2023, the 182nd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VRPAC, under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA of 1972. Dr. Arnold, Ron, uh, Dr. Arnold Monto is serving as the chair for today's meeting. Today on June 15, 2023, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the periodic updated COVID-19 vaccines for the 2023-2024 vaccination campaign. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties, PMISP. With the exception of industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting members of the VRPAC are appointed special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee, uh, on this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 USC section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE and SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential conflict, um, uh, conflict of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purposes of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agencies need 
or special government employee services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interest involved, or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, there have been one conflict of interest waiver issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as temporary voting members, Dr. Bruce Gillen, Dr. Randy Hawkins, Dr. James Hildreth, Dr. Jeanette Lee, Dr. Ofra Levy, Dr. Pamela McGuinness, Dr. Cody Meissner, Dr. Michael Nelson, Dr. Art Rangel, Dr. Mark Sawyer, and Dr. Melinda Wharton. Among these consultants, Dr. James Hildreth, a special government employee, has been issued a waiver for his participation in today's meeting. The waiver was posted on the FDA website for public disclosure. Dr. Paula Annunziato of Merck will serve as an industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Dr. Randy Hawkins is serving as the alternate consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed as special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. We have several federal and non-federal speakers, as well as some guest speakers today making various presentations on timely and relevant topics. The following speakers and guest speakers for this meeting have been screened for their conflicts of interest and cleared to participate as speakers for today's meeting. Dr. Rituparna Das, Vice President, Clinical Development, COVID-19 Vaccines, Moderna Incorporated, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Flip Dubovsky, Executive Vice President and Novavax Chief Medical Officer, Novavax, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Dr. Darin Edwards, Executive Director, COVID-19 Lead, Moderna Incorporated, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Ruth Link Gellis, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Public Health Service, Epidemiologist, Division of Viral Diseases, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, Center for Disease Control, CDC, Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Kanta Subarao, Director, WHO, Collaborating Center for Research and Reference on Influenza, the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, Professor, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, the University of Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Dr. Kenneth Swanson, Vice President, Viral Vaccines, Vaccine Research and Development, Pfizer Incorporated, New York, New York. Dr. Natalie Thornburg, Acting Chief Laboratory Branch, Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Viruses Division, National Center for Immunizations and Respiratory Diseases, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, Atlanta, Georgia. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers, guest speakers and responders follows applicable federal laws, regulations and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firms its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from the discussion and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of the conflict of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to our chair, Dr. Monta. Thank you, Dr. Monta. Thank you, Dr. Paydar. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce the FDA uh, speakers. Uh, first, we are going to hear from the uh, director of the uh, center, uh, Dr. Peter Marks, 
who will give us introductory remarks. He will be followed by Dr. David Caslow, Director of the Office of Vaccine Research and Review. Uh, and Dr. Caslow will talk about the considerations for selection of the composition of COVID-19 vaccines for the 2023-2024 season. Dr. Marks. Thanks very much, Dr. Monto. <clears throat> so my remarks will be brief. I wanna thank the members of the advisory committee, uh, today's speakers, the FDA staff, and those of you from the public joining today's 182nd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biologics Products Advisory Committee. Though we're now at a period during which the number of new COVID-19 cases has declined notably, we still have SARS coronavirus 2, the cause of COVID-19, um, as something that could be a real concern in the future, particularly as we move into the 2023-2024 winter season, when we're concerned that we may have another wave of COVID-19 during a time when the virus has further evolved, immunity of the population has waned further, and we move indoors for winter time. For this reason, we're gathered today and look forward to a robust discussion of the optimal composition for the 2023-2024 COVID-19 vaccines. We look forward to this discussion. Uh, and to conclude, I just want to thank everyone for their contributions today to this very important topic. Thank you. Good morning, um, and from the Office of Vaccines Research and Review, let me add my welcome to the 182nd meeting of IRPEC and my thanks to the committee, the presenters, and the center and office staff for their preparation for this meeting. This is really a follow-up meeting of the 26 January 2023 VRPAC, where three topics were reviewed and discussed. Harmonization of the strain composition across all ages and doses, simplification of the immunization schedule, and an approach to periodic updates of authorized and approved COVID-19 vaccines. Before reviewing today's meeting's objectives, which is focused on the third topic, strain selection for the anticipated 2023-2024 COVID-19 vaccination campaign, I'd like to start by providing a brief update on what's happened since the 26th January VRPAC meeting. Next slide, please. Thank you. Two noteworthy actions were taken both in April. First was the consolidation of emergency use authorizations to harmonize the strain composition from monovalent original strain to bivalent original plus Omicron BA45 for all ages and all doses of mRNA vaccines authorized in the United States. And also in that EUA consolidation and an initial simplification of the immunization schedule, which I will, re which I will review briefly. And secondly, a workshop on recombinant protein-based COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide, please. With the consolidation of EUAs in April, an initial step was taken towards a simplified age and risk-based immunization schedule for future periodic vaccination campaigns, where a single dose of a periodic updated COVID-19 vaccine would be approved for most of the U.S. population, including most adults, adolescents, and older children, and young children previously vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine. And one or more additional doses would be approved for older adults and persons with compromised immunity, as well as young children not previously vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. In follow-up to the discussion at the 26 January VRPAC on the importance of recombinant protein-based alternatives to mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, FDA and BARDA co-hosted a joint workshop focused on recombinant protein-based vaccines to discuss the timely availability of additional updated COVID-19 vaccines 
beyond the current nucleic acid vac vaccines for periodic vaccination campaigns. The workshop reviewed the current epidemiology and five vaccine platforms from bacteria to filamentous fungi and yeast to insect and mammalian cells, followed by a roundtable discussion on achieving timelines to launch these vaccines simultaneous with mRNA-based vaccines. Next slide. So on to today's meeting, the objective of which is to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of a strain or strains to be included in periodic updated COVID-19 vaccines for the 2023-2024 vaccination campaign. FDA requests that VRPAC consider and focus on three topics today. First, the need for a periodic update. Second, a change from the current bivalent to a monovalent composition. And third, selection of strain or strains if there's a need for a periodic update. Next slide, please. Thank you. To ensure we start today's review and discussion on the same page, I will briefly review the approach to periodic updates of current COVID-19 vaccines that was proposed at the 26th January VRPAC meeting. As you will hear again in several presentations today, the virus continues to evolve rapidly and immunity wanes, such that restoration of a protective immunity will require vaccination with a periodically updated COVID-19 vaccine. In response, FDA envisions an evidence-driven approach to monitor and update as needed the composition used in all COVID-19 vaccines with the goal to induce or restore protective immunity through periodic vaccination campaigns. Next slide, please. As reviewed in January, this slide attempts to capture at a very high level, the proposed continuous and iterative three-step process in which integrated epidemiologic, clinical and viral surveillance viral characterization at the gene, phenotype, and antigen level, and vaccine effectiveness are integrated and reviewed to determine the need for an updated composition recommendation. While in parallel and at risk, updated vaccine candidates are evaluated so that if and when a recommendation is made, manufacturers can, in a second step, submit to FDA a timely data package of their periodic updated vaccines for regulatory review. In the third step, real world evidence of the effectiveness of newly updated vaccines is collected and analyzed, which also starts the next three step process. In essence, the review and discussion of the integrated data in step one and the vaccine candidate data generated at risk by manufacturers in step two are the core of today's agenda, which is shown in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So we'll start the morning session with two presentations, both from our colleagues at CDC. The first presentation provides an update on bivalent vaccine effectiveness. The second CDC presentation, an update on the current epidemiology and circulating variants. We'll end that session with a presentation by the chair of the World Health Organization's Technical Advisory Group on COVID-19 vaccine composition to review the TAG-COVAC 18 May 2023 recommendation on the antigen composition of COVID-19 vaccines. After a short break, we'll next hear from the three currently authorized vaccine manufacturers, starting with Moderna. Next slide. Please, thank you. Then Pfizer and Novavax on their 2023-2024 vaccine candidates. After a 30-minute lunch break, VRPAC will reconvene for the open public hearing session, which will be followed by FDA's presentation on considerations and recommendation for changes to COVID-19 vaccine strain composition. The FDA presentation will be followed by an additional 20 minute question and answer session for CDC, FDA and sponsor presentations. After a short break, the committee will reconvene an open session to discuss 
whether there's a need to make a strain change for the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines. If so, whether there should also be a change from a bivalent to a monovalent vaccine composition. And if so, should the monovalent candidate be an XBB lineage derived vaccine candidate? After that discussion, the committee will be asked to vote on the following question. Next slide, please. For the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines in the United States, does the committee recommend a periodic update of the current vaccine composition to a monovalent XBB lineage? Please vote yes, no, or abstain. After voting on the question, we then ask the committee to discuss the following topic. Next slide, please. Based on the evidence and other considerations presented, please discuss selection of a specific XBB lineage, for example, XBB 1.5, XBB.1.16, or XBB.2.3, for inclusion in the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines in the United States. After that discussion, the meeting is due to adjourn. And with that, I'll turn the floor back to you, our chair, Dr. Monto. Thank you, Dr. Marks and Dr. Caslow. We have a few minutes for questions about uh, what Dr. Uh, Caslow presented in terms of uh, the program for today's vote and then discussion. Uh, so questions for Dr. Marks and Dr. Castle, please raise your hands. I don't see any hands raised as yet. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Monto, there are two hands raised by me and Dr. Gellin. Okay, you and go Dr. ahead. Bernstein, <laughs> and now Dr. Gellin. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, I found the uh, brief description of the workshop by Barda intriguing about the possibility of development of protein-based vaccines. And I'm wondering if more can be said about FDA's uh, assessment of the landscape there and the anticipated trajectory of that approach towards coronavirus vaccines. Uh, thank you for that question. Maybe what I can do is just very briefly um, give a couple of key takeaways from that from that workshop. Um, first, we heard from BARDA on Project Next uh, Next Gen and their strategy for that, and the the work that's involved in COVID nineteen um, vaccines, which includes a centralized immunogenicity assay, harmonized clinical trial support, and support for early phase clinical trial manufacturing. Um, Second and most obvious was a, a clear call um, from developers for early guidance on strain selection. While many of the recombinant protein-based technologies can work with a 100-day window, it doesn't leave a lot of time for overcoming manufacturing technical problems that might arise, uh, nor for generating preclinical and certainly clinical um, immunogenicity data to inform strain selection. Um, Third, it's clear that some work needs to occur at risk, and you'll hear about that um, today from all three manufacturers. Um, but again, guidance on strains before the recommendation is made so that that at-risk um, work can, can proceed. And then finally, we heard about some of the platform strengths. Um, and for some of the, the, these um, platforms, actually new strain candidates can be manufactured quite quickly. Um, others can be rapidly um, scaled up, and, and others we heard about have um, and can provide more breadth or durability, um, and, and that's part of their, their vaccine platform. Um, in short, what I can say is, is that um, recombinant protein-based platforms should be pursued, as should other platforms, um, as follow on first generation vaccines, but as we'll hear uh, and see in project next generation for the next generation of vaccines that may address um, things like durability, breadth, and potentially transmission. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. It is going to be important to have additional shots on goal. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Gellin. Yeah, David, thank you. Some of this may come up in the further discussions, but it'd be interesting to get some definitions on well, what, quote, campaign means and what periodic means. But David, for you, it looks like step one is some, some, what, what triggers the review that would then lead to some consideration of an update? Thanks. Thank you, Bruce, for that. And we'll go into, we will go into detail on, on some of those, those, those topics. What I think we envision is actually a continuous iterative process. So this is constantly looking at vaccine effectiveness, um, evaluating that, and looking at the viral evolution and integrating that data to, together to decide, is there a need for a periodic, for a periodic update? So in essence, this is very similar, although it's different than um, what we do for, uh, for influenza. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, yeah, I, I had a similar thought as uh, Dr. Gellin. I really you know, was thinking that hybrid immunity uh, seems to be holding up quite well versus severe uh, disease disease and death, but less so as far as protection against infection. So I was trying to better understand when you use the word 20, the words 2023, 2024 campaign, because I think that could uh, create confusion uh, in, the, in the public as far as how we're uh, handling this or managing it. And uh, I don't think it's exactly the same as what we do with influenza. So I think it's a bit in flux. Agreed. Thank you, Dr. Reingold. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, so uh, going along with the parallel to influenza, I'm just curious if you'll be able to say anything about uh, attempts to coordinate with other countries and the international setting with regard to consistency of, of uh, the reformulation of COVID vaccines as we go forward. Thank you for that question, Dr. Rangel. Uh, absolutely. And I think that is one of the considerations that we're asking the committee to discuss as we talk about the, the strain selection. And so you will hear um, from the WHO, um, the, um, their, what their strain recommendation is. And you um, will also hear um, from Dr. Weir what the, um, what the readouts are from various other uh, global entities. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Last question. Thank you, Dr. Monto. My question is for um, the director. Both the WHO and the president have declared the public health emergency to be over. So are these vaccines going to be given full approval or are they going to get EUAs or do you still have the ability to use the UA UEA uh, mechanism? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hildreth. It's, it's actually a great question. It turns out that the public health emergency declaration, which is a Section 319 declaration, which is over, is separate from uh, the declaration of the secretary that allows us to make uh, medical products available under our emergency use authorization, which is a Section 564 declaration. <clears throat> So uh, we can still make products available under emergency use authorization. It is our intent, though, for adults as we move into uh, this fall, to the extent possible, to move as many of these over to licensed products um, through biologics licensed supplements. Whether we'll make it there for everything uh, and for all age ranges, probably not for every age range, but certainly for adults, we are going to be looking to try to work in that direction um, uh, for uh, as many products as we can. Um, uh, we do we do understand that um, having licensed products will help increase confidence. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity to say that although I, I think we all certainly agree that COVID-19 is not influenza, from a public health vaccination campaign standpoint, in which you need to make tens upon tens of millions of vaccine doses, get them deployed and get them into people's arms. And from the standpoint that people go inside in the United States uh, during, uh, at least in many states in the United States during the months of November through March, um, it reduces 
to a similar type of campaign, barring some exceptional development of a resistant uh, uh, virus uh, for us. So if, I think we're, what we're seeing here is I think we're, uh, though it's not influenza, for practical purposes, I think we have really a one chance uh, uh, this fall to get vaccines into arms um, uh, barring some, uh, again, some need to update further, which we will do um, uh, if, if need be. Um, but that's, I think, what what today's discussion is about, how to um, try to best come up with uh, what goes into uh, people's arms uh, to uh, offer the best protection during a period when I, I think we do believe we will have waning immunity uh, at least in uh, particularly in the older population, but probably throughout the population, as well as potential further evolution of the virus. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Thank you. And thanks to Dr. Marks and Dr. Caslow. Next, we're going to be hearing from the Centers for Disease Control. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Ruth Link Gellis, who is the program lead at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at CDC. Uh, she will be talking about the uh, giving us an update on COVID-19 vaccine bivalent e effectiveness. Dr. Link Ellis, please. Good morning and thanks for having me. Uh, today I'll be presenting a summary of vaccine effectiveness data available from CDC studies including vaccine effectiveness by variant period and among pregnant and, and immunocompromised people. Next slide. Before diving into VE, I wanted to first highlight current COVID-19 vaccination coverage in the U.S., shown here by age group. Although most adults have received at least one dose, next slide, a minority of, oh, yeah, a minority of Americans have received Sorry, go back one. A minority of Americans have received a bivalent dose, ranging from less than 8% in young adults to 43% in adults age 65 years and up. Next slide. Moving over to vaccine effectiveness, I will present updated estimates of bivalent VE by outcome and Omicron subvariant. I'll then provide an update on monovalent and bivalent VE in pregnant people and bivalent VE in adults with immunocompromising conditions. Next slide. I'll start by presenting data on VE by outcome and Omicron subvariant in adults with from CDC's Vision Network. Next slide. The Vision Network is a multi-state network based on electronic healthcare records. It uses a test negative design with cases having COVID-like illness and a positive PCR and controls having CLI with a negative PCR. Variant periods are designated for analysis based on the time when a novel sublineage, sublineage became predominant or more than 50% of the sequences in a study site's region. VE is adjusted here for age, sex, race and ethnicity, geographic region, and calendar time. Vaccination is determined via electronic healthcare record and state and city registries. Next slide. This slide shows absolute VE of monovalent and bivalent vaccines against hospitalization on the top and critical illness on the bottom, and includes updated estimates from those recently published in CDC's MMWR. Critical illness here is defined as admission to the ICU or COVID-19 associated death. Estimates for bivalent VE are shown by time since vaccination at seven to 59 days, 60 to 119 days, and 120 to 179 days. Note here in the red box, the median time since dose, which is nearly identical across the outcomes. Next slide. As you can see, uh, as you can see, VE of the monovalent dose shown here in orange with a median of over 13 months from vaccination is relatively low. Initially, VE of the bivalent dose shown in magenta is high, However, waning is evident, as evident against hospitalization on the top. Note the different pattern against the most critical illness shown on the bottom. Although VE drops somewhat, it appears more durable at 52%, a median of almost five months after the last dose. Next slide. This slide shows the same information as the previous slide, but, but now looking specifically at the, Omicron, at the period of Omicron BA45 sublineage predominance. 
Note first that the categories are slightly different here at seven to 89 days and 90 plus days, which was done due to the timing of the authorization of the, vac of the bivalent vaccine and the end of BA4-5 predominance. Next slide. Here we see a similar pattern for the two endpoints with maybe a hint of less waning for critical illness, though confidence intervals are wide and overlap. Note that we do not split out BQ1 and BQ1.1 here, though previous VE estimates were similar across these sublineages. Next slide. This slide again shows the same information as the previous slide, but now looking specifically at the period of Omicron XBB sublineage predominance. First, note the time since vaccination here, which is roughly one month longer for the bivalent booster groups due to the timing of XBB predominance. Here again, we see a pattern of waning against hospitalization with VE in the seven to 89 days since a bivalent booster of 51% and VE of in the 90 to 179 days of 20% and non-overlapping confidence intervals. The trend is different, however, for critical illness, where we see a much smaller decline in the point estimate over time and overlapping confidence intervals. However, note that the confidence interval for seven to 89 days is 64 points wide due to the timing of vaccine authorization and XBB predominance. Next slide. Uh, I'm sorry, one more. I'll now move on to discuss bivalent VE against hospitalization from the IV network. Next slide. The IV network is a multi-state VE platform that uses a prospective case control design. For this analysis, participants were from 25 hospitals in 20 states with hospitalization between September 8, 2022 and May 29, 2023. Participants are adults hospitalized with COVID-like illness. Cases have a SARS-CoV-2 positive PCR or antigen test and controls are negative for SARS-CoV-2 and influenza by uh, real-time PCR. Vaccination history is ascertained through EMRs, state and local vaccine registries, and self-report. Next slide. And here we have monovalent and bivalent VE against hospitalization in adults by time since last bivalent dose. VE of a monovalent dose, shown in orange, received a median of 393 days prior to vaccination, was 16%. IV data show the same pattern as vision data with bivalent VE against hospitalization shown in magenta decreasing with time since vaccination, though note that the confidence interval for the 120 to 179 days is quite wide. IV did not have power here to look at critical illness. Next slide. Here, VE estimates are broken down into three sublineage predominant periods, BA4-5 on the top, BQ1 in the middle, and XBB on the bottom. First, note the time periods for analysis are different for each of the sublineage periods, shown here in the red boxes. For BA4-5, VE is shown during the 7 to 59 days after the bivalent dose only. For BQ1, VE is shown for 7 to 59 days and 60 to 119 days. And for XBB, VE is shown for 7 to 89 days and 90 to 179 days. These different time periods were due to the difference in timing of the sublineage predominance in relation to bivalent vaccine authorization. Next slide. Next, note the differences in median time since last dose by variant period. Because of the relatively short period of predominance for BA4-5 after authorization of bivalent vaccines, Median time since last dose was only 25 days with no ability to assess waning. Median time since last dose was longer for BQ1 and XBB predominance. Next slide. <clears throat> Overall, note that VE looks similar during BA4-5 and BQ1, but appears to be lower during XBB predominance. Next slide. Shifting gears a bit, I'll move on to present VE in special populations, starting with pregnant people. Next slide. I previously presented VE methods for the vision network, and here we'll share specific methods for the analysis among pregnant people. This analysis focuses on emergency department and urgent care encounters instead of hospitalizations due to sample size limitations, and includes encounters among pregnant people aged 18 to 45 years. V is adjusted for the same potential confounders as in the main analysis, 
with the addition of underlying medical conditions, gestational age, Medicaid status, and site facility urbanicity. Finally, we'll present separate results for monovalent doses received prior to pregnancy and bivalent doses received during pregnancy, which was necessary due to the timing of bivalent dose authorization in the analysis. Next slide. Here we show results for the monovalent doses received prior to pregnancy, split by time before pregnancy, less than six months before pregnancy on the top and greater than or equal to six months before pregnancy on the bottom. Although confidence intervals overlap, we see a lower point estimate for doses received greater than or equal to six months before pregnancy, aligning with known patterns of waning in non-pregnant people. Next slide. And here we show VE for bivalent doses received during pregnancy. Note that the CI is quite wide, but we see a point estimate of 61% for protection against emergency department and urgent care visits after receipt of a bivalent dose uh, during pregnancy. Next slide. CDC's Overcoming COVID-19 Network is another VE network which conducts active enrollment of SARS-CoV-2 positive cases and SARS-CoV-2 negative controls with a focus on children, including infants. This analysis looked at the effectiveness of maternal vaccination against COVID-19 associated hospitalization in, in infants less than six months of age. Overcoming COVID operates in 25 pediatric hospitals in 19 states and included infants admitted between March 2022 and May 2023, so includes both monovalent and bivalent doses. Overcoming includes a parent interview for baseline demographics and clinical characteristics and maternal vaccination status verified through state and local registries and medical records. Next slide. This analysis differs from the vision analysis shown previously. Instead of looking at monovalent vaccine received before pregnancy for outcomes of the pregnant person, this analysis looks at bivalent vaccine received during pregnancy for infant outcomes. Results here are looking at VE against infant hospitalization during the first zero to three months of life on the top and during the first zero to six months of life on the bottom. The analysis did not have statistical power to look at VE separately for three to six months of age. Note that CIs are again wide, but the bivalent doses given to pregnant people helped provide protection against infant hospitalization during the, both the first three and six months of life. Next slide. Um, finally, I'll show updated VE in persons with immunocompromising conditions. Next slide. This slide shows updated data from those published in CDC's MMWR in May. VE is shown for hospitalization on the top and critical illness on the bottom. VE point estimates are generally lower for those with immunocompromising conditions due, compared to the data showed earlier in the presentation for persons without immunocompromising conditions. Waning is not evident in this group, though this may be because of heterogeneity in immune response among those with immunocompromising conditions um, or because of limited statistical power to detect differences over time. There were not enough cases to estimate VE specifically for different types of immunocompromising conditions, though VE has been shown in the past to vary based on type of condition. Next slide. Uh, moving on to summary and conclusions. Next slide. The results today uh, have several limitations. First, for estimates of absolute vaccine effectiveness, if unvaccinated individuals are meaningfully different than vaccinated individuals, estimates may be biased. For interpretation of estimates of relative vaccine effectiveness, uh, residual protection from prior doses is an important consideration and likely varies by severity of outcomes studied. Therefore, since absolute VE is somewhat easier to interpret and conclusions for relative and absolute VE for these analyses were the same, we've shared only absolute estimates today. We have limited information on prior infection in all platforms, although we know from seroprevalence studies that rates of prior infection in adults are high. VE estimates presented today are therefore a snapshot of how well the vaccine is working under current conditions. Lastly, VE against COVID-19 associated hospitalization from the platforms presented today represent individuals hospitalized with COVID-19 disease, but may underestimate protection against critical illness. Uh, and thus we've tried wherever possible to present estimates specifically for critical illness. Next slide. 
In summary, current data from CDC VE platforms demonstrate that the bivalent booster doses help to provide protection against hospitalization and critical illness in adults, though we are seeing evidence of waning protection for hospitalization. For most adults, both in the platform shown today and in the general population, more than a year has passed since they last received a monovalent COVID-19 vaccine. These individuals may have limited residual protection against hospitalization and should receive a bivalent booster dose. However, results from the vision analysis show more sustained protection against the most critical COVID-19 disease. Data shown today appear to indicate that VE during XBB predominance may wane more quickly against hospitalization compared to earlier variant predominant periods, though this did not appear to be the case for critical illness. Vaccination during pregnancy helped provide protection against hospitalization for infants under six months of age, though with some indication that protection may be highest in the first three months, which aligns with understanding of timing of waning of maternal antibodies. CDC will continue to monitor, to, will continue ongoing monitoring of VE, including for all outcomes of interest and for all authorized vaccines in the U.S., with a focus on assessing new policy recommendations in VE and populations at higher risk of COVID-19. Next slide. Uh, this concludes the presentation. I'd like to thank the numerous individuals and teams, both at CDC and at the study sites for their countless hours ensuring high quality data and analyses are available for VRPAC. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Link Ellis. Uh, this is an important presentation and we have time for a few questions. Okay, could somebody help me with uh, the list? Somehow my screen is not showing them at the moment. Dr. Levy is on, raise his hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, I still don't see the list. Hi, uh, Dr. Link Gellis. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation and highlighting uh, distinct vulnerable populations uh, in our country. I think uh, the pandemic has taught us that one size does not fit all, and we have a diverse population in our country that with, with subpopulations at different risk. You presented some data about immunocompromised adults that's obviously a very large category, and it went by a little quickly. Can you say a little more about how that was defined and what different groups were included in there? I'm sure there's some heterogeneity, whether we're talking about solid organ, stem cell transplant, um, you know, leukemia on chemotherapy, uh, primary immunodeficiencies. Obviously, there's a broad range, and there's probably nuance there between the different subgroups. Uh, I was wondering if you could just spend a little time telling us a little bit more about that category of individuals, because it's so important to protect them both for their own health and also to reduce uh, emergence of other variants. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so all the categories that you mentioned are included in our definition, as well as a handful of others. Um, I think your point is uh, completely valid that it's a quite diverse uh, population. Um, it's also captured through ICD-10 codes here, um, which means that there's likely under capture or miscapture of some of these uh, codes and conditions. Um, so I think some of the estimates that we're seeing here today are really representing this diversity and heterogeneity amongst this group. We know from previous analyses of monovalent doses, um, that those at highest risk in this category include people on current chemotherapy, those with um, solid organ or stem cell transplants. Um, but because of just low case counts overall, and unfortunately very low coverage in the general population with the bivalent doses, we weren't able to break out different categories and look at those specifically. Um, I think what we've seen over time is that patterns of vaccine effectiveness for the bivalent vaccine have been very similar to what we knew um, from the monovalent vaccine. So I think it's probably appropriate um, to conclude that we would see uh, quite a bit of heterogeneity if we could break out VE by these different categories, and likely also that the that those most at risk continue to be um, sort of the most severely immunocompromised. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so, so, so thank you for the presentation. And I just have a question almost that's uh, 
more for the a more general question. So it seems like there's a contradiction between vaccine efficient efficacy of 20 percent, 40 percent, and the fact that ICUs and hospitals really have very few COVID-19 cases, uh, especially the severe ones. So could you just define, explain why you think that's going on? Right. It's an excellent point. And I think um, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, many of our vaccine policy decisions are not based solely on vaccine effectiveness data. We also kind of need to understand the broader context, what we're seeing for hospitalization rates and so on. Um, I think what we're seeing here is a reflection of the hybrid immunity or high rates of prior infection that we have in the general population. So if you think of, you um, prior infection as, you know, representing, depending on age group, somewhere between 50 and close to 100% of people in the population. That means that, that the majority of the population has some underlying level of uh, sort of baseline protection against COVID-19. The bivalent vaccine then is giving them protection above and beyond what they have from their prior immunity due to prior monovalent vaccine or prior infection or both. Um, and so I think what we're seeing here, even though this is absolute VE, so it's compared to people that are unvaccinated, is really can be thought of as a relative VE, sort of an incremental benefit of the bivalent vaccine on top of prior immunity from prior infection in this population. Um, and so I think our hospitals are probably staying less full because we do have such high levels of prior infection, prior monovalent vaccine, and then the bivalent boosters are giving um, those folks added protection on top of that hybrid immunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gellin. Thanks, and thanks for the great presentation. I mean, th throughout the day, we're gonna have um, you know, crossover between COVID and influenza. We've already heard that. Dr. Marks mentioned about the increased risk late in the fall and the winter. But but given waning, um, I'd be interested, and, but I don't think we've established that this is seasonal. So but given waning, uh, if you were to, to advise someone, what's the optimal time to be vaccinated, to have that optimal protection at a time when it's increased risk, when would that be? It's an excellent question. Um, I would have to look in my crystal ball, unfortunately. You know, I think there's a couple of considerations. Um, one is that we know uh, that sort of you're going to get the best incremental benefit if it's been longer since your last vaccine. Um, but of course, if you wait too long since your last vaccine, you're left with very little protection. And so you're at higher risk of severe illness. Um, and so finding that sort of sweet spot where you're going to maximize your additional protection, but also prevent uh, sort of breakthrough infections due to waning or breakthrough severe disease due to waning, um, I think is the tricky part. And then, as you say, we don't quite know sort of the pattern of SARS-CoV-2 spread and whether it will turn out to be a seasonal virus this year or not. Um, and I think we know from sort of past waves of uh, COVID and vaccination that the very best time to get your dose is sort of right at the beginning of an uptick in disease. Of course, predicting that has been uh, extremely difficult. Difficult. I think this season will be telling to see if uh, COVID sort of settles into a seasonal pattern or not. Um, and so I think right now, what we know is that the, the vaccines do wane. They wane against hospitalization, maybe a little bit less so against critical illness, which is reassuring. Um, but, it, but most Americans uh, at this point haven't even received the bivalent and so are a year or more out from their monovalent dose and so have relatively little protection left. Thank you. And last question in this group from Dr. Offit. Yes, uh, oh, Dr. You. Reingold has a as well. <laughs> we'll go to you afterwards, uh, Art. Dr. Okay. Offit. Yes, thank you, Arnold. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Link Ellis. I, I just think what what um one thing we don't be we don't seem to be talking about um, is is the value of T cells. I mean, we we know that although clearly this virus evolves in terms of evolves away from recognition by antibodies at the receptor binding domain, the, the T cell recognition, whether it's cytotoxic T cells or T helper cells, has not really evolved. I mean, you still have 80 85 percent conservation, and T cells are important in protection against severe disease. It's been shown redundantly both in experimental animals and in people. So I think the reason, and I guess in part an answer. To Dr. Perlman's question is the reason that we're not seeing this wave of, of uh, serious illness as this virus evolves away from antibody recognition is because T cells are important. So I, I do worry when we try and 
make this similar to the influenza model, where it is a strain specific phenomenon. I mean, if we miss with an influenza strain, as has been true twice in the last 10 years, a miss is a mile. That's not true here because these T cell recognition sites remain conserved. So I, I do think we do jump with the net here. And I do worry that in this kind of meeting, when we talk about a seasonal flu vaccine, that this, if the CDC then follows that up with a similar recommendation as we have for flu, which is everybody over six months uh, needs a vaccine, I just don't think that's true. So I, I agree with your, your assessment that it, it is those highest risk groups that may benefit then from, from a booster dose, but we need to define, continue to define who those high risk groups are and not make this a, a recommendation for everybody every season. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Reingold. Uh, thanks, uh, Arnold. Uh, again, Dr. Link Ellis, thanks for your usual great presentation. Um, uh, so, so I probably missed this, but again, making the parallel to flu, uh, where we worry that old people like Arnold and me uh, need a different vaccine uh, because uh, we, you know, we don't respond as well immunologically. Um, could, could you just summarize for me where you think what, what we know about uh, VE and waning in, in the older population, over 65, whatever? Uh, specifically compared to younger uh, adults? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if the backup slides are available, but if slide 28 could be shown, um, I've actually broken out here VE against hospitalization from the vision network uh, amongst those 18 to 64 and 65 plus. Thank you. Yes. Um, so these are updates from what was shared in, in the MMWR in May. Um, and you can see here, I think, generally pretty similar patterns across older and younger groups. We've seen this phenomenon before with COVID where um, sort of unexpectedly VE appears to be higher or more sustained in elderly individuals, which is not the same pattern that we see in other diseases. I think this is likely due to some behavioral factors. We know from other studies that uh, older adults have been more likely to continue masking, continue social distancing. Um, so that's going to play into VE. We also know that older individuals have lower rates of prior infection, which means the vaccine sort of has more room to provide additional protection. And so I think we're picking that up here. Um, but for the most part here, we're not seeing um, sort of more severe waning in uh, those 65 plus. I will say we are not powered. Uh, we don't have statistical power here to break out the, the most elderly age groups. And what we saw back in the era of monovalent vaccines, when we had uh, higher rates of both vaccination and hospitalization and could break out um, sort of 65 plus uh, 75 plus and 85 plus that it was really the 85 plus that had uh, the quickest waning, um, which which I think makes sense from from literature from other vaccines as well. Um, again, we weren't able to do that here, but if you sort of take that uh, data from the monovalent era combined with what we know about immunocompromising conditions and so on, uh, it makes sense that sort of the oldest uh, individuals are probably at the higher risk, but we just aren't powered here to pick that up. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you to Dr. Link Ellis for a very clear presentation. Uh, now we're going to hear from Dr. Natalie Thornburg, Acting Chief of the Laboratory Branch in the Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Virus Divisions at CDC, who will give us an update on current epidemiology of the COVID-19 pandemic and SARS-CoV-2 variants. Great, thank you. Um, so in the first half of my presentation, I'm going to speak um, about SARS-CoV-2 variants and lineages, what's circulating currently, um, how they relate to each other genomically and touch a little bit on how they relate to each other antigenically. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'll touch on the current epidemiology of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is a graph of lineages, pango lineages of viruses that have been circulating in the United States since January 2022. If you think back to prior to 2022, um, we had other variants circulating such as alpha, and Delta, which were getting uh, Greek letter designations by WHO. 
This graph captures the very, very tail end of the Delta surge um, in the top upper left-hand corner in, in violet um, with the Pango lineage B.1.617.2. So that is Delta. But since the beginning, of 2022, end of 2021, when Omicron emerged, all lineages that have been circulating are Omicron. And so it is the virus has continued to evolve from Omicron into other Omicrons. Um, if you look on the right side of the graph, which is um, 2023, everything that has been circulating are XBB viruses. So XBB viruses, as I've just said, are Omicron viruses, and they are descended from BA.2 viruses, um, which is a, uh, a, common, a common progenitor of BA4 and BA5 viruses. They're named XBB viruses because they, are, they emerged from a recombination event um, from two different BA.2 viruses. And so right now, um, XBB.1.5 sort of dark medium blue emerged in late 2022 and was predominant um, throughout the spring. And we have some new XBB lineages that are uh, slowly increasing in proportion right now, some XBB.1.9 viruses, as well as XBB.1.16 viruses. And just some patterns that I want you to, to notice here is that the virus has continued to evolve uh, continuously. Um, really since the beginning of the pandemic. Some lineages do reach predominance. So if you look at sort of the aqua color there in the middle, that's BA.5. And that was a very dominant lineage that emerged, reached predominance, and then slowly uh, contracted. But there are other lineages that do emerge that never reach predominance. So if you look at the yellow colors, BA.4, BA.4.6, um, did emerge, circulated at a significant proportion, but never really reached predominance. Um, and then right now we have quite a bit of uh, genomic, we have quite a bit of genomic um, variability, uh, heterogeneity with lots of different lineages, Pango lineages circulating currently. Uh, next slide, please. So that graph was showing the proportion of viruses, but if we scale um, the viruses to the number of positive nucleic acid amplification tests or case counts, we can see the relative number or estimated number of cases that each different um, lineage caused. Um, so in that first Omicron wave, it was very, very large with a great community burden, a very large community burden. And so if you look at the orange colors, B.1.1.529, BA.1.1, really the first Omicron viruses, they, they're estimated to have caused a very large number of cases. Each subsequent wave of um, viruses that have been associated with a, with a surge or um, a, a reach to predominance, <clears throat> has caused fewer and fewer estimated cases um, because the, the case counts have been lower. Um, and so you can see on the far right, um, we're looking at the number of cases, XBB.1.5 and um, currently circulating lineages are estimated to have caused. And uh, we're looking at um, less than a million cases um, that each lineage has has driven really since spring of 2022, as opposed to that first Omicron wave when we reached the Y scale of uh, about 5 million cases. Next slide, please. All right, so this is similar data, but just shown on a different X axis. Um, so this is weeks since variant proportion reached 1%. And so this graph, you can see just how quickly individual lineages kind of took off after their emergence. So those first um, Omicron lineages really took off very quick, quickly with exponential growth over just the first couple of weeks of emergence. More recent lineages like XBB.1.5 um, have increased at a more uh, steady, slow clip. Next slide, please. 
All right, this is the current landscape of circulating lineages and viruses in the United States right now. And this is uh, the national picture. So the left half of the graph is actual data. So those are weighted, weighted estimates of variant proportion based on genomic sequencing results. And then we utilize those results to model growth rates. Um, and then the right side of the graph are model data that we call NowCast. So these are bi-week bins. We update this data every other week uh, with bi-weekly bins. Um, and so the, the weighted estimates, the most recent weighted estimates that have been posted um, are for the week ending May 13th of this year. Um, and the most recent modeled now cast data with estimated proportions um, are shown for the bi-week ending June 10th, um, 2023, this year. So XBB.1.5 um, is still projected to be the most predominant lineage circulating in the United States but it has been decreasing over the course of the past one to two months. Um, decreasing, but at a slightly low proportion. Um, the next most predicted predominant circulating lineages are XBB.1.16, uh, XBB.1.9, XBB.1.16.1, um, and the, the rest are listed beneath that. So you can see really all of the viruses that are circulating uh, above uh, one percent are XBB lineage viruses. Next slide, please. Um, this is the the picture of uh, proportions of viruses um, uh, regionally. This is the now cast data for the by week ending June tenth. So this this is the model data. Um, by region. And you can see most regions are quite similar to each other. All regions, um, all of the viruses that are predicted to be circulating right now are XBB, dot, XBB lineage viruses. Um, XBB.1.5 is sitting just below half of circulating viruses in most regions um, with a pretty heterogeneous picture of other XBB lineage viruses that are circulating in each region. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does that mean as far as how different are XBB viruses? Um, and so from the, the vaccine, the vaccine strain or, or from each other. Um, so this is just a table um, demonstrating key substitutions in the spike receptor binding domain um, in different lineages of viruses. Um, so across the top are some of the key sub the key residues where we see substitutions um, in different lineages of a virus. And this is only the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, which is the part of the protein that binds to the cellular receptor and is often a target, uh, a major target for neutralizing antibodies. Uh, the reference sequence that's shown here is BA4, BA5. That is the vaccine formulation from the bivalent booster last year. So half of it was ancestral strain and half of it was this BA4, 5. Uh, as a reminder, BA4 and BA5, even though they evolved independently from a BA2 progenitor, uh, they have the same spike sequence. So in vaccines that only have spike, um, they can be used interchangeably. They can be used interchangeably. The XBB viruses are kind of listed at the bottom of the table. Um, and XBB viruses, we've observed convergent evolution, means meaning we see the same spike um, sequence in multiple lineages of viruses, indicating some selective pressure. But that means multiple lineages of the virus have exactly the same spike, spike sequence. So even though they um, are shown independently on our COVID data tracker, they have the same spike sequences sequence and might look very similar or the same to someone's immune system. Um, and you can see that there are a few um, substitutions across the spike receptor binding domain, especially in comparison to the reference sequences. There are nine, 10 substitutions in the receptor binding domain. Um, it, as, a, as a comparison of the Delta to Omicron shift, we saw 
about 15 substitutions across the receptor binding domain in that, in that shift. Of course, that was a very dramatic shift because it happened so quickly. This has been accumulating more slowly over time um, with emergence of some um, uh, BA.5 sublineages last fall, which accumulated a few mutations, and then these XBB viruses, which have accumulated a few more mutations. So it's been sort of a slower drift um, this year as, composed, as opposed to that Delta to Omicron shift. Um, the bolded lineages are the lineages that are currently increasing in proportion. So you can see XV.1.9, .1.9.2 are both increasing, but they have the same spike sequence, especially in comparison to XVB.1.5 um, and XVB.1.16 and its lineage, um, sublineage.1.16.1 also have um, uh, the same spike sequence and have one substitution in comparison to XBB.1.5 and the other two that are increasing in proportion right now, .1.9.1 and .1.9.2. Um, there's one additional lineage, XBB.2.3, um, that's incre increasing in proportion right now, and it also has one substitution in comparison to .1.5, but it's at a different location than uh, .1.16. It has got a substitution at 521, whereas .1.16 has a substitution at 478. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a co-crystal structure of uh, the spike header, or the spike trimer um, in complex with ACE2. So ACE2 is the cellular receptor that the virus binds to when it's infecting cells. Um, so as a reminder, spike is a trimer. It's got three protomers. It's got three sections that are exactly the same that bind to each other. Um, each each um, protomer of spike has a receptor binding domain that's shown in green and red together. That's the area that binds to the cellular receptor, ACE2. Um, the S1 is the most, um, it has the most um, uh, heterogeneous, the least conserved sequence of spike. S1 is made up of the N-terminal domain that's shown in blue, um, a, a sort of middle part that's shown in purple, and then the receptor binding motif, which is in green and red together. And then the S2 region, that's the part that inserts into the viral membrane, and that's fairly conserved and doesn't uh, generally accumulate a lot of substitutions. Um, so we have some highlighted substitutions. These are changes that are in spike in comparison to the four or five reference sequences. Um, and we've specifically highlighted um, substitutions that are observed in the N-terminal domain, um, as well as the receptor binding motif. Now the N-terminal domain, while it doesn't bind to the, to the cellular receptor, some neutralizing antibodies, some Weakly neutralizing antibodies can bind to that region of the protein, um, likely because of its proximity to the receptor binding domain. So there are some substitutions that are observed both in XBB.1.5 and XBB.1.16 in comparison to reference sequence. Um, we've highlighted a couple of the, the two changes that are different between XBB.1.5 and XBB.1.16 in comparison to each other. And I'll zoom in on those on the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. All right, so you can see um, a close-up, and I'll go even closer in the next slide. You can see the close-up of two substitutions that are observed in XBB.1.16 um, relative to BA5 that are not found in XBB.1.5. There's one that's in the receptor binding motif, the smaller section of the receptor binding domain that binds to ACE2, and it's kind of tucked in there on the right side of the receptor binding motif. Um, and there's another one that's embedded inside the um, N-terminal domain, which is shown in blue on the left and encircled in, in yellow, and that's uh, at position 180 of the spike protein. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is just an even closer up for you to better see those two substitutions. So you can see how they could, in theory, um, affect any sort of activity of spike or neutralizing activity. Um, really, that 180 
that 180 substitution is kind of tucked deep into the receptor or in, in the end terminal domain, where that um, change at 478 is is more likely to um, play a role in either receptor binding or neutralization because of how close it is to um, the ACE2 binding site. Next slide, please. All right. So, how does um, how does the accumulation of, of mutations affect neutralization of the virus? Um, there have been a couple of studies that are published um, looking at neutralization of some of these XVB viruses, and I've I've pulled out two that are very very recent that have data from both XVB.1.5 and XBB.1.16. So, um, when the immune history of the population was similar. Um, back when most folks were naive or vaccinated, unvaccinated, or just previously infected, it was pretty simple to interpret um, neutralization. Um, that's become more complicated as our immune history has become more complicated, and we now have combinations of receiving different vaccines, different timing of vaccines, um, as well as um, uh, infection with different lineages of viruses. So this is one example of a neutralization um, a neutralization assays that were published in uh, Lancet ID. This is using pseudovirus neutralization assays um, with uh, sera from humans who um, were infected or were vaccinated and then infected with BA2 virus that's shown in the left panel G. Um, vaccinated and then had um, a BA5 infection that's shown in the middle panel or animal sera, specifically hamster sera, um, uh, from hamsters that were infected with XBB viruses. So what you can see here, um, they've done neutralization assays with one of the uh, original lineages of Omicron, B.1.1, BA.2, BA.5, and then uh, different iterations of XBB viruses. Um, and you can see um, from persons who were infected with BA2 or BA5, you saw, you see uh, reduced uh, neutralization of BA2 and then even more reduced neutralization of BA5 in comparison to the original um, Omicron virus. Um, and that is statistically significant. Um, those those um, red stars indicate um, statistically different from B, the titers of B.1.1. Um, and then the XBB lineage viruses, you see a more dramatic decrease in neutralization titers in comparison to um, the, one of the original Omicron viruses, B.1.1. Um, note, and the, um, notably that, that difference is more dramatic in persons who were infected with BA2 um, than BA5 viruses. So there are still some individuals who retained, who had been infected with BA5, who retain um, some neutralization activity against um, the XBB viruses. Um, when you look at the blue, the blue hatched, um, the blue hash marks, that indicates statistical significance um, of whatever virus they're testing against uh, XBB.1.5. Um, and so there is um, a statistical difference with XBB.1.5 with neutralization against BA5 and BA2. Um, uh, with um, in the BA2 breakthrough infections, um, just against BA2 and BA5, and after BA5 breakthrough infections against XBB.1.16, um, as well as BA2 and BA5. But the actual titers are listed in, a, in the parentheses, kind of just above the XBB lineage. Um, and you can see, while there is some statistical di difference between XBB.1.16 and XBB.1.5, the absolute titers are um, pretty similar to each other, 186 and 252, versus the dramatically different um, from earlier um, Omicron lineages that um, 6,000 um, 6,000 and in the thousands against BA2 and BA5. Um, when you look at hamster sera, so a little bit easier to interpret because you know the immune, the immune history of, of those, um, uh, vaccinating hamsters um, with XBB.1 um, XBB.1 virus, or sorry, infecting hamsters with XBB.1 virus and then using their sera for neutralization. Um, against other viruses, um, there is very similar neutralization um, against all of the XBB viruses, indicating um, that they're anagenically similar in these um, more simpler, uh, these, these simpler um, immune histories. Next slide, please. 
All right, so this is another study um, that was published in Cell and Molecular Immunology. They look at fewer, um, they look at fewer viruses in this study. Um, this is all in um, using human sera for neutralization um, using pseudoviruses. These are neutralization titer of XBB pseudoviruses, um, looking at B1, one of the original Omicron lineages, XBB.1.1. .1.5 and .1.16. Um, there are sera collected from persons who were vaccinated with a breakthrough infection. That's what BTI means, breakthrough infection. Uh, persons who received four doses of monovalent booster vaccines and persons who received four, um, four doses of vaccine that include a bivalent booster. The absolute titers, the geometric mean titers are listed across the top of, top of the graphs. Um, in the reactivity, the number of reactivities, um, you can see the number of donors that were used in each group. So it's about 14 or 15 in each group. And then statistical significance is shown with the um, asterisks. So in all of the groups, um, the, X, the titers against the XBB viruses um, were lower than they were against the original Omicron, but they were not statistically different from each other. Um, next slide, please. All right, so this is an antigenic um, uh, cartographic map um, from David Ho's laboratory, um, looking at uh, how similar um, uh, different Omicrons are to each other. And just a reminder of what an antigenic uh, cartographic mind is. It's a way to visually represent neutralization data that clusters similar viral virus groups together just for easier interpretation of how similar viruses might be to each other. So to do this, scientists do a matrix um, where you take different kinds of sera, sera from vaccinated persons, vaccinated animals, um, and different viruses, collect neutralization titers, and then just do some math to um, generate proportional distances um, according to whatever the titers were. And in this case, and in this particular, um, this particular map, um, one AU or arbitrary unit equals a two-fold change in neutralization. And you can see they use different types of sera. They've used um, sera collected from persons with three shots of the original formulation of vaccine, um, those with some BA2 breakthrough infections, uh, persons with BA4 or 5 breakthrough infections, um, persons who had four shots of the original formulation of vaccine, um, as well as some sera collected from persons with three shots plus bivalent vaccines. And um, what I'd like you to see is that um, BA4, BA5, and BA2 viruses cluster together. Some of the BA5 evolved lineages, which are BQ.1 and BQ.1.1, um, cluster pretty close together up there in the top. And then these two XBB viruses that they've tested, XBB and XBB.1, um, also cluster together. So this was a manuscript that they had published um, in Cell. Um, the same set of authors have uh, a preprint posted as well, where they do a similar study, but they also include XBB.1.5 and XBB.1.16 um, in their antigenic cartography um, analyses. And those two viruses, XBB.1.5 and .1.16, um, cluster very close to each other um, in that uh, preprint study. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here and change and talk a little bit about um, the epidemiology of COVID-19 right now. Next slide. Um, so this is data that we um, gathered last week. Um, as of June 3rd of this year, there have been 6.2 million um, reported hospitalizations and 1.1 million reported deaths associated with COVID-19. Next slide, please. These are the weekly trends of SARS-CoV-2 test percent positivity, positivity um, in the United States uh, that was um, March 14th, 2020 through um, last week, June 3rd. Um, because of different testing habits, um, different data reporting requirements since, since the expiration of the public health emergency, percent positivity is our best indicator of community transmission at any, um, currently. So on the far right of the graph, you can see we're, we're sitting at just below 5% test positivity 
um, for, for the week ending June 3rd. Um, you can see that really, really big Omicron wave in the winter of 2021, early 2022, where test positivity um, went above 30%. Uh, there was that BA5 wave that we observed late last um, summer into early fall, um, where test positivity peaked at just below 15%. And then, of course, we saw another um, expected uh, winter surge um, through the end of 2022 into the beginning of this year um, that correlated with um, a rise of XBB.1.5 predominance, and that peaked at just above 10% positivity. Since then, we've been uh, decreasing in percent positivity and um, are still sitting at kind of right around 5%, which we have been for uh, about a month. Next slide, please. All right, so this is um, th this the x axis is a little bit different here. This is just since um, for one year since June of 2022. These are patients diagnosed with COVID 19 as a percent of all emergency department visits by age groups in the United States. Um, and so in this, we can capture the BA5 wave kind of there on the left, um, as well as the winter surge that was associated with XBB.1.5 coming into predominance um, December, January um, of this year. And you can see um, that uh, hospital visits to ER um, do correlate with community transmission and that the older adults um, 75 and older um, continue to be um, the, the highest, um, the group with the highest rate of emergency department visits. Um, although across all age groups, you can see um, bumps in ER visits with each um, wave of community transmission. Next slide, please. All right, so this is looking at um, hospital admissions since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, hospital admissions per 100,000 population by age group. So this is the same age groups I showed in the previous slide. So you can see um, really since April of 22, which was after the first Omicron wave, um, even during the, the BA5 wave, um, I've, I've kind of highlighted since April 2022 in this blue blue box. The BA5 wave, you can see in the um, uh, bump on the left in the blue box, and the XBB.1.5 wave on the, the bump on the right. Um, and you can see since April 2022, um, we've observed much lower hospital admissions among younger persons relative to older age groups. Um, and so uh, older age groups, 75 years and older, um, continue to have hospital as hospital admissions um, sort of bump with each um, increase, each wave of community transmission, but lower, lower um, age groups, including 74 and younger, um, we've seen a dramatic decrease in hospital admissions. Next slide, please. All right, and so this is uh, similar data, but COVID-19 associated deaths. Um, and Really similarly, since April 22, we have a much lower death rate among younger, um, younger adults and, and younger persons relative to older age groups. But we do still have um, some COVID-19 associated mortality, especially with bumps with community transmission, especially in adults that are 75 years and older. Next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned earlier that, the, that you know, we've really seen a changing landscape in sort of the immune history of our population. Um, and this is some seroprevalence data that was generated um, from blood donors that was just published in MMWR um, a couple of weeks ago. And so this has, um, in, in this study, they've collected um, uh, residual sera from blood donors and collected vaccine information from surveys um, and determined using antibodies against the nucleocapsid protein, which should only be generated after infection and spike protein, along with survey data to identify proportion or prevalence of 
uh, persons with previous vaccination and infection, that's dark blue. Previous infection without vaccination, that's sort of the medium blue. Previous vaccination without infection is also a lighter medium blue. And then no previous infection or vaccination. And you can see a dramatic increase over the course of this um, year, 20, April 2021 through sort of September 2022, a dramatic increase of persons who um, have uh, hybrid immunity. And so that's been accumulating down from below 10% um, in April to June 2021 to almost half of the population who have um, both vaccination and infection more recently. Next slide, please. All right, so um, so who, so, I apologize, that's the wrong slide. Okay, so what does this very complex landscape mean in terms of protection against mortality? Um, and what can we glean from um, uh, mortality um, of vaccinated persons and, vac and persons um, who have received uh, who haven't been vaccinated. So this is an M, some data from an M, MMWR that was released today that is examining the mortality rate ratios in adults 65 or older, comparing unvaccinated adults to those who received bivalent booster by time since vaccination. Um, a very similar analysis has been uh, published recently, but this updated one um, encompasses um, XBB.1.5 timeframe, uh, the frame since that's been predominant, um, as well as looking at durability. Um, so this is divided by time since vaccination, the lighter blue two weeks to two months um, versus Three, three to six months in the darker blue. And then during times of BA5 predominance on the far left, um, BQ1 and BQ.1.1, which is um, a BA5 sublineage in the middle um, versus XBB.1.5 here on the right. And at two weeks to two months post-vaccination, the mortality rate ratio declined from 16.3 during that BA5 period to 8.4 during uh, XBB.1.5 predominance, which represents a reduction in the crude vaccine effectiveness of 94 to 88%. Um, similar mortality rate ratios were observed among people between the two weeks and two month time period compared to the three month, three to six month um, post vaccination period, indicating good durability of vaccination, of bivalent booster vaccination um, against mortality. Next slide, please. So of these persons who are still getting um, severe disease um, and, and uh, mortality with COVID-19 infection, um, we have extensive data describing, um, describing risk factors of persons um, who are still at risk for severe illness. Um, and those include unvaccinated persons. Um, they continue to be at higher risk for severe illness compared to vaccinated persons. Most, um, at least 75% of vaccinated people who develop severe COVID-19 illness have multiple risk factors, including older age. Um, most are at least 65 years or greater, but the risk increases with age incrementally. Um, as well as underlying medical conditions with risk increasing with the number of underlying medical conditions, including immunosuppression, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, lung disease, cardiovascular disease, and chronic neurological diseases. Fortunately, antiviral drugs can help uh, reduce risk of severe illness in persons um, at higher risks regardless of vaccination status. And next slide, I believe, is my summary slide. So Omicron XBB lineage viruses have predominated since early 2023 and continue to predominate. XBB lineage viruses have reduced neutralization if you compare them to earlier Omicron lineages, um, but have similar neutralization profiles to each other, indicating they are antigenically similar. Declining rates of severe illness since January 2023 have been observed, but older adults, especially those 75 years and older, experience greater relative burden of severe illness since April of 2022. 
And although there's some evidence of immune evasion observed for Omicron XBB.1.5, bivalent boosters provide robust protection against COVID-19 associated death without evidence of waning for at least six months post-vaccination. Um, and next slide. That is the um, conclusion of my presentation. I would like to thank um, the, all of the CDC contributors um, to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thornburg. A very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation, which uh, will help us a great deal in our discussion later. Uh, you didn't bring up one of the variants that we are to consider our, in our discussions, XBB.2.3. Uh, do you have any information about uh, where it would sit in the antigenic cartography? I think it's very important, the fact that what we're going to be considering, they all are mu much closer than what we've had to consider before. Yes. Um, let me see. Let me take a quick look at my slide number. Um, so I didn't pull up any antigenic cartography data, but if um, if you could pull up the slides again and go to slide eight that, that shows the key changes in the spike receptor binding domain, XBB.2.3 is listed there. So if you could go to slide eight, mm -hmm. that would Help me. Thank you so much. Okay, so you can see XBB.2.3 is listed on the bottom there. Um, and in how in the, the bottom three are really the three lineages that you're looking at. So you can see XBB.2.3 has one substitution in comparison to XBB.1.5. Um, and um, uh, there's two substitution differences between 1.16 and 2.3. If you look at 4.78 and 5.21, you can see the differences there. So they're all um, quite similar to each other, but have some minor changes in the receptor binding domain, which is probably the most important region for neutralization. Um, if you could go ahead two slides, we could kind of take a look at where it's sort of located on the crystal structure. Um, maybe go ahead one more. Okay, so it's not highlighted here, but you can kind of see the numbers where it might be located. So you can see the closest residue that is listed there is um, 490. So it would be, you know, 30 away from, from that. Um, so it would be near the interface of XBB or of um, Spike and ACE2. Um, it would be near the interface. So, you know, a similar difference to um, XBB.1.16 um, to XBB.1.5. But it's close. Yes, they're all there. Yeah, if you go back to that, if you want to go back to slide eight and everyone would like to no, study we, the, we, the, we don't the need slides, to do they're that. very close. The point okay. is that this, these, these are all relatively close compared to what we've very been close. dealing with in the past. Yes. Okay, Dr. Levy. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thornburg, for a very illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, the British statistician George Box once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, you alluded to some of the models that, that you folks are looking at. Obviously, uh, we want to gather this data and try to project what does the future hold. And my brief question to you, uh, twofold, one is, uh, how do you validate these models? How much confidence do you have in your ability to project forward? Uh, will the XBB2 predominate, you know, in a few months? That That's obviously an important question as we think about vaccine composition. And then the second question is the XBB2 uh, variant. Uh, the list of amino acids that you listed there showed a switch of a serine instead of a proline. As you know, prolines are very important to introduce disruption in secondary structures of proteins. So it, does that uh, S protein then have a very different structure? Uh, because the X-ray crystallography modeling you showed us was off the one variant. Yeah. Um, let's see. You asked me two questions. Um, so one, uh, predicting forward, what what lineages will emerge? Yeah, you know, and, and, and how robust those models are. Whether you can validate them. How how good is the validation of the models? Yeah, for projection. Yeah, I mean our nowcast modeling is good into the present. 
um, it is it we can't really look into the future as far as lineages are concerned. We can tell you, you know, the lineages that are increasing now, and it is unlikely to go backward. So, so lineages that have swept through predominance right. um, and are decreasing in in proportion. We're not I guess likely the question to go backwards. Is, is, there any we to, uh, is there any effort to apply artificial intelligence, machine learning? to project forward with this, all the data we have. Yeah, no, we, we, we don't have that sort of modeling. Got yet. it. And, and then in terms of the, the, the XBB2, uh, the serine instead of the proline, does that imply it has a very different structure than the one? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, spike is a really huge protein. Um, mm. And so the sort of stability of the up down could be affected. Um, and that could absolutely affect affinity to ACE2. But the full structure of the spike protein uh, by that one substitution, it is a very large protein. And I doubt that we would see any really dramatic Thank you. Uh, difference in the Thank full you. structure. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Offit. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thornburg. I thought your observation that you had fairly prolonged protection against severe disease for at least six months um, after a boost suggests that you may not just be boosting antibody responses, but boosting memory cells, or at least the frequency of memory cells, memory B or T cells. Do you, do you have, or do you know of any studies that have really looked at that? Because that would be important to know. Um, I think it's, so I don't have any of that data um, here. Um, I do think, um, you know, we, we likely get a boost of anamnestic response when we get um, bivalent booster doses. And um, that does induce a germinal center reaction and fur further affinity maturation of antibodies and, and memory B cells. And that we get the, that boost in antibodies, but that also gets us to um, higher quality antibodies. Now that Function is dependent upon T cell help, and T the ability to generate that T cell help is very different in different populations. So, of course, in older adults um, who are experiencing immunosenescence, their ability to, to mount a really robust germinal center reaction is going to be abrogated in comparison to younger adults. No, it's important to know only because if you really do have a higher frequencies of memory, BNT helper, cytotoxic T cells, you may not yeah. need to then boost the following year or the year after that. I mean, so that would be interesting to know. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Meisner, uh, for the last question. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Monto and uh, Dr. Thornborg. Uh, what what fascinating presentation. Uh, you're really uh, taking taking this virus apart on a molecular level. The question I'd like to ask you, since we're trying to anticipate a little bit where things might go, is um, the evolution of XBB. And XBB, I think, has been described as a recombination of two viruses, which is different than the other mutations, which are uh, point mutations, additions or deletions or substitutions. And I don't usually, I don't think of linear RNA viruses as undergoing recombination. I think more of segmented viruses as being able to do that. Um, so does that surprise you? Isn't that an unusual event? What do others uh, linear single stranded RNA viruses do this? It's pretty unique to coronavirus. Coronaviruses are buggers. Um, they have very, you know, they have very huge genomes, really at the upper limit of stability for RNA genomes. And as part of that, they have this very complex replication cycle that involves um, discontinuous transcription. And it's through that really complex generation of mRNAs during transcription and in the translation replication process um, that probably uh, it's got these. Um, these these motifs throughout the genome that are repeated in the same, and it's probably this complex replication cycle along with this very com this repeated motif that allows um, recombination. So this is unusual to coronaviruses specifically. So is there is a risk then that this could happen again with this coronavirus? Um, absolutely. Recombination events happen periodically with coronaviruses. Um, they generally have to happen with viruses that are uh, co-circulating. So, you know, there were probably two, eight, 
two BA5 virus, BA2 viruses that were co-circulating. So I wouldn't imagine we would go XBB to ancestral because there is no ancestral virus that is circulating. Um, so it would have to be during co-circulation. And that's what makes this prediction, <laughs> pushing prediction models uh, so difficult. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thornburg. We're now going to switch over to Dr. Kanta Subarau, director of the WHO Collaborating Center in Melbourne, and also uh, the director of the Peter Doherty, also associated with the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity in Melbourne, who fortunately is in Canada and who will report to us on the WHO TAG uh, Committee, the Technical Advisory Committee recommendations on the composition of COVID-19 uh, vaccines going forward. Dr. Subarau, please. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Montel. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can control my slides from here. Um, So hopefully that works for you. Can you just tell me if you can see my slides, Arnold? We can see them. Perfect. Looks good. All right. Thank you. So um, I was asked to talk about the deliberations of the TAG-COVAC, which is the Technical Advisory Group on COVID-19 Vaccine Composition. Um, and this is from a meeting that we held in May. Um, so the functions of the TAG-COVAC, and I know I've spoken to Verpak before, uh, but the key element of uh, what we are tasked to do is to recommend to the WHO for each of the COVID-19 vaccine platforms, whether adaptations are needed so that the vaccines continue to safely provide protection against variants as they emerge. So before I go on to what's going on this year, I do want to set the stage a little bit with what was happening a year ago. So in June of 2022, um, I will remind you that we were in the midst of the early Omicron lineages. So Omicron BA1 and BA2 had emerged. Omicron BA2 remained the predominant lineage globally. And BA4 and 5 had started increasing in proportion. And at the time, we did anagenic We looked at the anagenic cartography data, which I um, came in at the tail end of Natalie Tom Tornberg's um, presentation. So you know, I know she's explained how anagenic cartography works. And the original cluster of viruses is up here in the top left. Um, the Delta variant is within fourfold of the original, and BA one and BA two were further out. Um, and this is another. Um, um, aggregated antigenic map of the variants at the time. So what we had is a situation where Omicron lineage viruses had emerged and they were antigenically quite distinct. We had a lot of uncertainties back a year ago. We didn't know what the trajectory of SARS-CoV-2 evolution would be. We didn't know whether future variants would evolve from the previously circulating variants or whether evolution would continue from Omicron. We didn't know very much about the performance of monovalent Omicron vaccines. We didn't know whether an Omicron monovalent vaccine would offer the same, uh, a similar cross-reactive immunity and cross-protection from severe illness caused by other variants and unprimed individuals as the index-based vaccine had done so well. We, it wasn't clear to us at the time whether an Omicron-containing bi or multivalent product would elicit cross-reactive responses in humans that would be equivalent to those elicited with sequential vaccine approaches. And we assumed that the safety and reactogenicity of the variant-specific vaccines would be similar to the currently licensed vaccine. So there was a lot of uncertainty um, as a result of which we recommended um, that a um, that the effort be to try to improve the breadth of protection that certainly the existing ancestral vaccine produced provided very good protection against severe illness and death. But if you wanted to extend that protection beyond to cover new variants that we could in recommend including uh, BA1 or BA, an um, Omicron variant, 
Um, and at the time, of course, we also recommended that the ancestral strain be kept in play because we had a lot of confidence about the protection it provided from severe illness and death. And we had a lot of uncertainty as to where the trajectory of evolution would go. So if you fast forward to May of 2023, we're now looking at the current the situation in May of 2023, cases on the left y-axis, deaths on the right y-axis, the solid line is the deaths, the color-coded bars represent the different um, WHO regions, and these are COVID-19 cases and deaths reported to the WHO from January of 2020 to May of 2023. And so, as we heard before, these are some of the um, surges that have occurred. Another thing that has really changed significantly over the past period of time is seroprevalence. And so these are a series of seroprevalent studies conducted in different regions of the world, going down on the, on the left and going across over time. And at the very bottom, circled in green here, are the global data, which indicate that seroprevalence has increased all across all regions and is now sitting at about 90% in most regions. And so we really have a very different um, um, situation of, of population immunity than we did earlier in the pandemic. So what is the protective effectiveness of such hybrid immunity? And these are data, the references down below here. We're looking at percent protection against hospital admission or severe disease versus any infection. And the x-axis is time since the last vaccination uh, or infection in months. So these lighter color, the, the red spectrum colors are the primary series of vaccination and a booster dose. And you could see that they provide protection against severe illness and, and, and um, hospital admission that wanes gradually sometime after about six months. But the waning of protection against infection comes quite a bit faster. And now if you look at the blue spectrum, these are people that have had, that have hybrid immunity, infection plus vaccination. And that's the blue lines here. And you can see that with hybrid immunity, protection against severe illness and hospitalization is boosted. Um, it is also boosted against infection, but that continues um, to have a similar trajectory of decline um, in protection from infection. So protection, and these, these are data from the period when Omicron variants have been circulating. Um, and so um, the... The evidence that we reviewed at our committee in May um, covered a number of different topics. We reviewed the evolution of the virus, including the XBB1 descendant lineages and their impact on cross neutralization, and cross protection following vaccination or infection. We looked at vaccine effectiveness data of currently approved vaccines during a period of XBB1 descendant lineage circulation, antigenic cartography, preliminary preclinical data on immune responses in animal models, preliminary preclinical immunogenicity data on the performance of candidate vaccines um, that was provided to us confidentially by manufacturers, and B cell responses following vaccination or infection. So I'm just going to show you a few of the highlights. Here's a simplified illustration of the, prof of the phylogenetic relationships of the clades. And here you see where the Omicron lineage emerged and it has gradually uh, continued to diversify. So here we have the XBB 1.5, 1.16 up there. Um, and so what, where we are a year later is that now we're not seeing any evidence of the um, trajectory flipping back to these earlier variants. All of the variants that are emerging are continuing to do so in an in a, in essentially linear progression. Now, looking at the variant circulation on the data above are the numbers and the data below are percentages of the various lineages. And you can see that um, XBB 1.5 and 1.16 um, were dominant globally, but the earlier variants, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are no longer detected in humans. I will point out that the actual numbers of um, isolates is quite a bit lower than at the uh, peak of BA1 and BA2 um, circulation. 
So what is the impact of these recent variants on cross-neutralization following vaccination? So here we have data, um, the reference is down below, data from people that got one dose of a Pfizer vaccine, two doses, or three doses. And I'll draw your attention to this tail end of the x-axis, which is XBB.1. So these are neutralizing antibody titers tested against different variant viruses. And you could see that we essentially don't get uh, cross-reactive and anti neutralizing antibody against the XBB1 until we've had multiple doses of the vaccine. And even there, many are many of the data points are at or below the limit of detection. In this study, looking at a number of different cohorts, uh, and you may have seen some of these data presented um, differently by um, Natalie, um, we're looking at cohorts that got three doses of the ancestral vaccine, four doses of ancestral vaccine, three doses of ancestral plus a bivalent BA4-5 lineage vaccine, vaccinated people who had a BA2 breakthrough, and vaccinated people that had a BA4-5 breakthrough infection. Again, looking at the y-axis are the um, neutralizing antibody titers, and on the x-axis are the titers tested against different variants. The far left is the ancestral, and the far right are the XBB um, and XBB.1. So what we see is that people who had three doses of the ancestral vaccine do not have uh, detectable neutralizing antibodies against the XBB and XBB.1. People that had four doses of the ancestral vaccine, you have just a few exceptions. But as we give it, as we look at Sarah from people that had um, three doses of the um, ancestral vaccine with the bivalent, the reduction the fold reduction from the neutralizing titer against the original ancestral strain is reduced down from 155 fold to 85 fold. With breakthrough infections with BA4 or 5, again, you see that. Um, here are another set of data from a different um, um, uh, citation. Here we're looking at the top panel at people that got the BA1 bivalent vaccine and below are people that got the BA4-5 bivalent vaccine. On the left-hand side are people that did not have prior infection, and this is, um, in this is tested in terms of nuclear capsid antibody. And on the right-hand side are people with hybrid immunity, so they've had prior infections in addition to vaccination. And so what we see is in that people that were owned that have their protection mediated by vaccination alone, we see relatively poor cross reactivity against the XBB1 um, lineage descendants. It's a bit better in people that got the BA4-5 bivalent vaccine, and it is a bit better in people that had hybrid immunity. One more study looking at people that got a BA5 bivalent booster. These are Sera 14 to 32 days post-infection, comparing people who had no infection history on the left and people with an infection history on the right. Again, reiterating that a, a lot of people that were vaccinated with the BA4-5 bivalent vaccine have lower undetectable antibody titers against XBB.1. Some have low titers with a 35-fold uh, reduction from the um, ancestral. But in contrast, people that have um, uh, hybrid immunity have some cross-reactivity. Now, we really struggled to find the correlation between these neutralizing antibody data and vaccine effectiveness data. There, the studies are summarized. Um, going down the left are the studies. And we're looking at relative vaccine effectiveness because, of course, there are no longer any placebo-controlled studies. So we're looking at relative vaccine effectiveness. The red spectrum are um, from people that got BA1 bivalent vaccines. And the blue spectrum colors are people that got BA4 or 5 bivalent vaccines. And we're looking at VE against death, severe disease, symptomatic disease, and any infection. So we see that the bivalent vaccines do provide a um, high degree of protection against death and severe disease, and it gradually reduces um, when we look at um, protection from infection. There was one study from Finland that split the data out in terms of the um, hazard ratio. So it's the risk of severe disease 
at two different time periods. Uh, the green symbols are hospitalization due to COVID. The blue triangles are deaths due to COVID-19. And the red inverted triangles are deaths in which COVID-19 was a contributing factor. And here the data have been split out um, over a period where BA, XBB1 descendant lineages on the right-hand side had been circulating. And this is the first evidence that we, the hint that we have that perhaps the um, protection or vaccine effectiveness is reduced um, in a period when XBB1 um, lineage viruses were circulating. You heard already about antigenic cartography. So we look to see where the XBB lineage viruses fall. Here's XBB1 and XBB1.5, and they are again quite distinct from BA2. We have limited um, precision on where these, um, these are located, but they're antigenically quite distinct. And now we're looking at the antigenic cartography of the variants using hamster sera. And you can see that XBB.1 is up here um, and it's quite distant from BA.4.5 and BA.1 and 2. So what about um, animal data from uh, infection with an XBB1 descendant lineage virus? And so here on the left-hand side are sera from hamsters that were infected with an XBB.1. And on the right-hand side with um, hamsters that were infected with XBB. And you can see that these sera cross-react well with the different variants. And there's relatively um, poor cross-reactivity going back towards the older um, lineage viruses. There, was a, there has been a lot of concern about this phenomenon of immune, immunologic imprinting. And so this is a phenomenon where um, if you have people that have a memory response to the um, prior vaccination or prior infection, and you then vaccinate with a new antigen, whether you boost, primarily boost the, um, and the memory response or whether you make new memory B cells. So here's a, a lot of information and I will talk you through it um, slowly. Um, so these are neutralizing antibody titers and we're looking at the top panel. So these are people, these are different cohorts in China from people that received three doses of the inactivated coronavac vaccine. And then they had a BA1 breakthrough infection or a BA2 breakthrough or BA5 breakthrough or BF7 breakthrough infection. And in all of these people who were vaccinated with the ancestral inactivated vaccine and then had breakthrough infections, they all had higher and neutralizing antibody titers against the ancestral strain than they did against the new vaccine, the, the new variant that they were infected with. However, when people had two breakthrough infections in a row, you then lost this evidence of immunologic imprinting. Uh, so these are uh, people that had a BA1 breakthrough followed by BA5 or BA7, a BA2 breakthrough followed by a BA5 and BA7. So repeated exposure to Omicron lineage viruses um, with, with the repeated exposure uh, to these new antigens, you lose the evidence of immunologic imprinting. And this last panel here are people that were not vaccinated, but they had a BA1 or BA2 infection followed by a BA5, BA7. And here you do not see the preferential boosting of the response to the ancestral strain. Now, if you go to the lower panel, um, we're now looking at how these sera from these last three groups perform in testing against the XBB lineage viruses. So now you're focused on the um, right-hand um, four columns of these neutralizing antibody titers, and you can see that there is cross-reactivity in people that had breakthrough or serial breakthrough infections um, and in, in both instances. So to summarize the data that we reviewed in our um, committee meeting, that in the fourth year of the pandemic, there's high seroprevalence in the global population following infection or vaccination. And the immunologic profiles is against SARS-CoV-2 are highly heterogeneous. Um, there are people who have been infected with different variants or vaccinated using different platforms. But there continues to be a substantial genetic and antigenic evolution of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, and the evolutionary trajectory continues to diverge from the index virus. 
even though there's some, there are increasing gaps in genomic surveillance globally, the available data indicates that the index virus and the early variants are no longer detected in humans. As of May of 2023, the XBB1 descendant lineage is currently predominant globally. These XBB descendant lineages, including XBB 1.5 and 1.16, are highly immune um, escape, um, um, have immune, uh, uh, have escaped immune detection. XBB 1.5 being one of the variants with the greatest magnitude of immune escape from neutralizing antibodies to date. The estimates of VE against currently circulating variants, including the XBB1 descendant lineage, are very limited in terms of numbers of studies, vaccine products evaluated, and populations assessed. Some studies showed similar VE against BA5 descendant and XBB1 descendant lineages, while others suggest, suggest reduced VE during periods of performance of XBB1 descendant lineages. Sera from people who had received two, three, or four doses of index virus-based vaccines or a booster dose of a bivalent, either BA1 or BA4-5 mRNA vaccines, showed substantially lower neutralizing antibody titers against XBB descendant lineages as compared to titers specific for the antigens included in the vaccines. And of course, people with hybrid immunity due to any SARS-CoV-2 infection showed higher neutralizing antibody titers against the XBB descendant lineages as compared to those who were vaccinated with no event evidence of infection. There's in vitro evidence of immune imprinting that may be occurring, but based on observational epi data, epi studies to date, the clinical impact of this remains unclear. We saw preclinical data shared confidentially by vaccine manufacturers that showed that vaccination with XBB1 descendant lineage containing candidate vaccines, including XBB1.5, elicited higher neutralizing antibody uh, responses to currently circulating variants compared to currently approved vaccines. We acknowledged limitations of the available evidence. We had the timing, specific mutations and antigenic characteristics and the potential public health impact remain unknown. The majority of available preclinical and clinical responses are to XBB1 and 1.5 and minimal data on any of the other variants. The data on immune responses over time following infection are limited. The data on immune responses specific for XBB1 descendant lineages are largely restricted to neutralizing antibody and are limited for other aspects of the immune response, including cellular immunity. Data on protection conferred by hybrid immunity are largely derived from populations that received mRNA booster vaccines. Data on VE on current COVID vaccines, including index-based and bivalent against XBB descendant lineages were limited, and estimates during periods of XBB1 descendant lineage circulation were only available for the mRNA vaccines. Data on candidate vaccines that include an XBB1 descendant lineage were limited to animal models. So we recommended that in order to improve protection, in particular against symptomatic disease, new formulations of COVID-19 vaccines should aim to induce antibody responses that neutralize XBB descendant lineages. Again, I'll emphasize that our focus is on achieving breadth of immunity. So one approach that we recommended was the use of a monovalent XBB1 descendant lineage, such as XBB1.5, as a vaccine antigen. And given the small genetic and antigenic differences from XBB1.5, XBB1.16 may be an alternative. And other formulations or platforms that achieve robust neutralizing responses against XBB descendant lineages could also be considered. While currently approved COVID-19 vaccines, including those based on the index vaccine virus, continue to provide protection against severe disease, our committee advised moving away from the inclusion of the index virus and future formulations of COVID-19 vaccines for a couple of reasons. First, the index virus and antigenically closely related variants no longer circulate in humans. The index virus antigen elicits undetectable or very low levels of neutralizing antibodies against currently circulating variants, including XBB descendant lineages. The inclusion of the index virus in bi or multivalent vaccines reduces the concentration of the new target antigen as compared to monovalent vaccines, and this may decrease the magnitude of the humoral immune response. 
immune imprinting due to repeated exposure to the index virus may actually reduce the immune response to new target antigens. But as I pointed out, the clinical correlation of this is not clear. So with that, I think I will close and thank you for your attention and see if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Subrow, for a very broad and helpful uh, uh, explanation of where we are right now. Uh, I'm getting the feeling that we are moving towards the situation we usually have with influenza, where it's very difficult, given different manufacturing uh, approaches, to come up with a a strain-specific recommendation that we are going towards something like, uh, like a like re uh, recommendation, giving a the manufacturers a bit of a choice. Are, is that where we are going now? So one difference from what we do in influenza is with, in the case of influenza, we actually name strains and we will att we've attempted to do so um, because we want to make sure that if we say XBB 1.5, that people know which um, what that consensus sequence should look like. Um, we don't really, I don't have a huge amount of confidence that we have really understood the cadence of or the, of this evolution. And so our committee is planning to meet twice a year, about six months apart, um, to review the data and to see whether, in fact, uh, an update is needed or not needed. So I think it's it's where I'm still not sure we're exactly where we are with flu, um, but we certainly um, there there's there are some commonalities. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Thank you, Kanta, for a great presentation. So I have one comment and one question. So this whole issue of leaving out the ancestral strain that depends on it not circulating, particularly for children zero to 23 months who may not be exposed to the virus previously. So with the decreased testing around the world, how are we, I think that could potentially be a problem. Uh, which I think you would agree with. But the question I had was looking at these different uh, variants, the one point, the XBB 0.1.5 and 0.16 and, the, and XBB 0.2.3. Uh, one of our questions is which one should be in the formula? And you're, you, the WHO is addressing the same question, but it looks to me like they're so close that it may be an unanswerable question because the differences could be out of the spike protein completely, even if you have less efficacy, it may be because of ORF 9B or some other protein. So how, how are you guys approaching that? Right. So so we'll take your comment first, and that is about how confident are we that the um, ancestral strain and its related early variants are truly um, not circulating. I think we are quite confident that they are not circulating. Certainly surveillance has changed over time, but we are not um, seeing any evidence of those viruses circulating. Um, and the only um, age group in which that would be a problem would be the very young, um, because almost everybody else, because of you know the evidence I've shown you on seroprevalence, would have a memory response to the older strains. Um, the second question is about how related these are. So I think I'd really want to emphasize that that um, unlike the way we, people think we do this for flu, we really want to achieve the breadth of immunity that would cover these strains. And you could see that they are quite related. And so we're trying to achieve breadth that would cover um, the XBB1 descendant lineages. And I think um, that to me is more important than sort of saying exactly which. So we're not trying to match exactly what's going to circulate. We want to provide the breadth of immunity that covers that class of viruses. Thank you. And uh, I just want to point out to the committee that Dr. Subarau is not going to be available this afternoon when we get into our general discussion. So if you have any Additional questions that you'd like to ask her, uh, please uh, do so now in the next couple of minutes. Dr. Levy. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Subaru, for a great presentation. You elegantly reviewed WHO's uh, assessment 
of the uh, variants and the antibody response uh, to the different variants and, and how those do or do not match up. Um, my question to you relates to correlates of protection. This has been an ongoing issue. How well do we know those correlates? Obviously, antibodies are important and are well worth measuring. They're not the whole story. Dr. Offit uh, made a comment earlier today, which I agree to uh, as well. Has WHO considered any T cell based immunologic data in uh, analyzing uh, the situation? And what do you learn? What do we learn from that? Yeah, no, I think that's. And, a and, and I'm sorry, and it's specifically around the issue of any potential value of including the uh, original index strain. You're very clear in your recommendation that you don't think that's indicated at this point, but does the T cell data speak to that point as well? Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I think that we all acknowledge that um, neutralizing antibody is a very important correlate of protection, but it doesn't tell the whole story because as we see um, in repeated data sets, that there's very poor neutralizing activity against um, the XBB descendant lineages um, induced by the ancestral vaccine, and yet there's good protection against severe illness and death. So clearly um, other arms of the immune system are playing a role there. We do not have a, um, a lot of data on understanding the mechanisms for that protection. Um, and we're not, I, and I really can't point to a lot of information that provides that. I got it. And a gap. Is, is WHO advocating that for the future to, to capture more of this T cell data? Absolutely. Is Absolutely. WHO on record uh, with that? Um, so there are different parts of the WHO um, committees, including yeah. the Technical Advisory Group on Virus Evolution, as well as Tag Kovac, but we would certainly encourage ongoing studies to try to understand this. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, Dr. Manto. Um, Dr. Silvero, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a comment and a question. Um, the comment is um, regarding um, chasing variants, if you will. Um, so we know that um, this virus continues to evolve uh, and it doesn't seem to be reverting towards the ancestral strain and, and evolving from its current status. Uh, obviously where we are today is most likely not going to be where we will be a few months from now when um, the vaccines will be deployed. And so um, we've talked in the past about not trying to to chase variants, but it seems like that's where we find ourselves now. Um, my question related to that is about um, the conserved areas on the virus um, that don't appear to be undergoing so much change. And if any work is being done to uh, prepare vaccine candidates based on those, could you address that? Sure. Um, so I think that is an area of great interest to find um, conserved portions of the spike protein or conserved um, that would elicit more broadly cross-reactive um, immunity. Um, and there certainly are elements of the spike that are conserved. Um, there's a lot of effort I see more in the space of the monoclonal antibodies, for instance. Um, and so, But I think in terms of I don't see them coming into focus, particularly yet for um, vaccines that are in current use. So it's still in a research space. Um, and I think that that is something, you know, we have a parallel of this in influenza as well, looking at the HA stem, for instance. Um, so there are conserved portions of the spike that are, um, are being explored by people with monoclonal antibodies and in the research space. But if you have a spike, a full spike protein, you would expect that you would induce immunity against um, different mm -hmm. portions of the, of the molecule. Thank um, you. Dr. Monte, could I ask a follow-up question? Well, <laughs> very uh, of short follow-up question. Very quick follow-up. We're already late. Dr. Silvera, you mentioned that your committee is planning to meet approximately every six months. Should we expect uh, recommendations for modification of uh, the vaccine candidate in six months time? Um, the, it's going to be entirely data driven. If there are, we are going to meet every six months to review the data, there may be no update, there may be an update. We will just see how the data turn out. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Meisner. 
Thank you, uh, doc, Dr. Monteau. And uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Sabaro. I have a question for you specifically. Can you comment on your opinion regarding the importance of standardizing the vaccines from a global perspective? So the WHO is very um, concerned about making sure that vaccines are available for the entire population. Um, not, And I know that the VRPAC is meeting specifically about the United States. Um, so we have met with a number of manufacturers from different that have different platforms um, to try to make sure that um, the message goes out um, that this apply that our recommendations apply to all platforms. Thank you. I think we all hope we can standardize as much as possible. Things are difficult enough as they are in terms of uh, trying to figure out uh, past histories of uh, vaccination, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Subaru. I mean, that was a terrific discussion. Uh, a, a simple question. I don't know if you have um, if you have data that you might be able to uh, poll to uh, to to respond to this question, but uh, are there do we have information on uh, on geographic or population based um, uh, changes that might be taking place that might give us a hint of uh, the leading edge of the evolution of the co uh, of the of the virus? Um. So. All I could say is that there is a uh, there's a separate committee at the WHO called the TAG VE that monitors virus evolution, um, and they have a risk assessment framework now. And so they look at new variants as they emerge and their impact on diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And then it comes to our committee specifically on vaccine composition. So they're all, we're all part of, of a um, system that sort of looks at different aspects and communicate with each other. But at this point, we don't have it, uh, have anything that give us that might give us a hint of where the direction that uh, that the virus might go. Not really. I think what we're more confident of than we were a year ago is that the trajectory is essentially linear. Um, and the WHO is working hard to make sure that um, that there is sufficient surveillance, say sentinel surveillance in different parts of the world so that we do actually have some monitoring capability. Thank you. Thank you. Going to call on Dr. Nelson and then Dr. Hawkins, and then we are going to let Kanta get back to her regular activities. Dr. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Monto, Mike Nelson, University of Virginia. Um, I want to thank you for that very elegant presentation and particularly the insightful impact of the immune imprinting on your deliberations. So you certainly address the selection piece of what should go in a vaccine. I would like to ask whether the WHO was under the assumption that the vaccination would be occurring on an annual basis as the posture we've adopted here in the United States. And the second question would be, were there any particular factors that the tag COVAC um, in their deliberations identifies as key factors for literally not selecting the latest emerging strain that's circulating throughout the world? Um, so that's two parts. So the first part is, um, uh, can you remind me, the first first part was? Yeah, was it the assumption on an annual vaccination? Oh, You're yes. meeting twice right. a year. Yeah. The question so, from, yes. came up, are you going to change it mid-year? Seemed to raise the question to me, is it really going to be administered more than once a year? No, or I think that, yes. So the reason we're meeting twice a year is because I think the temperate climates of the Northern Hemisphere seem to have you know, sort of decided that they will do a fall um, campaign. Um, but the WHO's recommendations are for the whole world. And so we do want to make sure that we're monitoring what's happening for the tropical belt as well as the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and so that's the reason for the twice a year discussion. Um, we th This committee is very strictly in the lane of recommending the vaccine antigen composition. 
there's a different part of the WHO that is SAGE. And of course, each country has their own regulatory authority that decides when vaccine is used. So our committee does not comment on that. We're just going to review the data on an ongoing basis, no less than twice a year. We may have to do it more often than twice a year. Would Why would we not go with the most recent virus? Um, because I do believe that we need some data on antigenic cartography. We need to know how distant it is. We need to know a little bit about the performance of the of the of that particular spike, either in infection or vaccination, at least from preclinical data. So I don't think we'll be, ever be in a situation where we could just jump on the most recent one because we don't actually know how. Um, how different it is from something that we know a lot more about. And so I would like us to continue to have the, some confidence from the data that, you know, that we have a sense of what's happening with, say, this XBB1 um, descendant vintage, for instance. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And this is a follow-up on comments by Dr. Meisner, regarding global uh, protection. I may have misread the slide early on, and um, this was about data available in Asia and Africa. It appeared that there was some areas of no data. If that was accurate, can we use the information that WHO is providing regarding recommendations for the rest of the world? Yeah, so there's certainly, I mean, the WHO is in the process of setting up what they're calling COVID-net, to make sure that sort of like the global influenza program has, you know, um, laboratories that um, that are on the ground that then report to reference laboratories and so on. So they're still in the process of doing that. I think what we have for the time being is collection of information that different organizations are generating on their own. So this is not, this is much less of a sort of network that um, WHO necessarily controls. They can encourage. Um, and so we certainly have gaps in data and the WHO is trying to address this by developing this COVID-net system. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we're scheduled for a break uh, and we're running a bit late. Can we start, uh, uh, Suzanne, at 11.15 instead of uh, uh, 11.20? In other um, words, can we have a 10-minute break? Um, yes, Dr. Monto. I trust your judgment. Okay, 11.15 uh, Eastern, we return. Recording stopped.
Dr. Monto, if you could uh, unmute you yourself. Yes, okay. we are ready. Uh, welcome back. We now have three presentations from the vaccine uh, manufacturers. Uh, first, we're going to start with a presentation from Moderna. Uh, from uh, the group there is led by Ritupama Das. Uh, so over to you, uh, Dr. Das. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Good morning. My name is Rita Das, and I'm the therapeutic area head for respiratory vaccines at Moderna. As the pandemic has evolved, Moderna has continued to monitor emerging variants to ensure we are prepared to develop, to develop and evaluate new COVID-19 vaccines. We are committed to generating preclinical and clinical data to share with agencies worldwide to inform vaccine update decision making. Additionally, we maintain manufacturing readiness to supply new vaccines as the need arises. Accordingly, we support a harmonized recommendation by FDA and this committee, WHO, and other agencies around the world. Today, we will show you the results of our effectiveness study of the authorized BA45 bivalent vaccine, which complements the work that others have presented today. We will also show you the cross-neutralization ability of the BA45 vaccine for the XBB subfamily of variants. Finally, we've developed investigational XBB15 and XBB116 containing vaccines. We will be sharing preclinical data on both, as well as clinical data on the XBB15 containing vaccine. So let me begin with an update on the effectiveness of the currently authorized BA45 bivalent vaccine from an ongoing study in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente Southern California, a health system that covers 4.6 million people. The preprint for these analyses was posted to MedArchives earlier this week. We initiated this study to monitor the effectiveness of the original Moderna COVID-19 vaccine in 2020. The study protocol has subsequently been modified to monitor the effectiveness of the Moderna BA45 bivalent vaccine since its authorization in 2022. The study uses a matched cohort design with three groups. First, individuals who have received the BA45 booster after at least two doses of any mRNA vaccine. Then, individuals who have vac been vaccinated but have not received the BA45 bivalent booster. And finally, individuals who have not been vaccinated for COVID at all. The participants in these groups were matched on age, sex, race and ethnicity, and the index date, the vaccination date for the bivalent cohort. Use of the bivalent BA45 vaccine was captured from late August through the end of December of 2022, and follow-up was captured through January, through the end of January of 23. There are two planned comparisons of, for effectiveness in this study. First, the comparison between those who received the BA45 bivalent booster and those who were vaccinated but did not receive that booster. This is the relative effectiveness comparison. Next, the comparison of the BA45 bivalent booster recipients to those who received no COVID-19 vaccine. This is the absolute effectiveness comparison. Based on the continued sequencing of incident cases in the study, here's the distribution of SARS-CoV-2 variants from August 22 to January 23. The predominant variant during the observation period of this study was BA5, shown in dark blue. During January, the last month of collection of data for this analysis, there was some representation of XBB, shown in orange, and this was mostly XBB 1.15. Here are the baseline characteristics of the participants in the three cohorts. Age was similar in all cohorts. There was significant representation of non-white races. 
And among the bivalent vaccine recipients, maybe many had received a vaccine as a fourth or fifth dose. And the original vaccine group, most had received the vaccine as a third or fourth dose. The time since the last dose was shorter in the bivalent group. Moving now to the vaccine effectiveness results. Recipients of a bivalent booster demonstrated a relative vaccine effectiveness of 70% against chart-confirmed hospitalizations for COVID-19, which was the primary endpoint for the study, compared to those who had received the original mRNA vaccine. Relative effectiveness against COVID-19 deaths was 83%, and relative vaccine effectiveness for ED or urgent care visits was 55%. On the right, the absolute vaccine effectiveness numbers were high, 83% for hospitalization, 90% for deaths, and 55% for ED or urgent care visits. These data confirm that during the BA5 wave in the US, the Moderna bivalent COVID-19 vaccine protected vaccinated individuals against hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19 and as, as well as from ED and urgent care visits from the illness. I'll now turn the presentation to Dr. Darren Edwards, who will discuss our variant monitoring and preclinical evaluation of new vaccine candidates. Thank you, Dr. Das. My name is Darren Edwards, and I'm Executive Director, Program Leader of COVID-19 Vaccines at Moderna. We continuously monitor for emerging variants and classify them based on three factors, incorporation of immunovating mutations, their measured growth dynamics, and global and region-specific coverage. In this process, we group antigenically similar lineages, as antigenic coverage does not always require exact sequence matching. For emerging variants that are growing rapidly, preclinical mRNA materials are prepared and key manufacturing steps are initiated as soon as possible to prepare for the possibility of vaccine update requests from health agencies. These efforts are performed to allow for expedited delivery of new vaccines as they are requested. As was also presented by the CDC earlier today, in most regions, the XBB sublineage is dominating with XBB15 the most dominant. However, it is important to highlight that the XBB sublineage is comprised of several co-circulating variants and continues to evolve. We group XBB variant viruses into a common subfamily based on antigenic similarities seen in their spike proteins. Each circle in this Venn diagram shows the total number of mutations for XBB15 and XBB116 versus the ancestral virus. The number one on the left and the number two on the right identify that in total, there are only three unique mutations between these XBB variants. The overlapping section of the Venn diagram in dark orange indicates 41 mutations differ from the ancestral virus, but are shared between XBB15 and XBB116. In contrast, the Venn diagram on the right shows there are 15 unique mutations on BA1 and 13 unique mutations on BA5 that are not shared between these two variants. The overlap in the middle highlights that there are only 21 mutations in common between the two variant, these two variants versus the ancestral virus. It is an, important to highlight that BA1 and BA5 would not have been grouped into a common subfamily based on their antigenic differences. This type of analysis provides the basis for a variant planning strategy. Here is a comparison of the antigenic differences between XBB subvariants and BA5, a component of the currently authorized vaccine. XBB15 is on the left, and XBB116 is on the right. Significant antigenic differences were found with XBB15, differing from BA5 by 20 mutations, while XBB116 differs from BA5 by 23 mutations. This level of antigenic change especially in key sites of known neutralization in the receptor binding domain and the N-terminal domain, suggests that XBB cell lineage viruses have evolved to significantly evade immunity provided by prior Omicron infection or the currently authorized BA5 bivalent boosters. 
This suggests that an updated vaccine composition may be needed. Next, we will show that these antigenic differences may contribute to decreased cross-neutralization of XBB variants. In participants without and with prior infection, SEER collected after vaccination with the BA.4.5 authorized booster were assessed for neutralization against BA.4.5 and XBB subvariants. As shown in the blue on the left, titers against BA.4.5 were quite robust in both cohorts. While neutralization against XBB.1.5 variant, shown in orange on the right, was detectable, but considerably lower. This also may provide a rationale for the real-world effectiveness data, which shows reduced protection from BA.4.5 bivalent vaccine when XBB family subvariants predominate. The XBB sublineage continues to evolve over time, with newer subvariants emerging in specific geographical regions, including XBB.232, which has now emerged in several countries, including the U.S. Here we see the antigenic differences between XBB.1.5 and XBB.1.16 on the left. XBB.1.5 versus XBB.232 in the middle. And XBB.1.16 versus XBB.232 on the right. Again, limited antigenic differences are noted between these three different subvariants of XBB. Of note, XBB.191, which is also circulating, and XBB15 have identical spike proteins. This analysis suggests that cross neutralization of the XBB subfamily is not likely to be significantly impacted, regardless of which specific XBB, XBB variant is selected for inclusion in an updated 2023 fall COVID vaccine composition. And now I would like to walk you through preclinical studies of investigational XBB monovalent and bivalent subvariant containing vaccines. These vaccines are developed and evaluated in mice as primary series and boosters to confirm that they are immunogenic in naive and previously vaccinated animals and to evaluate the breadth of immunity across variants. Both primary two dose vaccina vaccination studies as well as booster studies were performed with booster vaccination assessed in mice previously immunized with a two-dose series of our original vaccine. Invest investigational vaccines for monovalent XBB.1.5 or XBB.1.16, as well as bivalent vaccines comprised of BA.4.5 plus XBB.1.5 or BA.4.5 plus XBB.1.16 have been developed and are in the process of being evaluated. Now I'll show you neutralization titers in mice vaccinated with a primary two-dose series of the BA.4.5 bivalent vaccine versus monovalent XBB.1.5 and, and the BA.4.5 plus X, XBB.1.5 bivalent vaccine. Here are the neutralization titers for the BA.4.5 bivalent vaccine against BA.4.5, XBB.1.5, XBB.1.16, and XBB.2.3.2 viruses, all listed on the x-axis. We saw high levels of neutralization against the BA.4.5 virus, but limited neutralization of the XBB sublineage viruses. In contrast, XBB.1.5 containing vaccines demonstrated high levels of neutralization against XBB sublineage viruses. It is important to highlight that XBB.1.16 and XBB.2.3.2 were effectively neutralized by both XBB.1.5 containing vaccines. Next, I will describe the neutralization titers from our booster study, comparing the same investigational XBB.1.5 containing vaccines. Neutralization was assessed prior to the booster dose, as shown with the hash lines, and after, shown with the solid colors. On the x-axis are the variants BA.4.5 and XBB viruses. The fold increase in titers measured after the boost, compared to the pre-boost titer, is listed below the graphs. Both XBB.1.5 containing boosters increased neutralization against XBB subvariant viruses to levels higher than the BA.4.5 booster, with minor differences in neutralization measured between XBB.1.5, XBB.1.16, and limited reduction versus XBB.2.3.2. 
Next, I will describe the neutralization results from our booster study comparing XBB116 containing vaccines. Both investigational XBB116 containing boosters increase neutralization against XBB subvariant viruses with 11 to 33 fold increased neutral neutralizing antibody titers measured after the boost. As seen in the previous booster study with XBB15 containing vaccines, only minor differences in neutralization were measured between XBB15, XBB116, and XBB232 viruses. In summary, preclinical data suggests that an XBB containing vaccine is more immunogenic against currently circulating XBB variants than the authorized BA45 bivalent vaccine. Consistent with the minimal antigenic differences seen across the XBB subfamily, cross neutralization across the XBB sublineage for both XBB containing vaccines was demonstrated. And now I'll turn it back to Dr. Doss to describe results from our clinical assessment of the investigational XBB15 variant containing vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. In the interest of providing data for the strain selection process, we performed a clinical study in which 101 participants were randomized to receive either a monovalent XBB15 vaccine or a bivalent BA45 plus XBB15 vaccine. The total dose for each vaccine was 50 micrograms. All of the study participants had previously received four doses of vaccine, a two-dose primary series and a booster of the original vaccine, plus any BA45 mRNA bivalent booster vaccine three or more months prior to enrollment in the study. All analyses from the study are descriptive. The characteristics of the recipients of the monovalent and the bivalent vaccine were generally balanced. The median age was approximately 50 years, and there was representation of individuals above 65 in both groups. The number of participants with prior SARS-CoV-2 infection was approximately 70% in both groups. This slide shows the neutralization titers against XBB15 from the two vaccines. The monovalent XBB15 vaccine is in orange and the bivalent XBB15 vaccine is in green. Both vaccines induced robust XBB15 neutralizing responses. The GMT and the fold rise for the monovalent vaccine was numerically higher than that seen for the bivalent vaccine. And here on the right are the cross neutralization titers against XBB116 from both XBB15 vaccines. Again, both vaccines induced robust XBB116 neutralizing responses, and the titers were numerically higher for the monovalent vaccine. For each vaccine, the neutralization titers against XBB15 and XBB116 were similar, and this is expected given the antigenic similarity between these two XBB variants. Here are the same data now separated by prior SARS-CoV-2 infection status. As we've seen previously, the post-boost titers are numerically higher in the SARS-CoV-2 positive group, but this an analysis confirms overall that administration of an XBB15 containing vaccine provides a substantial increase in XBB15 and XBB116 responses regardless of a history of prior infection. We also tested the sera from the monovalent and bivalent XBB15 vaccines for cross neutralization against BA45, as well as the ancestral strain D614G. The pre boost titers against BA45 were high since everyone had received a bivalent booster, but there was still a rise after vaccination with the XBB15 containing vaccine. The pre-boost titers on the right now against the ancestral strain were also high, and there was still a rise after vaccination, 
the titers, now the titers against BA4-5 and the titers against ancestral strain were similar with either the monovalent or the bivalent vaccine. Now note that the ancestral titers are no longer the highest titers observed, despite everyone in the study having received multiple doses of the ancestral strain. This observation is promising because it indicates that it may be possible to retrain immunity with updated vaccines. As has been discussed earlier today, the XBB232 subvariant has recently emerged and is increasing in circulation. Using our research assay, we were able to quickly assess the neutralization titers against XBB232 in a randomly selected subset of 20 participants from the XBB15 monovalent vaccine recipients in our clinical study. The XBB15 monovalent vaccine elicited similar and robust neutralizing antibody titers against XBB15, XBB116, and XBB232, further demonstrating the ability of the XBB15 monovalent vaccine to cross-neutralize multiple XBB variants. We are also showing here the breakdown of the random subset analysis by baseline SARS-CoV-2 status across the variants in the research assay. The same trend is seen with numerically higher GMTs for baseline positive participants. Overall, this analysis shows that again, administration of the XBB15 monovalent vaccine provides a substantial increase in XBB15, XBB116, and XBB232 responses, regardless of prior infection. Now we'll move to the safety of the vaccines. Again, the monovalent vaccine is in orange and the bivalent vaccine is in green. This slide shows the solicited local reactions. Both vaccines were well tolerated. Pain was the most frequent local reaction and all other reactions were very low. For reference, here are the local reactions from the original booster in light blue and the BA45 bivalent in dark blue you can see that the local reactions across all vaccines are generally similar. Here are the systemic reactions reported post-vaccination. Headache, fatigue, myalgia, and arthralgia are the most common reactions. Systemic reactions are also similar for both monovalent and bivalent XBB15 containing vaccines. And there are very few grade three reactions and no grade four reactions. Again, the systemic reactions for the prior vaccines shown in the bottom panel are consistent. There have been no serious AEs, deaths, or AEs leading to discontinuation in our current study. So with that, I would like to summarize the data we have shown you today. The BA45 bivalent vaccine was highly effective against COVID-19 hospitalizations, death, and ED and urgent care visits over the 22-23 period when BA5 was predominant. The anagenic similarities in the XBB variants support the subfamily grouping of these variants. We also evaluated XBB-containing vaccines in both preclinical and clinical studies. Preclinical data suggests that an XBB-containing vaccine is more immunogenic against currently circulating XBB variants than the authorized BA45 bivalent vaccine. Her clinical study demonstrates that XBB15-containing vaccines elicit robust cross-neutralizing antibodies against all XBB variants. The neutralization titers generated by the XBB15 vaccines are very similar against XBB15, XBB116, and XBB232. The safety profile of the variant containing vaccines continues to be very similar to the previously authorized vaccines, both the original COVID-19 vaccine as well as the bivalent. 
we confirm that Moderna is prepared to provide adequate supply of a new variant containing vaccine for fall of 2023, based on the recommendation made today by the FDA. Thank you very much to the committee for the opportunity to present. We also thank our investigators, study site personnel, and all the individuals who participated in the trials. We are very happy to address any questions. And thank you for keeping right on time. Uh, questions? We have a few minutes for questions here. Dr. McGinnis. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I have a question for Moderna. So do you have an independent um, epidemiological program about um, viruses that are causing disease? Or are you purely respondent to uh, or CDC through FDA on what you should make? So, you know, I... I I guess I've been in this business a long time and there are different models. So do you view yourselves as a collaborator in identifying um, the strains that are causing disease or the you know lineages that are causing disease? Or are you just a recipient of data and then you try to respond to that? So we do have an uh, we do have our own independent surveillance program. Um, we conduct the surveillance so that we can very quickly, as Dr. Edwards mentioned, identify which variants are uh, are becoming more prominent and which variants deserve the preclinical and uh, sometimes clinical evaluation. But in conjunction with what we do, um, for instance, prior to this meeting, we've had multiple meetings with uh, a lot of the folks on the call here, with a lot of regulatory agencies around the world, so that that line of bi-directional communication is open. So, sorry, Arnold, a follow-up. So you have your own independent surveillance that you then feed into WHO, to the FDA, I mean, other authorities, whatever. Um, is that what you're saying? Yes, we do do our own independent surveillance and we are, you know, we are very happy and we routinely share our surveillance data globally. So it's interesting. It's okay, not parsed uh, out uh, in Pamela, data. We have, we've got a hard stop because of the oral public hearing. So uh, I, I hear you, Arnold. I just I want to determine what Moderna is doing with regard okay, to. Okay, go ahead. I, I I've asked the question. I want to understand what they're doing independently for surveillance because it's not that they're short of resources. So I want to be sure what contribution is coming in. Um, I'm I mean, we we do our we have epidemiologists in Moderna. We have clinical epidemiologists as well as research epidemiologists. They are looking at the tools and doing the surveillance. As I mentioned, we're also doing um, we're continuing to sequence in our Kaiser study. We are looking at all of those data together, and so we're looking at publicly available data and data that we are also getting from our studies. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so, so I have a, a technical question. So when you make these new vaccines, the S proteins from these different viruses are a little different. Some of them seem to enter more at the surface, some at the, uh, in the endosome. Do you monitor for levels of, of S protein expression? And clearly, the, res the responses are very nice, but are there differences? Do you ever have to tweak the dosage that you're using? So not the not the dosage, but we do, you know, because we like to we, our goal is to keep the dosages very similar because we want this to be a seamless kind of replacement process. And now we've shown that the safety is very consistent. Um, we've had about 10,000 people receive uh, variant vaccines in our clinical trials. We do monitor. We, we generate kind of several candidate sequences and we monitor the expression levels and then choose a, a final sequence. And are there differences between the variants? Um, not, not very much. Not very much that we've seen. Thank you. 
Thank you. We're going to have to move on. As I said, we've got a hard stop because of the oral um, present uh, uh, the the oral public hearing. So now we're moving to Pfizer. Um, the presentation is going to be led by Dr. Kina Swanson. Dr. Swanson. Thank you, Dr. Monto, and good morning to the committee. My name is Kina Swanson, and I am head of viral vaccines R&D at Pfizer. On behalf of both Pfizer and BioNTech, it is my pleasure to provide an overview of the recent data that aims to support selection of the vaccine composition for the upcoming fall winter season. For today's presentation, I will focus on both humoral and cellular immunity data from our Omicron BA1 and BA4-5 modified vaccine clinical studies and learnings from preclinical evaluation of updated vaccine compositions representing more contemporary SARS-CoV-2 variants. Then I will end the presentation with an update on our plans for supply of the vaccine. As you already heard earlier today, the XBB sublineages of Omicron continue to dominate the SARS-CoV-2 variant landscape, with XBB 1.5 being the most dominant in the US since February of this year. Continued monitoring of sublineage proportions has shown an increase in other XBBs, indicated by the chart on the left with XBB 116 showing potential to be the next variant to displace XBB 1.5. The group categorized as others in this analysis includes a collection of other sublineages that differ slightly in the spike sequence, but individually remain at overall low levels. And as indicated on the right, and as you heard in the prior presentation, the most predominant strains within XBB 1.9 are also increasing, but do not differ from the XBB 1.5 in the spike amino acid sequence. XBB 116 and XBB 2.3 differ from 1.5 by only two or three amino, acids, amino acid substitutions, respectively. Later in the presentation, I will share data to better understand if these sequence differences translate to any immunological differences. Importantly, the antigenic distance of these XBB sublineages from the earlier Omicron BA5 is even more so than the distance of Omicron BA5 was from the original SARS-CoV-2. The vaccine update to the bivalent Omicron BA45 vaccine in 2022 showed that more closely matching circulating strains offered improved protection against COVID-19. On the right are data from the CDC showing improved effectiveness of the bivalent vaccine against COVID-19 hospitalizations compared to individuals that received the original monovalent vaccines. Data for younger adults are shown above and for adults 65 and older shown below. With the emergence of the more antigenically distant XBB sublineages and longer time since the booster dose, the vaccine effectiveness has notably waned from approximately 60% absolute VE to less than 30%. Collectively, the data support that variant adapted vaccines improve protection and that an updated vaccine likely more closely matched to the circulating XBBs is warranted. We are still early in the understanding of SARS-CoV-2 evolution and potential seasonal cycles. However, disease activity may be settling into a more typical pattern of peaking during the winter months. Shown on the left is a heat map of data from the from Northern Hemisphere countries, with blue indicating the peak of COVID-19 hospitalizations, all occurring during the typical winter peak observed for other seasonal respiratory viruses, such as those shown on the right for influenza, RSV, and the endemic human coronaviruses. Now I would like to focus on relevant immunogenicity data from our prior clinical studies evaluating Omicron-adapted vaccines. We have previously shown superior Omicron neutralizing responses with Omicron adapted vaccines compared to the original vaccine as a fourth dose booster, which aligns with the real world observations showing variant adapted vaccines provide increased protection against circulating strains and can restore waning immunity. 
For today's presentation, I will share an expanded characterization of the humoral response against more recent Omicron strains, as well as characterization of the memory B-cell response, and finally, a view into the T-cell response. In brief, both monovalent and bivalent Omicron-adapted vaccines recall spike-specific memory B-cells that recognize epitopes shared between the wild type and Omicron spike and can induce Omicron-specific B-cells. We also see clear expansion of both CD4 and CD8 T-cell responses following a variant-adapted booster. First, let's review the clinical and preclinical experience we have gained for variant adapted vaccines and the importance of these data to inform vaccine composition. Collectively, these data sets have aligned well when evaluating the overall variant immune response profile as new SARS-CoV-2 variants have emerged. Now I will show results from an evaluation of the neutralizing activity of the current bivalent BA45 vaccine against Omicron XBB 1.5 and 1.16. Here we show a descriptive analysis comparing the bivalent and original monovalent vaccine neutralizing activity against Omicron XBB 1.5 shown on the left and 1.16 sublineages shown on the right from a subset of participants greater than 55 years of age using a SARS-CoV-2 fluorescent focus reduction neutralization assay. In each data set, Omicron BA45 was included as an internal control as these were separate testing runs. These data are from the same set, subset of participants that were previously used for XBB.1 neutralization data that was published in January of this year. Data are shown for participants with or without prior infection at baseline. Improved responses were observed with the bivalent vaccine in purple compared to the original vaccine in blue, regardless of prior infection status. Similar neutralizing activity was shown for both XBB sublineages. However, GMTs were much lower compared to the vaccine matched Omicron BA45. These data are in agreement with effectiveness data showing that Omicron-based vaccines can provide improved protective immunity against Omicron sublineages. However, lower XBB titers reflect the greater antigenic distance of the current strains. It is important to note that because XBB 1.5 has a spike sequence identical to the predominant XBB 1.9 strains, data for 1.5 shown here should reflect activity against 1.9. Next, B cell responses were evaluated in a subset of individuals who received three prior doses of the original BNT 162B2 vaccine and were then boosted with the bivalent Omicron BA1 vaccine as a fourth dose. The participants evaluated in this study were SARS-CoV-2 naive at the time of the BA1 booster was administered. As shown to the right, a flow cytometry-based method using distinctly labeled wild type and Omicron BA1 spike proteins as probes was used to detect memory B cells specific to either wild type epitopes shown in blue or to Omicron epitopes shown in green and finally, those specific to shared surface epitopes between both wild type and Omicron spikes, noted in the top right in orange. Overall, the bivalent booster increases frequencies of memory B cells, recognizing shared and Omicron BA1 specific epitopes. To orient you to the slide, B cells recognizing shared epitopes is shown on the left, and those to epitopes specific to wild type or Omicron BA1 are shown on the right. Responses were assessed seven days and one month after administration of the BA1 booster dose. The data show a clear increase in mean frequencies of B cells recognizing shared epitopes. And most importantly, in contrast to no change observed in wild type specific frequencies, the mean frequencies did increase for B cells recognizing Omicron specific epitopes. In a separate analysis, we observed similar trends with a monovalent Omicron BA1 booster. 
These data, paired with the superior neutralizing response, show that variant adapted vaccines can expand relevant humoral immunity. Now, together with B cell immunity, T cell responses, as you heard earlier today, are also important in the control and clearance of SARS CoV 2 infected cells and can provide immunity, particularly against severe COVID 19 outcomes. Though neutralizing titers may wane over time, improved stability in memory T cell populations has also been reported. Here we will show the first CD4 and CD8 T cell analyses from our clinical study for the bivalent Omicron BA45 variant adapted vaccine booster as a fourth dose in individuals that received three prior doses of the original BNT162B2 vaccine. In a subset of participants, PBMCs were collected before the booster dose and at seven days, one month, and three months following the booster dose and evaluated by intracellular cytokine staining and flow cytometry using spike peptide pools as illustrated at the bottom of the slide. I will show data describing the peak of the T-cell response, response, which occurs seven to 28 days after boost. Two distinct peptide pools were used to assess spike-specific T-cell responses, the first covering peptides in both wild-type and BA4-5 spikes, and a second pool containing only peptides unique to BA4-5, indicated to the right by the purple ticks spanning the stick diagram of the spike. On this slide, geometric mean frequencies of CD4 responses are shown on the left, and CD8 responses on the right for individuals 18 to 55 years of age. These analyses show clear increases in both CD4 and CD8 responses in individuals who received the bivalent BA4-5 booster. As indicated by the geometric mean fold rises following vaccination, shown below each figure, this increase was observed regardless of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection status. T-cell responses against BA4-5 unique peptides were lower compared to the total spike-specific T-cell response given much fewer targeted epitopes, but increased after booster administration as well. And these findings are consistent with prior reports. Now, having shown the immunological benefit of prior Omicron-adapted vaccines, I'd like to turn your attention to our preclinical evaluation of vaccine candidates representing contemporary SARS-CoV-2 strains. Specifically, XPV-adapted vaccine candidates were evaluated as both a booster and primary series in biopsy mice. We assessed the immunogenicity of the current bivalent BA4-5 vaccine compared to XBB 1.5 adapted vaccines as either monovalent or bivalent formulations in combination with Omicron BA4-5. The vaccines were administered as a fourth dose booster in mice that had received two doses of the original vaccine, followed by one dose of the current bivalent Omicron BA4-5 vaccine. Vaccine groups are shown along the x-axis and pseudovirus neutralizing responses assessed one month post boost are indicated by the bars. Focusing on the colored bars, indicating the current predominant or emerging XVV strains, a monovalent XVV 1.5 booster elicited the highest neutralizing titers against each of the XVV sublineages, including 116 and 2.3 and the greatest relative increased response compared to the current bivalent BA4-5 vaccine. In additional ongoing studies, we are also evaluating an XBB 1.16 adapted vaccine as a third or fourth dose booster in mice. Preliminary data in mice that previously received two doses of the original vaccine, followed by a third dose booster with either monovalent XBB 1.16 or monovalent XBB 1.5 show neutralizing responses are generally similar between the two vaccines. In the study shown here, XBB 1.5 adapted vaccines were evaluated as a two-dose primary series in naive mice. 
Similar to results of the booster study, we show here that a monovalent XBB 1.5 adapted vaccine generated the highest neutralizing titers against the matched or closely matched XBB 1.5, 116, and XBB 2.3 strains, shown by the green, blue, and purple bars, respectively, when administered as a primary series. As SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence predominates the adult population, these primary series data are most relevant for anticipated responses in the pediatric population without any prior SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, before concluding the presentation, we would like to share our plans for supply of the 2023-24 formula, both in timing and vaccine presentation. Based on anticipation that a fall campaign would begin in August, and subject to regulatory approval, monovalent XBV formulations would be available. If a completely different formulation is chosen, this would follow the timeline from strain selection to vaccine availability of approximately 100 days, moving the vaccine availab availability to October. The proposed timing of supply in August aims to better align with the timing of the influenza vaccination campaign where the majority of doses are distributed already by the end of September in the US. This approach could help to maximize vaccine uptake and protection against COVID-19 for the fall winter season. Finally, this fall, we will also be transitioning to a single dose unit as the primary presentation, which should also support improved access and ease of administration. In conclusion, the collective preclinical and clinical data shown today support a monovalent XBB containing vaccine for the 2023-24 formula based on three key findings. First, the XBB cluster of Omicron sublineages continues to dominate the variant landscape, improved humoral and cell-mediated immunity that aim to protect against the spectrum of COVID-19 outcomes. And finally, preclinical data supporting that an optimal immune response can be achieved with the antigenically similar monovalent XBB adapted vaccines based on XBB 1.5 or 1.16. And the current seroepidemiology, together with collective real world evidence, support a single dose for those five years of age and older, regardless of vaccination status. I and my Pfizer and BioNTech colleagues would like to thank all of the participants in our clinical studies and their families, the sites and investigators, our CROs and partners, and especially the FDA and the committee. Thank you for your time today. My colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you and thanks again to you also for keeping us uh, on schedule. I just want to point out to the committee that the manufacturers will be available for further questions when we get to our general discussion later on. So a few minutes now for specific questions. Dr. Gellin. Yeah, th thanks for both of these. Um, and I'll ask you, but I'll be interested in um, in, in Moderna as well. So is what you make for the U.S. what you will supply to the rest of the world? Or are you able to make different things for different markets? So we have ha been having ongoing discussions in um, informal exchange of the data that you've seen here with um, different um, regulatory agencies to help understand what to needs to be provided for the upcoming season. So I think that's an ongoing process. Um, and we would be prepared um, you know, to provide the, the vaccine for the selected formula. But I would go back to say, you've seen the overall variant epidemiology. It's very XBB driven within a set of XBBs that are antigenically similar. So I think we are narrowed down to a more limited um, you know, options of what we're considering for, for the selection of the vaccine. Thank you. And seeing no other hands raised. No, 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 no. I no, raised no, no. my hand. I raised my hand. 
Pamela. Hi, <laughs> thank you, Arnold. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I, now I see. Now you've raised your hand. No, no, no. I raised it twice before. I don't know what happened. But thank I you. don't know. That was the yeah, first time. Yeah, well, I we don't about. know. Um, <laughs> My apologies. So I have a question um, for Pfizer. So, uh, yeah. So you have. Uh, availability and you will move to October, but I, I just think we're moving into a different kind of framework of thinking about timing. So you spoke about single dose unit, fall campaign, the monovalent would be off what was called back. This seems to me very much going back to the flu model and that we get a one-time call and then we all like march in and we've been manufacturing at risk and you know maybe we're right maybe we're wrong but it seems like we should just have a different way of thinking about this because if if the periodicity of this is so much shorter than we think about flu which i think it is um then we should stop talking about the 2023, 2024 year, because maybe there is no such thing. Maybe it's a much shorter period of time that we're looking at for when this virus changes and we're this lineage, we have a new lineage and we have to manufacture. So I, I guess we're being, we're sort of being pushed into thinking about it like flu, but it's not comfortable for me. Well, so, maybe maybe um, it will be because of the rate. So maybe it will be going that? forward. Sorry. Maybe it will be going forward. Right now, we're limited to uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, but I don't want to think about it like that because it like blocks me in from all sides, and it seems to me. Like this change in this virus is much more frequent. I'm going to rule this. Pamela, I'm going. This is a very general discussion question. Okay. And I think we can bring this up and talk about it uh, this afternoon when we get back to uh, a more general discussion where a lot of people can have a say. Uh, can so, can uh, Pfizer respond to this in the meantime? Uh, well, uh, very briefly. <laughs> I will be very brief. And I think Kanta spoke to this very well this morning. And the surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 is truly a continuous process. You know, we don't, you know, we can't predict what will be the true next steps of the virus. Um, but we are seeing enough antigenic drift um, with the XBBs that it would warrant a, an update to the vaccine to optimize protection. But again, it's, it will continue to be an, an ongoing process and not, um, you know, one time a year. Thank but you. I think that will be discussed this afternoon. Thank you, Arnold. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Let's move on to uh, Novavax. Uh, Dr. Uh, Philip uh, Dubovsky will speak to us about their plans for the 2023-20. 24, uh, as it's now written, uh, vaccine uh, season. Thank you. My name is Philip Dubovsky, and I'm the president of research and development at Novavax. Today, I'll review our data on emerging variants and provide our suggestion for the vaccine composition for the 23-24 season. Here's an overview of what I plan to cover. I will review clinical data that we previously shared with this committee, showing that neutralizing immune responses generated by currently authorized vaccines drop off significantly for the XPV subvariants, thereby justifying a vaccine composition update. Then I'll share some non-clinical primary vaccination data for XPV15 and XPV116 that shows both vaccines induce cross-neutralizing immune responses and that monovalent vaccines generate antibody levels of greater magnitude compared to bivalent vaccines. When we boost previously primed animals with XVB15 or 116, the vaccines induce cross-neutralizing responses of comparable magnitude. And as discussed earlier today by the CDC and WHO, XVB2.3 is becoming more prevalent in some parts of the world. The sequence is very similar to 1.5, and the receptor inhibition responses induced by XVB15 vaccines are similar for 1.5, 116, and 2.3. 
And as far as cellular responses are concerned, vaccinating with XBB15 induces a polyfunctional TH1 bias CD4 response that's comparable for XBB15 and 116. Conservation of these responses is, ex is expected. It's been demonstrated for a variety of vaccine platforms. So taken together, we believe this data supports the selection of a monovalent XBB15 strain for the 23-24 Northern Hemisphere season, which is consistent with the recommendations from other global regulatory agencies and the World Health Organization. But before I show you our data, I'm going to review our adjuvanted protein-based platform is distinct from the other platforms discussed in this meeting. Uh, Novavax vaccine includes a full-length recombinant spike protein shown here in red that, that's presented in its native trimeric conformation. The antigens form particles around a polysorbate core shown here in blue, which improves antigen uptake and processing. We manufacture the antigen in insect cells, which have truncated glycans, and we hypothesize this improves epitope exposure to the immune system. And finally, the antigen is co-formulated with our saponin-based adjuvant, which is known to facilitate the induction of broad B cell and T cell responses. The combination of these factors resulted in high levels of efficacy in our initial phase three studies against prototype strain, as well as against variants that circulated during our initial phase three studies. So uh, let's look at some clinical data that indicate the immune responses have dropped off for the XPB subvariants. This slide includes prototype and XBB1 neutralizing responses for individuals who are vaccinated with our vaccine using a variety of different dosing regimens. These assays were conducted at the Dr. David Ho lab at the Columbia University and can be compared to responses from different vaccines from his previous publications. First, I'll display anti-prototype neutralizing responses derived from Novavax studies. I'm showing the neutralizing responses in individuals who received three doses of prototype mRNA vaccine and were boosted with our vaccine in dark blue compared to participants who received four or three doses of Novavax vaccine. Consistent with what has been previously described, the homologous regimens have numerically higher responses. However, because of the small number of participants, the precision of these estimates is relatively low. Added now in speckled pattern are results from previously published from Dr. Ho's lab. On the far left are three doses of mRNA boosted with bivalent mRNA vaccine, and this is displayed adjacent to three doses of mRNA boosted with Novavax. In the middle are four doses of mRNA compared to four doses of Novavax, and the right are three doses of mRNA compared to three doses of Novavax. All these regimens provide high levels of neutralizing responses. So now let's look at XBB1 neutralization responses. Here you can see that for XBB1, the responses are significantly lower, uh, but similar across the different dosing regimens. Irrespective of whether the primary series was mRNA or recombinant protein, and irrespective of whether the boost was protein, uh, recombinant protein, prototype, or bivalent mRNA vaccine, the responses were reduced compared to the prototype neutralizing responses displayed on the left. These findings are consistent with the structure function data previously shared with this committee that demonstrate important neutralizing sequences that existed in the prototype strain the BUBA5 variant are not present in XPB subvariants. From this data, we infer that all vaccine regimens tested uh, are performing comparably against the currently circulating XBB subvariants, and all vaccines will benefit from updating to contemporary strain to optimize the neutralizing immune responses. Okay, let's look at some immunization data in mice for XBB subvariants. I'll start with primary immunization data where mice received two doses of vaccine without a boost. Displayed here are neutralization responses against the number of variants after primary vaccination with prototype XBB15 and XBB116 vaccine. I've annotated the currently circulating XBB subvariants in yellow. The prototype strains are displayed on the left-hand side of the slide, and similar to what we saw in the clinical data, the responses are good against prototype, but very low against both XBB subvariants. The middle panel displays responses with, after vaccination of two doses of XBB15, and the neutralizing responses are similar for XBB15 and 116. And the same is true for mice vaccinated on the right-hand panel with two doses of XBB116 vaccine. The responses for 15 and 116 are comparable. As expected for primary vaccination, homologous responses are slightly higher for, uh, than heterologous responses for both subvariant vaccines, where the conference intervals are broadly overlapping. Okay, now let's look at some responses after monovalent and bivalent vaccination. This slide shows neutralizing responses after primary vaccination with two doses of monovalent XBB15 on the left-hand panel 
and two doses of bivalent vaccine containing prototype and XBB15 on the right-hand panel. As we saw in the previous experiment, vaccination with a full dose of XBB15 induces comparable neutralizing responses to XBB15 and 116. However, on the right-hand panel, vaccinating with a bivalent vaccine that contains half the XBB15 antigen load induces lower responses to both XBB subvariants. Numerically, the response is more than 50% lower. So from these data, we conclude that vaccinating with either XBB15 or 116 induces cross-neutralizing responses. This is not surprising because the variant spikes are structurally very similar. And uh, we also see indication that a monovalent vaccine may be advantageous compared to a bivalent vaccine. So now let's look at some boosting data with XBB subvariants. We have boosting data in primed mice as well as in primed rhesus macaques. Boosted responses are important because in general, the US population is well primed with multiple rounds of vaccination and serial infections. The responses seen in these animal models may be more relevant than the primary vaccination data we just reviewed. On this slide, we're showing primary vaccination and boosted neutralizing responses in mice. All animals were primed with a bivalent vaccine containing prototype and BA5. The results after the two dose bribing series are displayed on the left hand panel. The bivalent vaccine induced good responses to both prototype and BA5, but very low responses to the XBB subvariants. Uh, these lower responses to antigens included in currently available vaccines is similar to what we saw in our clinical data. The middle panel shows responses after these primed animals were boosted with XVB 1.5. XVB 1.5 is a very good immunogen in responses to both XVB 1.5 and 116 increased more than 35 fold from before boosting and are comparable in magnitude to each other. The levels achieved after boosting with a single dose of XBB15 are also comparable to the levels achieved for both prototype and BA5 after a full two dose uh, priming series on the left. The same is true in boosting with XBB116 on the right hand panel. We see no specific benefit for boosting with XBB116 in this experiment. So, a common way to visualize the differences in immune responses is through antigenic cartography, as was described earlier. Displayed here uh, is the anagenic cartography of neutralizing responses in mice. Uh, in this two-dimensional display, uh, each square represents a two-fold change in immune response. So one square is a two-fold difference, two squares is four-fold, and so on. On the left-hand side, you can see that after priming with two doses of bivalent vaccine containing prototype and BA5, the antigenic distance is very broad. This is comparing prototype in green to XBB15 in yellow, and separately comparing prototype in green to XBB116 in blue. Annotated below the graphic, you can see the antigenic distance from prototype to both XBB subvariants is greater than 30-fold following primary vaccination with bivalent vaccine. This antigenic distance isn't surprising because as we've previously discussed with this committee, the neutralizing sequences present on prototype and BA5 are largely not present in the XBB subvariants. The middle panel shows that after boosting with XVB15, the antigenic distance narrows, and XVB15 provides good neutralization to XVB16. This is a different analysis from the prior panel and compares the antigenic distance between XVB15 in yellow and 116 in blue. The antigenic distance is less than one, which is considered a matched response. On the right-hand panel, the same is true when boosting with XVB116. The vaccine induces good cross-neutralization responses to 15. And once again, the antigenic distance between 116 in blue and XBB15 in yellow is less than one. Okay, let me show you some additional boosting data in non-human primates. In this experiment, we primed uh, groups of five rhesus macaques with two doses of prototype on the left, two doses of BA5 in the middle, or two doses of a bivalent containing prototype plus BA5 on the right-hand panel. Eight months later, they were boosted with XBB1.5 and when you compare the XBB15 and 116 responses in each priming regimen, you can see they're comparable. So for the prototype primed animals displayed on the left-hand side, XBB15 and 116 responses are similar. In the middle panel, for B5 primed animals, XBB15 and 116 responses are similar. And the same is true for animals primed with bivalent vaccine on the right-hand side. Uh, the magnitude of the XVB subvariant responses was greatest when primed with monovalent BA5 and lowest when primed with prototype alone. This makes sense because we know that XBB is more closely related to BA5 uh, than it is to the prototype. So from this data, we conclude that when used as a booster, 
XVB15 induces comparable neutralizing responses to XVB15 and 116. Now let's look at some data from XVB2.3, uh, which as we've heard is emerging in some countries. Uh, this slide displays the sequence differences between XVB15, 116, and 2.3. On the left-hand side of the triangle, as we've heard earlier, uh, you can see that XVB15 and 116 differ by two amino acids, only one of which is in the receptor binding domain, and we indicated this with the asterisk. On the right-hand side of the triangle, XVB15 differs from 2.3 spike by three amino acid residues, once again, only a single change in receptor binding domain. Therefore, you would predict the immune responses induced uh, by 1.5 would be relevant for both 1.16 and 2.3. Additionally, you can see in the bottom of the triangle, there's greater sequence divergence between XVB 1.16 and 2.3, with a total of five amino acids differences in two changes in the receptor binding domain. This suggests that XVB 1.5 may be the best option to include in the vaccine because there's less divergence from the other two emerging XVB subvariants. Selecting XVB 1.5 hedges our bet uh, because it's unknown if subsequent variants will arise for 1.5, 1.16, or 2.3, or perhaps all three. Neutralizing data for XBB 2.3 was not available when these slides were submitted. However, we do have human ACE2 receptor inhibition data, uh, which is considered a functional immune assay, and I'll describe this in the next slide. So uh, ACE2 receptor inhibition uh, assays measure the ability of antibody uh, that has been generated by a vaccine to block the interaction between the variant spike protein and the human ACE2 receptor. This interaction is required for viral entry into human cells. So functionally, it measures the same biological pathway as a neutralizing assay. Displayed in this graph is data from last year's strain change study conducted in Australia that correlates our validated neutralizing assay to our validated receptor binding inhibition assay. And the two assays are very tightly correlated with the Pearson's correlation coefficient of 0.96. This degree of correlation suggests that uh, ACE2 receptor inhibition can be used as a functional surrogate for neutralization assays. Okay, let's look at uh, XBB 2.3 receptor binding inhibition data for mice and non-human primates. In this experiment, uh, we primed mice with bivalent vaccine, which included prototype plus BA5, and they were boosted with XBB 1.5, and the responses were evaluated in the receptor binding inhibition assay. You can see that functional responses were robust for all three subvariants and nearly identical for uh, 116 and 2.3. As we saw in the previous slide, XBB 116 and 2.3 differ from uh, 1.5 by single amino acid uh, in the receptor binding domain, so preservation of receptor inhibition was expected. A couple of days ago, we received uh, murine neutralization data, which corroborates this receptor binding inhibition data. And in fact, in that data set, XBB15 uh, boosted resulted in numerically higher 2.3 neutralization compared to animals that were boosted with XBB116. Now let's look at receptor binding inhibition in non-human primates. In this study, we primed uh, groups of five rhesus macaques with prototype BA5 or a bivalent containing prototype plus BA5, and they were boosted eight months later with XBB1.5. XBB116 and 2.3 responses were similar irrespective of which priming regime was used. On the left, when primed with prototype, uh, the 116 and 2.3 responses are similar. In the middle, when primed with BA5, 116 and 2.3 responses are similar. And the same is true when primed with bivalent vaccine on the right-hand panel. From this data, we conclude that XBB15 induces functional immune responses to XBB subvariants, including 2.3, and further supports the selection of XBB15 for the 23 fall season. So now let's briefly look at some cellular immune responses. We have intracytokine staining uh, data for both uh, animal models. Here we've displayed CD4 responses for mice that were either primed with two doses of prototype on the left or two doses of bivalent vaccine containing prototype plus BA5 on the right. And both groups were boosted at one month with XUB 1.5. This data displays CD4 cells that were stained with interferon gamma, TNF, and IL-2 for TH1 cytokines and IL-4 is a model TH2 cytokine. The cellular responses are generally maintained across all variants, and boosting with XVB15 results in a comparable signal for 15116. So let's look at some cellular data from non-human primates. Here we've displayed the TH1 and TH2 CD4 responses in rhesus macaques who were primed with two doses of bivalent vaccine containing prototype plus BA5 and boosted with XVB1.5. TH1 responses, so those for interferon gamma, IL-2, and TNF-alpha are shown on the left. In TH2 responses, uh, IL-5 and 13 are shown on the right. 
the TH1 biased cellular responses are maintained across variants, and we observed a very similar response for HBB15 and 116. Okay, let's go to the last slide, just summary. So uh, based on the data we've gathered on the emerging variants, Novavax supports a monovalent XBB15 strain for the 23-24 Northern Hemisphere season. This strain composition is consistent with the World Health Organization recommendations, as well as other global regulatory agencies. We know from previous clinical work that immune responses have dropped off for currently circulating XBB variants. This observation is confirmed from urine and non-human uh, primate data I share with you today. I've shown you data that vaccinating with XBB 1.5 induces comparable neutralizing responses to XBB 1.5 and 116, and that a monovalent XBB 1.5 appears to be better than a bivalent. The US population is well primed with serial infections and serial vaccination. So, data that monovalent XBB 1.5 boosts well and induces comparable neutralizing responses to other XBB subvariants is relevant. And XBB 1.5 is antigenically similar to XBB-116, and importantly, to XBB-2.3. And furthermore, XBB-15 induces antibodies that block uh, XBB-2.3 from binding to the human ACE2 receptor. And finally, XBB-15 induces polyfunctional TH1 bias CD4 cellular response to the other XBB subvariants. Our approach has been to manufacture the vaccine at risk, and we continue to manufacture XBB-15 at commercial scale. And uh, we're filling this in single-dose vials to support the US fall vaccination campaign. Uh, the selection of a strain other than XBB 1.5 will result in delay to our vaccine's availability. Uh, thank you. I cannot take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Dubofsky. Uh, again, keeping us right on time. Questions, Dr. Levy. Yes, hi, uh, Dr. Dubovsky. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, you presented some data on cellular immune responses to the Novavax vaccine. Has Novavax considered looking also at CD8 cells, and do you view those as potentially relevant to host defense against coronavirus? Thank you. Yeah, certainly, certainly there, there's data uh, out there that a CD8 response may be relevant. Normally, as a, a protein-based um, you know, they're adjuvant and protein-based, you wouldn't think a CD8 would be the strong suit of this platform. Uh, and we, we know from animal uh, studies, we do in fact induce CD8 cells. And there's been some recent work from our collaborators at Scripps, which also have described a CD8 response, but it's not as robust as you'd expect from other vaccine platforms. Thank you. Dr. Sawyer. The last thing you mentioned was that a selection of a strain other than 1.5 would delay your production. Can you give us a, what is your window between time of selection and and availability of vaccine? Sure. We, we've uh, previously talked um, about for a common protein vaccine like ours, it's much like the flu uh, timeframes. So we need pretty much six months from when a strain is named to when we can have commercially available product. Now we have other candidates that we've uh, advanced through the manufacturing process. Uh, the uh, the next one would be 116. It'll be available approximately eight weeks after 1.5. Thank you. Dr. Berger. Thanks. I, I was going to ask the same question and I'll ask it, make it a, a slightly different way than, you know, I'm just curious because of the WHO said they're going to be meeting every six months to make determinations about whether or not to update the strain vac the, the strain that should be included in a vaccine. I'm, I'm just curious if, if the FDA went to a similar um, uh, model for having meetings every six months and doing strain selection at that speed, how would Novavax be able to manufacture and deliver on that type of a timeline? Yeah, so so the the um, pattern that we followed and we're continuing to follow is as new variants emerge, we, we make them. We make them at a lab scale. We test them in animals to uh, look for cross-reactivity and antigenicity, and we move them into the early stages of commercial manufacture. So uh, that's how we're able to deliver this vaccine on time because we had, uh, we'd, we'd, through our work, uh, moved forward with it into commercial manufacture before this meeting even happened. And the same is going on uh, in real time. So we're making new variants as they, as they emerge and look interesting to us. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other hands raised. And uh, by somehow we're right on schedule. I want to thank the presenters and especially uh, the committee members for their restraint and holding back and asking a lot of questions at this point, we'll have our chance 
this afternoon. So we now have a break and we resume with the oral public hearings at one o'clock Eastern. Recording stopped.
progress. Go ahead, Dr. Monta. Welcome to the open public hearing session. Please note that both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationships that you may have with a sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct com competi uh, competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment of expenses connection with your participation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Dr. Monta. I would like to pass the meeting to Dr. Marx to make uh, open public hearing remarks. Dr. Dr. Marx. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Susan and Dr. Monto. Just wanted to start the open public hearing by saying that we very much appreciate uh, diverse viewpoints as, as part of the open public hearings. I just want to make sure that the public who's listening know that um, those who make uh, public remarks uh, during the open public hearing, um, those remarks are not necessarily endorsed and they uh, represent, um, they're not necessarily endorsed endorsed by the Food and Drug Administration, nor they, do they represent our views. They are the, the, they are the views of those who are making those remarks. Um, and we do ask that our speakers uh, 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 remain uh, courteous um, and, and do not uh, uh, have direct attacks at committee members or individuals when they make their remarks. So thanks very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Marx. Um, and Dr. Monto, before I begin calling the registered open public hearing um, speakers, I would like to thank all OPH participants on behalf of the FDA and the committee for their interest in participating in today's FERPAC meeting and sharing their views and comments. FDA encourages participation from all public stakeholders in its decision-making processes. Every advisory committee meeting includes an open public hearing session during which interested persons may present relevant information or views. Um, I would also like to add the following guidance that the participants during the OPH session are not FDA employees or members of this advisory committee. FDA recognizes that the speakers may present a range of viewpoints. The statements made during this open public hearing session reflect the viewpoints of the individual speakers or their organizations and are not meant to indicate agency agreement with the statements made. With that guidance, I would like to begin. Every speaker will have four minutes to make their remarks. Let's begin with our first OPH speaker, Ms. Melissa Miller. Ms. Miller. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Miller and I have no financial or other conflicts of interest. Next, please. What we know now, it's unwise to vaccinate during a pandemic as it encourages rapid viral, viral evolution and FDA is already working to pick the strains for yet another vaccine. COVID mutations are too rapid for technology to keep pace with changes and be effective. Therefore, vaccine is not prevented. Any vaccine that does not prevent transmission, infection and disease only hospitalization is a medical treatment and not a vaccine. Next, please. Other countries fully stopped COVID-19 vaccines and some countries never went after kids, unlike the US. Next, please. Disability has been increasing since May, 2021. A three to four Sigma event year on year. What is causing this? 
Next, please. As evidenced in the Mayo Clinic research on number of doses of vaccinations given, the more you vaccinate, the more infections one has. The yellow line is over three doses. What do you think happens next? Next slide, please. The US is the only country in the world targeting children as young as six months old with COVID-19 vaccines, which are still under EUA. My question is, who is profiting at the expense of the children's health? Next, please. Recent MMWR article showed half of children had systemic reactions after a third dose. This is just a small number of children who have received the third dose. Next, please. Based on the uh, slide that uh, CDC's Ruth Lynn Gillis presented, parents have wisened up. So 91.1% of children under two, 89.1% of children under four, and 60% of children under 11 remain unvaccinated. Next, please. When chronically underreported VAR system is showing the numbers below, you have to realize something is off and course correct. Next, please. Here are my recommendations. Stop trying to get ahead of COVID. It's here to stay, just like influenza and influenza-like illnesses. There are successful treatment and prevention. No, not remdesivir or run death is near, or Paxlovid, the last one, which was only tested on unvac unvaccinated people. Treatment of secondary pneumonia with antibiotics is what's needed, not vents. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Miller, for sharing your views. Um, next is Master Kermit Kubitz. Uh, do you have my slides? Yes, uh, I will address three topics in future COVID vaccine development. First, reasons for a monovalent XBB vaccine. Second, need for expedited FDA BLA vaccine approval process. And C, lower cost vaccine approaches. Next slide. Reasons for a monovalent vaccine. First, the XBB1 lineage is the dominant strain circulating now. Second, using a monovalent vaccine will maximize immunity response production. Preclinical data on XBB1 candidate vaccines shows higher neutralizing antibody response. Third, prior variants are not circulating as much. Fourth, as a contingency backstop for new variants, an expedited BLA process, as discussed below, should be developed by the FDA. See slide three, next slide. Given extensive vaccine experience now, BLA approval process should be expedited using these criteria. First, well understood vaccine manufacturing technology like mRNA from Pfizer and Moderna or Novavax and other global vaccines like Corbivax, inactivated virus vaccine widely used in India and Indonesia uh, are well understood now. With good manufacturing process methods and if necessary, rapid small cohort testing for safety 1,000 to 3,000 persons, an expedited vaccine approval process could be undertaken. Next slide. Low cost vaccine approaches should be adopted. Removal of government subsidies necessitates lower costs than Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines. Simpler vaccine approaches, such as an inactivated virus with an adjuvant booster like Corbivax, developed by Dr. Peter Hotez and widely used in India and Indonesia for lower cost vaccine distribution. And they also do not require low temperature storage. Such simpler vaccines are already in widespread use. And a simpler uh, inactivated virus vaccine with an adjuvant booster could be deployed faster and more cheaply in the event of or need for sudden new vaccine response in response to new variants. Finally, I think we should expedite the process of developing a pan-coronavirus vaccine. 
the work by Dr. Saunders and Haynes at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, instead of uh, targeting the, sp the entire spike protein, uh, could generate antibodies by targeting the receptor binding domain. And uh, the funding for such a pan coronavirus vaccine should be expedited. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I was vaccinated. I had a breakthrough infection, but I, due to the vaccine, it was mild. And I only had a headache and a temperature for three days. Thank you, Dr. Monto, Dr. Marks, Dr. Caslow, Dr. Link Gellis, Thornburg, and the staff of the FBA. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Cubitt. Appreciate your presentation. Um, next is Dr. Mary Elizabeth Christian. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee. I have no conflicts to disclose. I'm Mary Elizabeth Christian. I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm a breast surgeon who's no longer practicing due to a disabling genetic condition. But I am also a mama, a yaya, and an advocate. I was a daughter until August of 2021 when my parents were vaccinated, when my parents died. My parents were vaccinated in January of 2021. They believed they were safe, and so they went out to lunch for their 62nd anniversary on July 18th. Three days later, they had COVID, and three weeks later, they were both dead from COVID. They were buried together at the Louisiana National Cemetery with only this great size service. A week later, on August 18th, boosters were approved. I still must wonder if they had been able to be boosted before they were infected, will one or both of them be alive today? Next slide. My daughter was pregnant when the first vaccine became available. There were limited data for use in pregnancy, but after careful consideration, she was vaccinated. She said to me at the time, I want my son to know I did the right thing. We subsequently traveled hours to enroll her infant son in a vaccine trial, though he was disqualified due to his low birth weight and prematurity. He was vaccinated on the first day it was offered by his local health department in Omaha. Booster approval for children and particularly the under fives came only after many worried filled months. By then vaccine administration infrastructure had collapsed. We spent many hours online on the phone and searching parent created spreadsheets for location. Despite living in cities with dedicated children's hospitals and with connections to our local community through my practice and her internship, we could not locate a site within driving distance of Omaha or Baton Rouge for almost two months. I can only imagine the difficulty faced by families with additional barriers such as transportation or economic barriers. Our family includes many high-risk individuals. We have family members who are immune compromised, an adult daughter with level three autism and mitochondrial disease. We have our grandson, his one-month-old creamy sister, a previously healthy husband who now has post-COVID hypertension, and my octogenarian in-laws. We are not unique. Many families include cancer patients, elders, immune compromised, or those with comorbidities. Those families include my former breast cancer patients who though cured from breast cancer, now must face the risk of COVID infection. We all must now venture into a community which has largely abandoned masking and air quality measures. Even our excess of healthcare poses substantial risk as they too have abandoned both air quality and masking. In Omaha, the public schools start in two months. If vaccines are not approved quickly, teachers, staff, and students will return without booster protection or vaccine protection. Children of staff and students' younger siblings will be in the daycare where my grandchildren go. Teachers, staff, and children will go home to their families who may also be at risk. They need the opportunity to protect themselves and others. Next slide. I can wear a mask and I can carry my mini CR box, but I cannot move vaccines into the community. You are tasked with evaluating the excellent science discussed this morning, and I appreciate your work in that regard. We all live in communities with the medically vulnerable. Sequential approval means even the most high risk group must venture into communities which now have waning immunity and a lack of layered protections. Additionally, those who are all willing to be vaccinated may simply give up before finding a site for their family, or they may be unable to take off multiple days from work for vaccines to be administered on different schedules. Consider what it might do to update if everyone from Yaya to the baby could get vaccinated on the same day. Next slide. I urge you to approve updated vaccines for all age groups. Urgency and timing matter. 
It might have saved my parents and it may well save my daughters and my grandchildren. Thank you. Dear Mary, thank you so very much for sharing your personal story with us. I'm so sorry to hear about your difficulty, loss of parents and all the other uh, difficulties you've had to endure as a family. Um, thank you so much for taking time to be here with us today. Um, next is Dr. David Wiseman. Um, thank, th th thank you. Please see our written remarks. Uh, I have no conflicts. Next. FDA's brief echoes recent international statements acknowledging natural immunity, rapid waning and imprinting. Next. The death rate is low despite 17% VAX uptake. Do people agree with Dr. Offit that chasing variants is a losing game? Next. Mistrust blights other vaccines. Why? Next. Perhaps they don't work as represented. They are gene therapies. Safety signals are ignored. Next. Rather than a safe and effective standard, under EUA, they may be effective. Next. CDC shows waning to zero at three months, then negative VE, suggesting immunocompromise. Next. And consistently by age below FDA's 50% target, going negative. Next. Three months. After introduction, XBB alarmingly evaded bivalence in studies omitted from FDA's January brief. Next, along with Cleveland Clinic noting that they were not alone in finding a possible association with more vax doses and higher risk of COVID. They pre-printed this week that COVID risk is lower in out-of-date and up-to-date adults. Next, does FDA's brief suggest vaccination drives variants? Next. Excluding these gene therapies from guidance does not change biology or safety concerns. Next, where is FDA's gene therapy group? Why did makers think their vaccines were gene therapies? Next, we respectfully disagree with Dr. Marx. Next, the National Cancer Institute shows reverse transcription is possible. Next, NIH show message and spike enters and spike into the nucleus. Next, episomal transmission does not need integration. Next. Regulators accede to BioNTech. Next, waiving cancer genotox and mutagenicity studies or on Gossamer grounds. Next, FDA scientists say DNA can be oncogenic. Next, Kevin McKernan's coming report of possibly replication competent residual plasmid template DNA with antibiotic resistance and undisclosed SV40 promoter sequences suggests adulteration. Next, with mineral comparability testing, Pfizer switched processes for clinical and commercial use. Next, hardly meeting the same process criteria, justifying abbreviated testing for variant vaccines. Next, Pfizer's TRIS change effective translation and likely safety and efficacy. Same process? Next, the bivalent process change, change yielded novel heterotrimers with untested toxicology and likely misbranding. Next. There's cancer reports are alarming. Next, CDC finds cancer signals. Next, they said they couldn't find stroke signals outside of VSD. But next, look in CDC's recent FOIA disclosure. Next, our normalized ratios yielded alarming signals. Next, temporal associations between VAX coverage and all-cause mortality persist. Next, Dr. Portnoy's questions last year about these about spike production was dismissed as academic with no FDA insistence, insistence for these studies. Next, lipid nanoparticles widely distribute. Next, spikes persist for up to four months. Next, an mRNA for up to 28 days. If you can't say where and for how long these gene therapies induce spike production, don't ask people to vax. Next, is this even a good idea? Dr. Fauci writes, vaccines have never effectively controlled these sorts of viruses and are not expected to do so. Next, Dr. Marx questions incrementally modifying variant-specific vaccines. Next, Pfizer's boast of flying a plane under construction erodes public trust. Next, there is no pandemic anymore. Regulate these products as gene therapies. No free passes to poorly understood platforms. Consider the cumulative toxic toxicity of these products. Chase safety, not variants. Help the vax injured and restore public health. And thank you for listening. And thank you, Dr. Paydar and your team for an excellent job that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman, for sharing that PowerPoint with us. Appreciate it. Um, next is Mr. Don Ford. Mr. Ford. Uh, 
Uh, hello, hello, my name is Don Ford, and I have no conflict of interest. Uh, next slide. Next slide. The main points of this presentation are approving a monovalent based on XBB 1.5, approving Novavax regardless of previous RNA, approving a new primary series to overcome imprinting, and studying Novavax as a treatment for long COVID. Also, altering recruitment criteria for Novavax clinical trials for pediatric vaccines. Next slide. The WHO and the EU both recommend a monovalent based on XB 1.5. If we go higher, we run into the BA1, BA2, BA5 debacle with XBB being a BA2 subvariant recombinant, leaving the public without a targeted vaccine. Next slide. The bivalent has been shown to dilute the antigen, weakening the response while suffering from imprinting. The concern is that this will limit vaccine effectiveness and booster uptake. Next slide. Americans are being punished for following the guidance to get RNA first. No data supports that it is unsafe to switch from RNA to Novavax. Many countries already allow people to switch. Gatekeeping Novavax is damaging the perception of public health in America. Next slide. Israel has allowed Novavax access since mid-September of last year, and that includes a new primary series of desired. Next slide. New alarming data has come to light. COVID can cause brain cells to fuse. Next slide. Novavax reduces nasal viral replication, which protects our brains. Unfortunately, RNA only offers limited protection in this capacity. Next slide. In a balanced cohort, Novavax was shown to be twice as protective from hospitalization when compared to an equal body of patients who received RNA. Next slide. Internal FDA CDC data shows that RNA only offers protection from hospitalization for 110 to 170 days. This is not sufficient for a virus to confuse brain cells. RNA once a year is not satisfactory to protect the American people. Next slide. RNA only achieves its best reaction if there are gaps between shots. The gap needed is greater than the window of protection. This leaves Americans vulnerable to hospitalization. Next slide. Novavax can be taken successively to maintain protection with no gaps. This provides consistent protection. Response continues to increase beyond anything RNA has achieved. Next slide. In contrast to RNA, it's been demonstrated that Novavax protection from hospitalization has no clear endpoint, existing beyond testing windows. That means no gaps. Next slide. Novavax was a product of Operation Warp Speed, paid for by U.S. tax dollars, yet Americans have extremely limited access to the product they funded. Next slide. The U.S. is one of only a few countries using draconian restrictions for Novavax. Approval is required for greater access to Novavax, including a new primary series of at least four months since previous COVID vaccine. Next slide. It has been demonstrated that a new primary series is required to overcome imprinting. Not doing this could leave the vaccinated vulnerable to hospitalization, further damaging the public's perception of vaccine effectiveness and public health. The next slide. It has been demonstrated that people who get Novavax see relief from long COVID symptoms. We require studies from the NIH and Novavax for the anecdotal reports showing recovery post-vaccination. Next slide. There are many examples, but far too many to mention here. Next slide. Novavax is designed to target conserved epitopes that are common among all variants, including mutated persistent virus. That means it's likely assists the immune system in finding and targeting persistent virus, which is a primary driver of long COVID. Next slide. Changes are needed to the trial recruitment for Novavax to bring a pediatric vaccine to market, specifically requirements that cohorts be infection or vaccine naive. This is not the population we're vaccinating and will delay protecting children. Next slide. Funding needs to be allocated from Project Next Send to expedite production of Novavax's pediatric vaccine. Spending caps created during the debt ceiling will limit Congress's ability to create investments in treatments and vaccines for at least two years. We cannot wait that long to protect our children from fused brain cells. Next slide. Restriction on Novavax creates a vaccine equity issue. This prevents Americans from being protected from COVID. It is cruel to limit the tools at hand. Demand exists, but the current recommendations artificially limit access. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, the next vaccine should be a monovalent targeting XVB 1.5 or allow manufacturer discretion. To avoid imprinting, allow Americans to get a variation of a primary series of Novavax when we change variants. Allocate next-gen funding and reassess trial recruitment criteria to expedite Novavax bringing a pediatric vaccine to market. Remove the regulations that will limit Novavax access. Limiting Novavax access is a vaccine equity issue that we need to fix. Thank you for your time. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Master Ford, um, for your presentation. Next is Master Kevin McKernan. Thank you. I have no conflicts to disclose. Um, I have 25 years of experience in the genomic space. Uh, I've worked as a team leader of R&D at the Human Genome Project at Whitehead and MIT, and I have over 57,000 citations to publications uh, in my space uh, and multiple patents on, on PCR and sequencing. Um, next slide, please. No conflicts. Next slide. 
in February, I used mRNA vaccines as a spike in control for some RNA sequencing libraries, and to my shock, discovered that the expression vectors for the vaccines are still in the vials. Uh, I looked at this in over a dozen vials, uh, and it appears that this expression vector is above the EMA guidelines and the FDA guidelines. Uh, you can see this in this preprint that's described here. Next slide. As a, as a refresher, there's two different processes that have been discussed in this BMJ article. The clinical trials were run on process one, which uses in vitro transcription off of synthetic DNA, but they switched to process two for a scale-up, which used E. coli to amplify plasmids, and those plasmids are what still remain in the vials, and we're not within the clinical trial. Next slide. Uh, this is another depiction of this process. You can see getting plasmids out of these E. coli is, is a challenge and can sometimes uh, lead to residual plasmids inside the vaccines. Next slide. Uh, these are the expression vectors that we discovered on the left in the Pfizer vaccines. They also exist in the Moderna vaccines, but they're a little bit different. The Pfizer vaccines specifically have this SV40 promoter, which was not disclosed in the expression vector map that was given to the FDA, uh, or I'm sorry, the EMA, but the expression uh, vector has a 344 base pair promoter with a nuclear localization signal known as this SV40 promoter. Next slide. Uh, so we went to verify this by designing quantitative PCR assays that target the spike sequence and the vector sequence. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this work demonstrated that uh, with even a 1 to 100 dilutions, you could get CTs of 22 for the DNA that's in these vials for the vector, which is not part of uh, what should be in these vials. Uh, we did this in triplicate across eight vials. It's very consistent, and they are over the EMA and the FDA's uh, limits. Next slide. The EMA has a ratio metric limit that looks at RNA to DNA ratios, and you can measure, you should expect an 11.5 CT offset between the spike and between the vector. What we see is only five to seven CT difference, which means there's an 18 to 70 fold over the limit of the 330 nanogram per milligram uh, recommended by the EMA. Next slide. Uh, you can readily uh, assay this in any other lab around the world now. If you put these vaccines directly into quantitative PCR, you can get CTs as low as 17. Uh, this is very important to know because COVID was diagnosed with CTs less than 40, which is a, over a million-fold higher uh, contamination being injected than what you might get from a nasal swab. Next slide. Uh, we know these vials, uh, were, these vials were sent to us anonymously in the mail, so we do not have the cold chain. However, we can measure the RNA integrity by putting them on electrophoresis systems, and we do not see a substantial difference in the RNA integrity from the vials that we received versus what's been published about these in the past. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, various people on Twitter have now begun to, re to reproduce this. Uh, in addition, I'd point to the EMA's documentation uh, where they have an 815-fold variance across 10 lots uh, of double-stranded DNA contamination uh, documented in the EMA process. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are some risks to this. There is double-stranded DNA can create interferon responses, and Keith Pettin at the FDA has done great work demonstrating the, the risks of DNA integration into the genome if these things are in, in, in vaccines. Next slide. The call to action here is all of these primer sequences are now public and people are downloading them and trying to reproduce this work. You can reproduce this work in 60 minutes with a microliter of the vaccine, which is one three hundredth of a dose for less than $10. I encourage everyone to try and do this to understand what we have at foot. I will note we did not measure any of the bad lots that are in the Schmeling et al. paper that demonstrated high adverse events in certain lots. We were measuring what seemed to be normal lots. Next slide. Thank you for your time and consideration. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. McKernan, for your presentation. Next is Mr. Joaquin Beltran. Joaquin? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, full transparency, I was a Biden-Harris 2020 regional director, currently a small retail investor of Novavax to support its vaccine's ongoing availability, vaccinated with two Pfizer's, one Novavax, and never had COVID. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Joaquin Beltran, and today I am urging the FDA to, one, approve Novavax's updated XBB booster, two, update booster guidelines for equal access regardless of booster history, and three, expand Novavax access to children under 12. Next. As the public health emergency ends, it's clear we are now in a shadow pandemic with long COVID as its own pandemic, reinfections creating cumulative risk, hospital-acquired infections at an all-time high in some states, testing and data virtually gone, a need for improved air quality in buildings, healthcare services collapsing, mass transmission outpacing our pharmaceuticals, 
and economic hardship from all these ongoing challenges. Next. Although we are currently in a lull, we are at the second highest baseline during the last four springs, and the pattern suggests we will have a surge as soon as this summer. As we have, as we have reached an upwards estimate of 1.4 million excess deaths in less than 3.5 years, it is clear we have to act. Next. We have to use every tool available to reduce transmission. Next. And that means we have to utilize the life-saving tool that is the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. Next. Recent data shows there is a drop of effectiveness against recent variants, making it clear we need to update vaccines. Next. Early data shows the XBB booster shows increased effectiveness against recent circulating variants. Next. Safety data remains high with a recent study showing decreased reactogenicity upon a fourth dose of Novavax. Next. Recombinant vaccines have a history of high safety profiles like flu cell vaccines, flu vaccine, which uses the same vaccine dose for everyone six months and up. Next. We also need to urgently update the booster guidelines for equal access to boosters, regardless of prior booster history. In particular, language in the current guidelines has prevented many from obtaining this life-saving vaccine. This language is the following, quote, but have not previously received a COVID-19 booster, and if they cannot or will not receive mRNA vaccines, end quote. Pharmacies across the country have cited this language as preventing them from giving Novavax to those with prior mRNA boosters. Here are some examples. You can go to social media and look up Novavax and you'll find countless stories of people being denied Novavax. With people in some cases having to lie uh, next, uh, having to lie or go to another state or country to get this life-saving vaccine. Next. Uh, next. Uh, one person shared about the challenge of obtaining this life-saving vaccine that was paid for by taxpayer dollars. Quote, it's brutal trying to protect yourself in a DIY pandemic. Next. There's no scientific reason for denying boosters um, of, of Novavax. Next. Next. Lastly, we need to expand Novavax to children under 12 as COVID poses a threat to children's lives and the risk of long COVID. Next. And we need to reduce spread. A recent study shows that 70% of transmission in households were from a pediatric index case. Next. Two studies, one in JAMA, one by the CDC, shows elevated risk of type 1 diabetes for children who had COVID, showing that children remain vulnerable and need further protection. I'm urging, next, I'm urging the FDA to approve Novavax's updated XBB booster, update booster guidelines, and expand Novavax access to children under 12. Next, we are still in a pandemic, and we need to act with urgency to protect our families and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Walken. Um, appreciate your presentation very much. Um, next is Master Tyler Phillips. Hi, my name is Sarah Phillips and I have no conflicts. I'm the spokesperson for Senior Speak Out, a resource and sounding board for older adults, caregivers, Tyler, and advocates. Let me just interrupt you for a second. Um, I need Devante to please correct the slide on the left. Thank you. I want to thank the committee for your time and expertise today and throughout the COVID pandemic. So much has been accomplished, but as we all recognize, there is still urgent work that needs to be done. As I now go about my daily life, like so many of my cohorts who are in their seniority, I have a new appreciation for normal. It is a normal we must assuredly want to preserve. I think it's human nature to want to push those difficult pandemic days out of our thoughts as we enjoy the present. And that's a good thing, but only up to a point. It's important, essential even, to remember that although COVID and its impact is for most people something that we want to be relegated to the past, something to be forgotten, if you will, the fact is that COVID is definitely not gone and we must keep that in mind. We have learned over and over again that COVID-19 is a virus which changes constantly and can find new ways to threaten our health. We must maintain our readiness against it. Every fall, as days become shorter and cooler, we move inside. Kids return to school, vacation time is over, and like clockwork, 
respiratory illnesses start to take their toll on our lives. The past pandemic has reminded us how vulnerable older populations are to the ravages of respiratory diseases like flu, pneumonia, RSV, and of course, COVID. As we who are in that age cohort know, prevention, beginning with vaccination, is our best defense. CDC's statistics demonstrate how serious older adults have been in taking advantage of vaccine protection. As of April 2023, those statistics show that 95% of adults 65 and older have received at least one COVID shot and 94% had completed the primary series. But that number declined to 43% for the updated bivalent booster. The RIPAC meeting today is an important step forward in helping older adults understand the importance of getting a shot that offers protection for the current form of the COVID-19 virus. Like our friends and family members of all ages, we know we need to get flu shots every fall because the strains of flu change every year. FDA's work in highlighting the yearly changes in the COVID-19 virus and the necessity of keeping our protection up to date falls into line with the preventive health measures older Americans are used to and regularly rely on. It helps to eliminate confusion and uncertainty and is a potent reminder that we can and need to take action to keep normal life normal. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for your presentation. We appreciate your participation in today's meeting. Next is Ms. Amy Hart. Good afternoon. I do not have any conflicts to disclose. I'm here to ask the committee to relax your language around who can get a second bivalent COVID booster. When I tried to schedule a second bivalent booster, my doctor's office initially told me no. They said they're turning lots of people away because the FDA won't allow it. Restricting a second booster only to those 65 and older or immune compromised left me terrified and wondering why when the shots are plentiful and broadly safe. I have a PhD in ecology and I wish to remind the committee that population level statistics don't predict a specific individual's risk. I'm 55 and have multiple medical conditions. None are considered immune compromised. However, I have a tenuous grasp on staying functional enough to work. I fear long COVID because adding one more health problem could leave me permanently disabled. Not only would that devastate me financially, it would force me to file for social security disability. I would far prefer staying productive and supporting myself. In August of 2019, a concussion left me temporarily unable to work. I live alone and my only contact with people became the physical and occupational therapy appointments at my local hospital. That September, a hospital patient sitting next to me sneezed. Three days later, I became severely ill and my epiglottis swelled, completely blocking my esophagus. If it had kept going, it would have shut down my airway and I wouldn't be here talking to you. I ended up in the ICU on dexamethasone. They didn't know whether the underlying infection was bacterial or viral. They simply did their best to stop the swelling and we all kept our fingers crossed. I emerged from the hospital so weak I could barely walk or stay awake. Then an odd rash covered my trunk. A bit later, one of my toes turned purple, and I was perplexed. It didn't hurt, and I hadn't injured it. I also lost a lot of weight and hair, and a good year passed before I was fully recovered. I can speculate as to what happened to me, but the reality is that we will never truly know. What I do know is that immunity to COVID wanes significantly three to six months following an infection or immunization. The shots are safe, they're abundant, and I believe it's unethical to stop me from getting a second COVID booster when one sneeze almost killed me four years ago. Many others want a second bivalent booster. I've spoken with people who had a rough time with a documented COVID infection or who have a condition that puts them more at risk and who want as much protection as possible. There are also people who live with an immune compromised loved one who want to do everything possible to protect them. The public health emergency is over. However, COVID has not gone away and masking alone isn't enough. 
I'm doing everything I can to avoid infection. And yes, I know the shots aren't perfect, but an imperfect shot is surely better than no shot. For a lot of people, one shot a year might be enough. For many of us, however, your restriction is compromising our access to needed medical care. Just because fewer people in younger age groups are dying doesn't mean that none of them are dying. Those losses are just as significant to their family and friends. Please change your language to allow anyone to get a second booster based on their unique circumstances. I further ask that you do the same whenever you find it necessary for anyone to get a booster. Restrictive language had a place when vaccine supply was restrictive, but we are no longer in crisis. And again, population level statistics don't predict a specific individual's risk. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for sharing your personal story and for, for for participating in today's meeting. We appreciate it very much. Um, next is Dr. Catherine Mathias. Yes, thank you. I have no financial interest to disclose. My name is Dr. Catherine Mathias. I am a mother of two beautiful young daughters, a pediatrician, and a co-founder of Protect Their Future, a grassroots nonprofit organization dedicated to advocating for equitable healthcare and COVID-19 vaccine access for children. First of all, I would like to express my support of an updated COVID-19 vaccine from all three manufacturers. The more options given to the general pub public, the better uptake will be. That said, it is imperative that parents are given the choice to once again protect their children. I am asking this committee to approve booster doses for children of all ages at the same time as adults. I am hoping that access to this booster will be available before school starts, which in some states is early August. Exactly one year ago today, this committee was reviewing data regarding the COVID-19 vaccine trials for children under five and voting on EUA approval of the vaccines in this age group. That day was momentous for parents. Many of us had been pregnant at the start of lockdown, raised newborns in isolation, cared for rambunctious toddlers with little help from friends and family, all while trying to juggle our own mental health and careers as the pandemic wore on. The delays in the vaccine trials and approval process had been soul crushing, but after nearly two and a half years of constant worry and pandemic fatigue, on this day last year, we were finally able to provide our children immunologic protection against COVID-19. We have come a long way since then. As of May, 2023, 2.2 million children under five have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. However, this number is dismal compared to other age groups and with waning immunity, COVID-19 is still a threat. The CDC website shows that as of June 7th, there have been a total of 765 deaths due to COVID-19 just in the zero to four age group. This means that since this time last year, COVID-19 has taken the lives of close to 300 babies and toddlers. These babies account for the majority of new pediatric COVID deaths reported to the CDC since last June. As you all know, that number is also much higher than annual flu deaths for all children under 18. It is clear young children, especially those under one year of age, are at significant risk of harm. Furthermore, you must consider complications that can arise from a COVID-19 infection itself, such as type 1 diabetes, long COVID, and MISC, of which there have been nearly 9,500 cases since 2020, all of which can have devastating and lifelong consequences for children. A publication released by the AAP just last week demonstrated the outstanding safety profile of these vaccines. The study reviewed safety data collected from nearly 250,000 COVID-19 vaccine recipients under the age of five and found zero cases of myocarditis or pericarditis. Last week, the CDC also released a safety monitoring update for children zero to four receiving a third dose of the vaccine using the VAERS and VSAFE data sets and once again found no new safety concerns. The last issue I want to address is the immense barriers parents have been facing in order to access COVID-19 vaccines for their children. Many offices are not stocking the vaccines and children under three cannot receive their vaccination at the pharmacy. Some parents are driving hours round trip to find a provider able to vaccinate their young children. It is no wonder why vaccine uptake is so appalling in this age group, despite the fact that every day babies are aging into eligibility and as we saw earlier, are at higher risk than any other other pediatric age group. 
The access issue needs to be addressed immediately with state health departments and pediatricians. Single dose files would be a massive step in the right direction. This would help prevent administration errors, which now count for the vast majority of events reported to the VARA system for kids. Children are our future, and we need to make their health and safety our top priority. Thank you very much for allowing me the privilege of speaking at today's meeting. Thank you, Dr. Mathias. Thank you, Dr. Mathias, for uh, your participation and your sharing your views with us today. Um, next is Ms. Karen Jones. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Jones, and I'm president and CEO of the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging. NCBA receives funding for non-branded health education and advocacy, and I have no personal conflicts or disclosures. NCBA also serves as a convening member of the COVID-19 Vaccine Education and Equity Project, a national coalition for more than 250 patient, provider, and public health organizations that have come together to advance public education and equity around COVID-19 vaccines. I want to thank this committee for your continued assessment of the evolving COVID-19 strains and analysis on how to ensure we have the most effective tools to protect against them. The challenge before you is not a small one. While we know the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines initially was quite high, the adherence to recommendations for subsequent doses has been declining due to several factors, including misinformation, COVID-19 fatigue, and the continued lack of information and resources reaching underserved communities. Compound these with the fact that public health emergency has now ended. And there is a serious risk that many Americans may not fully understand the threat COVID-19 still poses for our communities. We hear from the communities we serve that there is still a lot of confusion around who should be receiving another COVID-19 shot and when they should receive it, especially for those older and immune compromised Americans who are most at risk of serious illness for this virus, providing clear and simple recommendations for remaining up to date with their COVID vaccine is really critical. Last fall and winter, we were faced with quadruple threat of our respiratory systems as COVID-19, RSV, influenza, and pneumonia converged, and we saw increases in hospitalizations and deaths as a result. Now, we have an opportunity to get ahead of the upcoming respiratory virus season by informing the public now of the best ways to protect themselves before the season starts. We are extremely encouraged to see the FDA approve two new vaccines for RSV, and today, are hopeful to hear this committee discuss the right approach for ensuring science is keeping up with the pace with the current strains of COVID. The community I represent is unfortunately still one of the hardest hit by this pandemic, which once again underscores the reoccurring and long lasting impact of healthcare inequity, older and underserved communities. During the 1918 flu pandemic, Black Americans were more likely to die compared to white Americans. And most recently, during the 2009 uh, HINI influenza pandemic, this population was more likely to be hospitalized and die than others. In our effort to reverse this trend, we focus on making sure that the information and the resources Americans need to make an informed decision about their health in reaching all populations. We leverage opportunities to ensure equitable access to these innovative tools, and we rely on the science and taking time to understand what may be holding people back from remaining diligent in protecting themselves against this virus. This committee can support our efforts by providing us with clear understanding of how the COVID-19 vaccines will evolve and why we should ensure we keep up to date with them. 
We look forward to continuing to follow this committee's recommendations, and we ensure that the latest information about the protective tools is made available broadly to every community so that individuals can be confident in their decision to stay up to date on their vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones, for your participation today. We appreciate your presence. Um, next is Mr. Burton Eller. Good afternoon. I have no financial conflict to report. The Grange is the only national organization who has, over its 156 years of existence, has focused upon all, life, uh, all aspects of rural life in rural America. In recent decades, advocating for access to quality health care has become a vital part of the work we do in small towns and rural communities throughout the country. We are most grateful for the opportunity to, to speak here today and to once again thank this committee and the FDA as a whole for their service in protecting the health of our country. As we have noted before, rural citizens face enormous health disparities by virtue of where they live. Among the more significant are Lack of access to care in rural America is estimated to account for 55% of preventable hospitalizations or deaths from all causes. On average, rural life is two years shorter than that of urban residents. Rural hospitals disappeared at an alarming rate. At least 200 have closed in less than 10 years, and that one third of those remaining have grim prospects for survival. Men, women, and children living in rural America have higher rates of illness for many conditions from pneumonia and flu to certain types of cancer and obesity. Getting health care in rural America requires, requires traveling greater distances, taking more time away from work, and waiting longer for appointments because of provider shortages. The National Grange, its state granges, and its 1,400 local grange chapters around the country work together to solve some systemic problems that negatively impact rural life, such as those I have just mentioned. To that end, we have, throughout the COVID-19 emergency, worked to inform our members and neighbors about the importance of vaccination in protecting their health and how, when, and where to access vaccination and treatments. However, we know rural Americans experienced a disproportionate impact from COVID-19 many of which were related to the disparities we have mentioned in these remarks. We also know there is confusion among many in our communities about how prevalent COVID is and whether they should still be taking steps to protect against it. For these reasons, we are encouraged by the discussion around the potentially offering the COVID-19 vaccine on an annual basis, similar to the flu shot, and we urge this committee to provide as simple and straightforward guidance as possible on who should consider receiving this updated vaccine. Rural citizens don't have a standalone pharmacy or a grocery store with a pharmacy just down the street. We don't have urgent care just a few minutes away, and we probably can't get an appointment in the next few days. Making it possible for rural citizens to make the most of their annual provider visit and plan ahead will absolutely help boost vaccine rates, protect health, and save lives and money. The National Grange stands ready to help advance health options for rural America and thanks FDA for its excellent work in seeking ways to prevent COVID-19 from ever again taking such a toll. Building in ways to help each of us understand what we need, when we need it, and making it possible for us to do it in ways that maximize the options available where we live and work. These are keys to success. Thank you. Thank you, Master Eller. We really appreciate your participation today. Um, next is Ms. Robin Strongen. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Robin Strongen and I direct health policy for the National Consumers League. I don't have any conflicts. Since our founding by renowned social reformer Florence Kelly in 1899, NCL has had a long history of supporting consumer access to preventive medicine and life-saving medical interventions. Looking back over the last three plus years of a global pandemic, we have been encouraged by the way scientific advancements have been evolving right along with the virus. 
the development, evaluations, and approval of the first generation of COVID vaccines enabled us as a society to resume our lives in so many ways. And as we have experienced how new strains of the virus impact our communities in different ways, we are grateful to have preventive and treatment options available to combat these. While thankfully most Americans received the initial COVID vaccines to protect themselves from serious illness and death, we know that number drops off considerably for subsequent booster doses. We cannot allow society to become complacent. The public health emergency may have ended, but COVID is still circulating within our communities, whether we want to admit it or not. That is why the work of this committee is so important as we look to you to evaluate the current threat of COVID and the impact it could have heading into the 2023 respiratory virus season. Consumers may be tired of hearing about COVID, but that does not dilute the impact this committee can have by offering clear and common sense guidance for protecting ourselves against the next strain of COVID. Since it seems likely COVID-19 is here to stay, we appreciate the committee's discussion around whether the vaccines will be treated in the future similarly to the flu vaccines and offered on an annual basis. Encouraging Americans to receive their annual vaccines before the fall and winter months has proven an effective and efficient process for not only protecting individual health, but also in reducing the spread of these potentially deadly viruses within communities. Following a more annual schedule can also help to address consumers' confusion on when they should consider receiving their next COVID vaccine. For our part, the National Consumers League will continue to focus on educating on the latest information and resources available for these vaccines and supporting steps to ensure broad and equitable access to them. As you know, we cannot effectively address COVID-19 unless all communities understand the value of prevention and are willing to take action to protect themselves. We thank this committee for your ongoing efforts to ensure Americans have the most effective and safe options to protect themselves against respiratory illness, and we will continue to work alongside you to inform and guide consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Strongen. Appreciate your participation. Next is, uh, last but not least, is Ms. L. Pierce. Go ahead. Hello and good afternoon. My name is L. Pierce, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak before the committee today. I have no conflicts to disclose. As a mother of two incredible toddlers, a wife, and a pediatric registered nurse, I'm here today to advocate for unrestricted, widespread access to Novavax, expedited clinical pediatric trials, and authorization of Novavax for our pediatric population under 12. Additionally, I request timely distribution of all updated vaccines once they become available. Throughout this pandemic, we have repeatedly been told we have the tools to combat COVID-19. However, access to one of our most effective tools, the Novavax vaccine is needlessly restricted. As we continue efforts to end the pandemic, it's essential to revise Novavax eligibility criteria to ensure access to as many individuals as possible including those who wish to restart a Novavax primary series. For many individuals, Novavax is a preferred choice over the alternatives. Multiple clinical trials have shown it to be safe and well-tolerated, including for participants who have previously received mRNA vaccines. Due to this evidence, numerous other countries have approved Novavax booster shots irrespective of prior mRNA vaccination status. For individuals unable to tolerate mRNA vaccines, such as those with PEG allergies, Novavax is the only option. Because Novavax uses a conventional protein-based platform that is familiar to most people, it's also a viable alternative for those who are hesitant to receive mRNA vaccines. Novavax has the ability to alleviate strain on healthcare systems, save lives, reduce long-term COVID complications, and help society regain a semblance of normalcy. It offers outstanding efficacy, safety, and adaptability, making it an indispensable tool in our fight against COVID-19. If our goal is to increase vaccination rates, we must eliminate bureaucratic roadblocks and simplify the process for those wishing to safeguard themselves. As we continue our battle against COVID, the United States must prioritize the health and well-being of our vulnerable children. Despite prevailing misinformation that suggests children are spared from the virus, it's crucial to acknowledge that they are not immune to its impact. Considering this, I urge the medical and scientific communities to expedite clinical trials of Novavax for expanded pediatric use. With the vaccine's established record of safety and efficacy in adults, we have a solid foundation for evaluating its effectiveness in children. 
To accelerate the process, we should leverage knowledge and experience from previous trials, streamline protocols, and foster collaboration among researchers. By expediting Novavax pediatric trials, we can provide an additional layer of protection for our children. Due to the fact that COVID is not a seasonal virus, nor is it over or gone, I'm asking the committee to make the updated formulations of all COVID vaccines widely available and easily accessible as soon as they're available. Our children deserve protection before the school year begins this August. Any time after that is too late. In summary, I'm respectfully requesting this committee immediately ease restrictions around eligibility for current and future Novavax formulations for the wider population. It's imperative we allow people to restart a new primary series with Novavax irrespective of vaccine histories and permit boosters without waiting for regulatory approval for individual shots. Finally, by extending Novavax access to our youngest children, we can protect them from the devastating effects of COVID-19 and contribute to the collective effort of overcoming this global crisis. Novavax merits your full attention and support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Um, thank you everyone once again for participating in today's advisory committee and for sharing your views and comments. This concludes the open public hearing session for today. And now I hand over the meeting back to our chair, Dr. Monta. Dr. Monta. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. <clears throat> Next, we're going to hear the FDA presentation, uh, considerations and recommendations for changes to COVID-19 vaccine strain composition. Jerry, Dr. Jerry Ware, Director, Division of Viral Products, FDA. Dr. Ware. Oh, thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, the committee's heard a lot of data today. Um, I'm not going to add more data uh, for you to digest, but rather summarize at a fairly high level what you've heard, as well as briefly review the process that we've used at the FDA over the last few months to evaluate this data in support of strain selection. Uh, next slide. Starting with some background, uh, the committees, most of you on the committee are the, are, have been here for the over the several years, actually, and you're aware that we have met three times to date to discuss strain composition of COVID-19 vaccines in the U.S. We met first over a year ago on April 6, 2022, to have our initial discussion about the framework for updating COVID-19 vaccine composition process. At that initial meeting, there was general agreement that COVID-19 vaccine strain composition decisions should be data-driven and that there should be evidence to indicate that a proposed modified vaccine composition would likely provide improved effectiveness compared to current vaccine compositions. We met again a few months later in June 20, on June 28, 2022, and at that time we discussed whether an updated COVID-19 vaccine strain composition was needed, and the committee voted to include a SARS-CoV-2 Omicron component for COVID-19 booster vaccines. At that meeting, there was a general preference for a bivalent vaccine containing the ancestral and the Omicron strains. More recently in January, uh, in January 26, the committee met again and had additional discussions about the approach to the periodic updates of COVID-19 vaccine strain composition. To summarize briefly that meeting, there was, uh, as far as the strain composition discussion, there was general agreement that there should be a periodic assessment by the FDA and the VRPAC to reassess the current vaccines and decide if improvement is needed. Also that updating the strain composition of COVID-19 vaccines would likely be a continuous process. And further that a late spring, early summer target for a VRPAC, FDA VRPAC review and recommendation seemed reasonable and practical for delivery of an updated vaccine for a fall vaccination campaign. So at this time, I want to step back to that June 28th meeting to review what we did at the time, uh, because I think it's both, one, this is only the second time we've gone through the string composition update decisions, but I think that what we did at that meeting a year ago was instructive for what we did then versus makes a nice comparison to the choices that we're faced with now. So you can go to the next slide. I have two or three slides about that meeting. Okay, as I said a minute ago, we met on June 26th 
2022 to consider whether a change to the current COVID-19 vaccine strain composition was needed. The committee voted to recommend the inclusion of an Omicron component for booster vaccines in the United States. But also at that meeting, we discussed the evidence supporting a monovalent Omicron or a bivalent vaccine, which would be the prototype for the original strain plus Omicron. And the committee discussed the selection of specific Omicron sublineages to be included in the vaccine. Specifically, they discussed the possibility of including a BA1 component or a BA4, BA5 component. And a few days later, on June 30th, the FDA notified vaccine manufacturers of FDA's recommendation to develop a bivalent vaccine that included the original strain plus an Omicron BA4-5 as a booster dose to improve protection. The first bivalent vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech were authorized for use in individuals 18 years of age and older and 12 years of age and older, respectively, on August 31st. So the next slide shows the situation we were faced with last June. Uh, on the left is a little hard for you to read, but it's a dendrogram that I showed uh, at that time at the meeting. And what that showed, similar to what is you see on the right with the variant proportions, was that the virus was evolving as Omicron since the emergence of Omicron uh, into both BA1 and BA2 viruses. And our discussion at the time concerned the selection of Omicron sublineage variants BA1 versus BA4-5. The reason that that was the choice that we were confronted with was because at the time of this meeting, manufacturers had produced and evaluated BA1 vaccines in clinical trials, and they were prepared to supply a BA1-containing vaccine for 2022 and 2023. It's also true that uh, at the time, we did not have perfect global alignment. The WHO had recommended a BA1 vaccine, as had our European colleagues. But the fact is that at the time we were having this meeting in June, BA1 was no longer in circulation at that time. It had been supplanted by other BA2-derived viruses. And this is shown in more detail on the next slide. Uh, this is a sort of a linear representation of the spike protein with listed amino acids. Um, the reason that the change from BA1 to BA to BA45 was such a was the decision that we had to make. As I said, we, we had data for BA1. Manufacturers were prepared to make this, but BA1 not only didn't exist, but BA1 was a lot different than BA2 and the derivatives that were coming from BA2. Specifically, if you I have them listed on the right of this slide, there were major differences between BA1 and BA2 spike proteins. Uh, nine amino acids it changes three deletions and one addition in BA1 that were not present in BA2. Seven amino acid changes and one deletion in BA2 were not in BA1. So these two Omicron-derived viruses were quite different from each other. On the other hand, there were fairly minor differences between BA2 and the BA2 derivatives, BA2.12.1 and BA4.5. Uh, those are shown in near the bottom of the slide on the left. You see that BA2.12.1 only had two changes relative to BA2, and BA4.5 only had three or four. It actually had one deletion that was present in BA1. So that was the situation we were faced with. BA1 was extinct, or essentially extinct, it didn't exist, and BA2 derivatives such as BA4, BA5 were predominant, uh, were the predominant circulating strains. So if you move to the next slide, we'll talk about now where we are today. Both a year, both a year ago and now, uh, we listed considerations for modifying COVID-19 strain compositions for, uh, for COVID-19 strain composition decisions. Uh, the key questions that were posed then that we felt needed to be addressed by the agency and the VRPAC in considering whether to modify the COVID-19 vaccine composition are one, are there SARS-CoV-2 virus variants circulating that are antigenically distinct from the strain included in the current vaccines? Have currently circulating SARS-CoV-2 virus variants become, or are they expected to become, dominant and displace earlier virus variants? 
Three, is there evidence that current vaccines are less effective against new circulating virus variants than against previous strains of virus? And four, is there evidence that a candidate vaccine with an updated strain composition will be more effective against these new circulating virus variants and provide an improved clinical benefit? Um, I have one slide that mentions a summary of the effectiveness. That's on the next slide. Okay, so you, you've heard a lot of data already about this from our CDC colleagues, as well as you heard data from each of the manufacturers as far as the current effectiveness of authorized COVID-19 vaccines and the need for a periodic strain update. Uh, first of all, observational effectiveness data strongly suggested that updating the composition of the COVID-19 vaccines in 2022 from the original monovalent to a bivalent containing the original and Omicron BA4, BA5 components offered benefit and protection from COVID-19 disease caused by Omicron. I think the data is pretty clear that there was a, a benefit to this. Nevertheless, as you also heard today, there appears to be an inverse relationship between the time since vaccination and vaccine effectiveness, such that bivalent COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness against evolving Omicron sublineages appears to wane over time. Uh, this appears from the data that presented by CDC that this may be even more true against virus variants such as XBB derivatives. Uh, three, the data indicate that bivalent COVID-19 vaccines elicit improved variant-specific neutralizing antibody titers, but these antibody titers also decrease over time after vaccination, and they are substantially lower against more recently circulating strains of virus like the XBB lineage viruses. Taken together, as far as effectiveness, the available data suggests that an updated strain composition of COVID-19 vaccines that will close, more closely match currently circulating and XBB lineage viruses may be, diff may be beneficial. Next slide. Okay, so in January, uh, we outline a, some we outline the approach that we would use for vaccine strain composition recommendations. And as we outlined and proposed at that meeting, the evidence used to determine the need for updating the strain composition of COVID-19 vaccines would ideally include multiple types of and sources of data. Over the last few months, the FDA has reviewed various types of data as listed below, and I'm going to walk through these in the next few slides. Uh, we've reviewed this data. We've engaged in key partners generating this data, and that included both vaccine manufacturers, other government agencies, as well as experts in the field. Uh, but if you break it down, the type of data can be grouped into a few categories. One is virus surveillance and genomic analyses to identify emerging new virus variants, uh, antigenic characterization of viruses to identify antigenically distinct variant viruses, post-vaccination human serology studies to evaluate the antibody responses generated by current vaccines against more recently circulating virus variants such as XBB lineage viruses, and finally preclinical immunogenicity studies to evaluate immune responses generated by new candidate vaccines, for example, those expressing or containing updated variant spike components against antigenically distinct circulating virus variants. In addition to all of reviewing all of these types of data, FDA reviewed the discussions and recommendations put forth by other regulatory groups and public health agencies. And finally, the FDA has discussed manufacturing timelines with each of the manufacturers of authorized and approved COVID-19 vaccines to understand the impact of a strain composition recommendation on vaccine availability. So I'm going to give you a quick high-level overview of of our review of each of these types of data. Uh, but first, I want to take uh, a pause in one sec, one slide, the next slide, to talk about about the role and the use of virus neutralization data to inform vaccine strain selection. The reason for this is because in much of the types of analysis that we do and the types of data we look at, virus neutralization data plays a key role. Virus neutralization data are routinely used to establish antigenic relationships among contemporary viruses. We also use virus neutralization data in post-vaccination studies, and we also use neutralization data to evaluate candidate vaccines in preclinical studies. Although other immune mechanisms are important for protection, 
and protective neutralization titers are unknown and are likely to vary among virus platforms and for different virus variants, neutralization has been shown to correlate with protection for all spike-based vaccines. I know everybody here has seen this graph that came from the New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, that basically plotted in, early, in all of the phase three trials conducted in the early, the first years or so of the pandemic uh, that showed essentially what I just stated. And that is for all of these spike-based vaccines, uh, higher levels of neutralizing antibody correlated with higher levels of protection. Uh, I do want to mention in the sub-bullet that the neutralization assays used by manufacturers of authorized and or approved COVID vaccines have been reviewed and evaluated by the FDA. So the reason I mention this is because we feel like this is still the strongest marker we have that is useful for informing vaccine strain uh, selection. Now, if we go back to the type of data reviews, the next slide. As I said, one of the key uh, types of data, of course, is virus surveillance and genomic analysis. Uh, you heard a lot of this from CDC, but also from uh, uh, WHO and the manufacturers. The left, uh, the left is shows the dendrogram of current virus uh, evolution. Uh, I think this was shown by, uh, uh, also shown by WHO, but basically it says what you've already heard is that the virus continues to evolve. Almost everything has evolved now from BA2 our original BA2 viruses, and now specifically from XBB recombinant viruses. Uh, the graph on the right is similar to the one shown by CDC, but it shows the different XBB, the percentages of different XBB viruses that are currently circulating. Uh, XBB 1.5 is decreasing in proportion. Uh, 1.16 seems to be increasing as do in the very bottom XB, other XBB uh, lineage viruses such as 2.3. But the point is that in June of 2023, over 95% of all isolates everywhere are XBB sublineages. Next slide. So what do we know about these XBB viruses? Well, we do have some virus characterization now. Uh, this slide is similar to one I showed you that we used last year, but specifically now focuses on the XBB lineage viruses. Once again, uh, the top two rows show uh, mutations in BA1 and BA2 compared to original uh, 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 compared to original Wuhan-like viruses, and the specific BA2 viruses in line two, uh, mutations that are specific for BA2. Now, as you've already heard, and you know by now, XBB is a recombinant of two BA2 derived viruses, BA2.10.1 and BA2.75. Although there are substantial spike amino acid com changes compared to BA2, including multiple RBD mutations. Um, in response to a question that was brought up earlier in the day, and I think it was by Dr. Meisner, uh, recombinations have occurred before this XBB. Uh, they've occurred throughout the pandemic. It's just that until this, these particular recombinants appeared, the other uh, recombinants that were, were, were isolated did not appear to take off. So anyway, it is a fairly common uh, phenomenon among coronaviruses. Um, Finally, in this slide, XBB has continued to evolve with accumulation of small numbers of mutations in the spike in terminal domain and the RBD. Uh, this is shown in green at the bottom. Uh, first of all, the first line it shows the XBB mutations compared to BA2, which, as I said, are quite a few amino acid changes compared to BA2, and hence uh, BA4.5 that were in last year's vaccine. Uh, XBB 1.5. Uh, has a couple uh, has a couple of amino acid changes compared to the original XBB uh, derived XBB virus, and then XBB 1.16 and XBB 2.3 have other amino acid changes. Uh, these differ from XBB 1.5 by one amino acid each in the RBD, and I I box those in the uh, in the uh, bottom two rows. Uh, but of course, what that means is XBB 1.16 and XBB 2.3 differ from each other by two key amino acids in the RBD. Uh, the next slide shows a final little 
summary slide of what we know about virus characterization about the XBB lineage uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Uh, as I've already mentioned, genomic analysis suggests a close relationship among the XBB lineage viruses. Anagenic characterization of circulating XBB lineage viruses is limited to a few recent studies, but also suggests anagenic similarity among the XBB lineage viruses. In one study, sera from XBB 1.0 XBB.1 infected hamsters, which is a monospecific sera, neutralized XBB1 and XBB1.5 and XBB1.16 pseudoviruses to a similar extent, but poorly neutralized pseudoviruses expressing earlier spike proteins. Uh, this particular reference and the, and the key uh, uh, graphs from that study have been shown twice already this morning. So I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, several studies, including those presented at VIRPAC by this VIRPAC at manufacturers of authorized or approved COVID-19 vaccines show substantial decreases in neutralizing antibody response against XBB subvariants. Data from preclinical studies, and I'm going to talk just a bit more about preclinical studies as well as uh, uh, as, as well as clinical studies in a minute. But data from preclinical studies with XBB 1.5 and 1.16 candidate vaccines, which were conducted by manufacturers of the authorized approved vaccines, indicate substantial cross-neutralization between XBB 1.5 and 1.16. Cross-neutralization was also observed against XBB 2.3, although it's a somewhat more limited data set. Although actually there's more data that's been generated since I made this slide and that was presented by the different manufacturers uh, earlier today. Uh, and finally, there's preliminary data from one clinical study with an XBB 1.5 candidate vaccine that also indicates substantial cross neutralization between XBB 1.5 and XBB 1.16. If we go to the next slide, this is a high-level summary of post-vaccination human serology studies. Uh, post-vaccination human serology studies are used to evaluate antibody responses that are generated by current vaccines against more recently circulating virus variants. The COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers are well positioned to generate the robust data needed from post-vaccination human serology studies. Just want to remind you that sera are available only from recipients of current vaccines or infected individuals. In other words, except for the one study that Moderna uh, uh, described, there is none of these have exposure, none of these subjects in the sera from these subjects have exposure to an XBB vaccine, and there's only limited exposure to any XBB lineage viruses in the study. The neutralization titers measured in this post-vaccination human serology studies against new virus variants, such as the XBB 1.5 and 1.16, can only indirectly suggest similarities or difference between two variants. Uh, the data presented at the FERPAC by these manufacturers of authorized approved COVID-19 vaccines indicate that recent virus variants uh, particularly the XBB descendant lineage viruses are especially resistant to neutralization by antibodies elicited by prior vaccination and or infection. Uh, besides the results presented by the manufacturers, there are similar results showing substantial reductions in neutralizing antibody titers against XBB lineage viruses and recipients of current vaccines that have been reported in many other studies. And I think uh, the WHO presentation lists several of these. I've listed only one more, and this was results from an NIH Covail clinical trial. And the only reason I mention that is because the assays they use are also assays that have been submitted and reviewed by the agency. Next slide. Okay, this one is I wanted to mention about, uh, talk briefly about high-level view of the preclinical immunogenicity studies with new candidate vaccines. Preclinical immunogenicity studies are used to evaluate immune responses generated by new candidate vaccines, those expressing or containing updated variant spike components, and used to evaluate against antigenically distinct circulating virus variants. Preclinical immunogenicity data, which is almost always neutralizing antibody, can provide an indication of how well antibodies to the spike of one strain will cross-neutralize other variant strains of SARS-CoV-2 and thus help inform strain selection in combination with other data. It is not predictive of improvement 
protection. It just gives us an indication of cross neutralization. Uh, these studies, of course, are dependent on COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers producing candidate vaccines at risk and conducting the studies to generate the data for evaluation. And I think it's very gratifying to see that all three of our vaccine manufacturers uh, actually produced a lot of candidate vaccines and did it quite extensive studies in a very short period of time. Uh, the data presented by these manufacturers indicate that updated XBB monovalent formulations of candidate vaccines elicit stronger neutralizing antibody responses against XBB descendant lineage viruses than current bivalent vaccines. So that is the summary of where we are now with the data that we've reviewed over the last few months. In the next slide, I want to briefly mention uh, something that comes up at all of these meetings and that is important, and that's the global alignment of COVID-19 strain composition recommendations. Uh, as you probably know, there are many challenges to the global coordination of the COVID-19 vaccine strain composition. A lot of this is due to the, basically the virus doesn't cooperate very well. Uh, it doesn't spread uniformly around the world, and different parts of the world have different considerations and different things that they have to consider in making a recommendation. Nevertheless, global public health agencies and vaccine regulators meet throughout the year in an effort to align the criteria used for evaluation as well as the vaccine strain composition recommendations when possible. I've listed three different things that have happened over the last few months. Uh, one is the WHO Technical Advisory Group, the TAG COVAC, which we heard an entire presentation from about their their review and their recommendation that's summarized in one quick sentence. One approach recommended by the TAG COVAC is the use of a monovalent XBB1 descendant lineage. But also there have been other groups, the International Coalition of Regulatory Authorities. Uh, this is an informal group of international regulatory authorities, which we're one, uh, met in early May to discuss the antigen content of COVID-19 vaccines. And a quick statement from their one quick line from their statement, uh, XBB is considered an adequate candidate for vaccines composition update. And more recently, just about a week ago, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control and the EMA issued a statement on updating COVID-19 vaccine composition for new SARS-CoV-2 virus variants. Uh, Elements from their statement were that one, a monovalent vaccine composition is suitable to ensure adequate immunogenicity against circulating SARS-CoV-2 in both primed and naive individuals, and also the inclusion of a strain belonging to the XBB family of Omicron subvariants is adequate to ensure cross-reactivity against current dominating and emerging strains. So in spite of the challenges, uh, regulators and public health authorities do meet and we do try to coordinate when at all possible. Next slide. So before I summarize uh, the, the main elements from uh, this presentation, I wanted to make a couple of comments about future directions. Uh, one of which is that I think it's obvious to all of us now that updating the SARS-CoV-2 strain composition of COVID-19 will be a continuous process. Uh, it would be great if it wasn't and that it was stable, but it doesn't look like it now. Whether the rate of change will continue, none of us know. But we have to be prepared that this is going to be a continuous process. Uh, there are many challenges and uncertainties that remain. Uh, you could probably make a long list. I miss, mentioned two here that I just wanted to highlight. One is understanding and improving the durability of protection from vaccines. A second challenge uh, that we that remains is understanding how differences in neutralization titer actually correlate to clinical outcomes. Again, this is not like the influenza situation where we have a pretty good feel that if you see a reduced neutralization or HI titer of twofold, fourfold, eightfold, you know what the clinical outcome is, how the clinical outcome is affected. So we need more understanding about this. It's also true that uh, we need improved coordination, and this possibly includes additional resources, but this improved coordination is needed to generate the quality data that's needed for string composition decisions. I've listed several examples here. There may be more. Uh, one is a timely production of monospecific animal syrup, for example, hamster syrup. And this is useful and important for determining antigenic relationships among contemporary circulating viruses using standardized neutralization assays. 
Right now, our sources of this monospecific sera are very limited and usually not in the sense timely enough to make a strain a composition decision. We also need additional sources of human sera from recipients of current vaccines to evaluate the need for an updated vaccine composition. Uh, right now, we have sources of sera from the vaccine manufacturers, which is great, uh, but it would be good to have additional sources from other places. Uh, I'm reminded of the influenza situation situation where we routinely have sera from pediatrics, we have them from adults, we have them from elderly, and those are evaluated by different WHO centers. Uh, so anyway, additional sources of human sera would be important. Also additional sources of human sera from individuals infected with contemporary circulating viruses are as important to, to have for qualifying and standardizing assays. And finally, the last one that I've listed here, which is a bit aspirational, I'll admit, is that there needs to be a better and independent and reliable risk assessment of circulating virus variants to focus resources and better predict the need for an updated vaccine composition. So I'm almost at the end. The next two slides are a quick summary of where we are and everything you've heard. By several measures, including escape from antibody neutralization and waning protection, current COVID-19 vaccines appear less effective against currently circulating virus variants, for example, the XBB lineage viruses, than against previous strains of viruses. The manufacturers of authorized approved COVID-19 vaccines have been evaluating updated candidate vaccines at risk, and as they've all stated at this meeting, they are prepared to provide an updated vaccine for 2023-2024. But as you've also heard, some of these manufacturing timelines may be impacted by the final choice of vaccine antigen. Uh, next slide. Last three summary points. Preclinical data from three different vaccine manufacturers all indicate that updated XBB monovalent formulations elicit stronger neutralizing antibody responses against XBB descendant lineage viruses than current bivalent vaccines. Uh, that available data strongly suggests an inclusion of an antigen from early strains of SARS-CoV-2, for example, Wuhan, in an updated vaccine formulation is unlikely to enhance the response to current virus variants. Preliminary data from a clinical study with one XBB 1.5 candidate vaccine also indicate improved neutralizing antibody responses against XBB descendant lineage viruses. And the totality of all this available evidence suggests that a monovalent XBB lineage virus vaccine is warranted for the 2023-2024 vaccine campaign. Uh, that's the end of the talk. The next two slides have the voting question and the discussion topic. If you want to flash them up real fast before we just take questions and go into our discussion. This is the voting question. You saw it earlier in the day, and this is the discussion topic. So we'll come back to those, I'm sure, in a few minutes. Over to you, Dr. Monta. Thank you, Dr. Weir. It's very comprehensive and uh, clear presentation to put us uh, ready for our later discussion after we have some questions. And I see Dr. Levy has his hand raised. Thank you for that uh, efficient review, Dr. Weir, a, a lot of information you're taking into account. Uh, this topic has brought, been brought up several times before, but um, what is FDA's current view of what the correlative protection is uh, to protect against coronavirus infection and disease? Um, is there any uh, position of FDA in terms of asking sponsors moving forward to collect more T-cell data? Do you want in future meetings to be summarizing those kind of data uh, as well? Uh, these these are, are, are questions um, uh, for you as you uh, summarize immunogenicity considerations. Thank you. Okay, so to take them one at a time, um, I'm not sure that there is a unified view of correlates of protection. Uh, I think you've seen the data that's been presented that in general, neutralizing antibody correlates with protection. That does not mean that there is some threshold that we can identify that says that at this level you are protected. Uh, most of those studies were done early in infection when, when 
not Omicron, when Wuhan and Wuhan-like viruses circulated, uh, whatever the correlates of protection were then are probably not the same as they are now. And as I mentioned in one slide, I think correlates of protection for antibody probably almost assuredly vary from platform to platform. Uh, again, today at this meeting, we're using neutralizing antibody as a measure for something that informs strain selection. Uh, ideally, of course, one would love a correlate of protection that one could point to and flash up a slide that says it's this level of antibody or it's this level of something else. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, although, again, there's a lot of people have different opinions about that. Um, I think the second part of your question was what do we, how do we feel about T cell analysis? I would love to be standing here next year and telling you that we have more information about T cell responses and what correlates with protection. I don't think we're there yet. We always encourage manufacturers to do these studies, uh, but they're difficult. I don't think anybody should, should sugarcoat that. Uh, doing a, a T cell analysis and trying to correlate the type of T cell measurement that you you, that you have with protection is, is very difficult. All T cells are not the same. All vaccines uh, don't elicit the same type of T cells. Um, so yes, we encourage it. We look at it. Uh, as more data becomes available, we will certainly use it. Over. Okay. Uh, just keep in mind as we go through the question uh, session that if you have questions of the manufacturers of CDC, this is the time to bring them up. We'll have a discussion of the voting question and the rest after the break. So, Dr. Chatterjee, I think your hand was raised. Yes, thank you, Dr. Monjo. My question actually is for Dr. Dubovsky from the Novavax presentation. Um, it is with regard to a slide that he presented, uh, I believe it's VS9, Dr. Dubovsky. I was uh, intrigued to see that uh, the response uh, in mice that were boosted with XBB15 uh, was actually greater against XBB16 than when they were boosted with XBB1.16. Do you have an explanation for this phenomenon? Yeah, I, you may have spotted similar um, two thing of responses in some of the other sponsors' presentation. XB15 is a very good immunogen. It, it really does its job well. Uh, some of these differences maybe due to group sizes, right? So these are groups of 10. Uh, so there may be some um, um, changes. This is a bioassay, so it's, it's less precise than, uh, for instance, receptor binding inhibition. Okay, thank you, because that was going to be my follow-up question on VS14, but, th but that makes sense um, given what you just said. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gellin. Thanks, uh, Jerry. That was an incredible uh, recount of a lot of history that we're, many were part of. And thanks especially for sort of bringing us up to speed of what the other regulators were thinking about. In all those discussions, have there been any discussion about dose? If I, if I saw the slides correctly, the Moderna data showed that the bivalent um, immune response was similar to the monovalent immune response, um, even though the dose was different. So the question, and Kanta made the point that monovalent would give you a more robust uh, immunity. The question is, so is there a summit work on optimizing the dose between immunity and maybe reactogenicity? And then for the manufacturers, does it matter do, in your hands? Do the different XBBs perform differently, so that you want to pick? You have some flexibility on picking among them for yield and other manufacturing issues. Thanks. So I think you asked both me and the manufacturers some questions in in that question. Um, I'll start with the first one, but it was partly Moderna's data. Um, yes, there were some data presented, and I've seen other data in the literature too, that the differences in responses between a monovalent and a bivalent were probably not as much as maybe some of us would have predicted. For example, you don't always get two times as much a response to the variant 
uh, component as you do in a in a um, monovalent as, as opposed to a bivalent. Uh, but that being said, uh, no, I don't know that a lot more has been done to optimize the response. I do think that taking out the ancestral strain will do something to optimize the response simply because you won't be competing with something that people have already seen two, three, four times. Uh, so I think that will help in the optimization. Uh, as far as optimizing dose again at this level after a company a sponsor has been approved or authorized or licensed in would be a lot of clinical studies. So I don't know how much they're willing to uh, to invest in that, but I will basically turn it over to the sponsors to, to answer that part of your question. Over. Thank you for that. Um, and so I'll put up our, um, I'll put up the our clinical data again from the XBB 1.5 monovalent and the bivalent vaccines. And as as you, can I get CO25 up, please? Yes. And as uh, as you said, there, um, you know, both the monovalent and the bivalent vaccines have a very good response for both against XBB 1.5 and a cross good cross neutralization response against XBB 1.16, and and the response is numerically higher as well as in terms of the GMTs and the fold rise for the monovalent. In terms of the dose optimization, um, can I have the, the systemic reactogenicity slide, please? I think our system, our reactogen, so both of these doses are our standard 50 microgram dose for the booster. And if I have this slide up as well, our systemic, uh, our reactogenicity for these vaccines is actually quite, um, is, um, it, the reactogenicity is well tolerated. And it's very similar to that which we had for the bivalent vaccine booster, as well as the monovalent vac vaccine booster. So overall, kind of very consistent at, with a very good immune response for the monovalent XBB15 vaccine. Thank you. I think Pfizer, Wishes to comment, please. Tina Swanson, Pfizer. If I could have slide one up, please. Just to follow up on the question around the mono versus bivalent, these are the preclinical data showing XBB 1.5 monovalent versus 1.5 bivalent. And this is a fourth dose booster. So in the context of two original uh, vaccine doses, followed by the current bivalent BA45. So trying to more faithfully reproduce the current immunological setting. So in that context, we do also see a trend for higher neutralizing titers with the monovalent formulation compared to bivalent. And going back to the prior clinical data that we've generated, um, we've seen this also in humans when we initially evaluated the Omicron BA1 monovalent versus bivalent vaccine. And the question around the dose level, we have evaluated 30 microgram versus 60 microgram. There is a subtle trend of higher neutralizing titers going from 30 to 60 microgram, but it's not a substantial increase. So I think the collective data is showing that the current dose level is sufficient for the variant adapted vaccines. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Offit. Yes, thank you. So, so um, these vaccines will be available presumably in the next few months. The, the data that we don't currently have is we, we don't have either immunogenicity data or safety data from either Novavax or Pfizer. Um, we don't have concomitant use data for either influenza vaccine, which is likely to be given around the same time, or for older Americans, the RSV vaccine. And we don't have uh, dosing data for young children who would be at risk and would benefit. So my question, I guess, to the FDA and to Jerry is, what exactly is the standard that you're going to be holding these companies to to, to provide that information before clinicians are, are being asked to give this vaccine? Thank you. Dr. Ware? Yeah. Um, okay. So that's a little different from, from what we're talking about today about what should be in the vaccine. But it is true that as we outlined in January, 
We expect an extensive data package from each manufacturer. Once a recommendation is made, an extensive data package from each manufacturer to support their vaccine. Uh, things that you mentioned like concomitant studies, all of those would be discussed with manufacturers. They would be prepared, I'm sure, to do the studies that we would need to evaluate that type of, of situation. Uh, I forgot the second part of it. Well, so do dosing for children, was there any interest in, in uh in providing dosing data for children. Uh, yeah, so that again, I can turn to my other FDA colleagues, but those discussions are underway between the agency and each manufacturer about uh, doses for different age groups. Um, so, yeah. But those data will, you're, you're, we'll anticip a, Jerry, you're anticipating those data would be in hand by the time this vaccine was rolling off the shelves. Is that fair? Uh, I'm not sure I can comment right now on the timelines of all of this, sorry. I don't know if anybody else, uh, Jerry, a, would have a, something about the timelines for that or not. We do have a lot of submissions in house on different age groups and different doses and things that are under review now. Okay, can we should we park that uh, that that uh, question and uh, come back to it later if there is an sure. answer. That makes sense to me, Dr. Monto. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Rubin. Thanks. Dr. Gellin sort of preempted my question, but I, I do want to follow up then on, on the response to that one. Um, the two doses that are used in monovalent and bivalent vaccines are very similar to one another. I mean, they're double the dose, but that is a rather small difference. Um, given that the that everyone has, that most of the population has seen multiple doses of antigen. In traditional immunology, if you wanted to improve the quality of antibody, you'd lower the dose of antigen rather than increasing it within this narrow range. So really, I think it's a question for the manufacturers. Do lower doses actually give you better responses in some of the models that you're using now, given the three or four, you know, the three doses, three prior doses and the uh, and, and exposure to natural infection? Interesting question about dose finding. Do the manufacturers have any interest in replying? Jerry, do you? No, I think you've probably seen everything with candidate vaccines that there is, but I'll turn it towards the manufacturers to see if they've evaluated something that they didn't present. Pfizer? Put me up. Hi. So I. Early on in the evaluation of the original BNT162B2 vaccine, we did evaluate lower doses at the 10 microgram level in adults. And we did see nice increased response going from 10 to 30 microgram. Now going into more of the variant adapted vaccine clinical experience, we've really focused on looking at whether 30 or moving up to 60 microgram, but not going down um, in the dose level because the, the, if we're seeing, we're not seeing saturation saturation um, going from the 30 to 60 micrograms. So it suggests that 30 microgram is a reasonable dose level. And that's fair. But of course, the individuals now have seen a lot more doses of antigens. So it's not the same as when you did the initial studies, where I, I, did, I, do, we, I do recall those data. Um, and I wonder if it would be the same now. Well, I think if we're moving toward more of a monovalent XBB, that will be much more of a new antigen component containing vaccine. So I think it would be in a good position to see reasonable responses with that composition. Does Moderna want to reply? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have done, our, we have worked to kind of keep the doses consistent to facilitate the, um, to, facil to facilitate the licensure and kind of implementation across the populations. You're right. I mean, we have the 50 micrograms for the monovalent and a total 50 for the bivalent, which has the 25 of the uh, XBB15. And, and there we do see the benefit of of some benefit of the monovalent. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can comment on whether a, a lower dose of, of the monovalent would, um, would, be, would be further improved. I'm not, I'm not sure. And Dr. Dubofsky, do you want to add to this? Yeah, when in the early days, we did dose finding in the seronegatives. And there we found that a low dose, a five microgram dose, performed comparably to a 25 microgram dose. 
I think we're in different times now. Uh, everyone's been exposed or vaccinated. And I, and I draw experience more toward influenza, where we know that uh, higher doses in people who've been exposed many times actually lead to a, a better immune response. And we uh, presented some data recently for a higher dose formulation we're working on for uh, older adults, because uh, we think this will, in fact, lead to a better boosting uh, regime. We have, we have a very low dose vaccine right now with only five micrograms of uh, antigen. And we have a lot of space we can go up uh, to optimize the immune response. So that's something we're actively working on. Thank you. Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Dr. Mata. Um, I first want to uh, echo the compliments to Dr. Weir. Uh, that was a fantastic overview of uh, the issues that, that we've heard about today and in the past. So thanks so much for that. I, I also want to uh, recognize the CDC for their um, genome surveillance, because um, that has been so instrumental in, in helping us uh, continue to uh, think about the evolution of these mutant strains. So uh, I, it, I just didn't want it to go on said that how important that is. And I, and I think the CDC is sequencing about 750 um Isolates a week, and I, I don't know if that's accurate, but uh, I'd be interested. But then, Dr. Dr. Weir, I'd like to, to ask you, um, you mentioned that you compare the neutralizing titers um, or, or you validate the neutralizing titer assays among the different companies. And um, how, how well do they compare that is how are they because they're likely different uh different assays and and how similar are uh the results from those number one and then number two um i'd like to ask about the duration of antibodies to xbb and um will it We've been talking about different doses as a way of perhaps getting more antibody. Um, it, it, do we anticipate, because the, the data that was shown only took us out a couple of weeks from the manufacturers. It was very helpful, but obviously um, time is, is limited. But is there any reason to think that, it, that there would be a longer duration of antibody to XBB and especially to to Novavax, um, with your matrix, uh, adju your matrix M adjuvant, um, it, it, you anticipate there might be uh, a, a longer survival of 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 or higher concentrations of of antibodies. Doctor, where would you care to speculate? Yeah. Well, I can answer the first one and speculate on the second one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first one is when I mentioned the, the assays, uh, I don't think and we don't really compare assays that one company sends in with assays for another. We certainly don't do studies that compare them. What we do is hold them to the same standards, though, and we ask that they be qualified and validated, and we ask for the same sort of controls such that we can have confidence in the results. So it's not quite a comparative thing. And, and different companies use different types of assays. I mean, you hear a lot of pseudovirus type assays uh, being, being mentioned, but every pseudovirus assay is not the same either. So we don't really compare them per se, but we hold them to the same high standards. And I will tell you that almost no one ever sends in an assay the first time that is perfect. They get lots of feedback from us and we work with them so that we have confidence in their assays. Uh, that is important. And, and again, I'm not trying to disparage studies that come from other places, but it is something that's out of our control when a study gets published in a preprint with an assay that we have no idea of any details about. Uh, so anyway, I hope that helps with the assay question. Uh, the second one is, a, as Dr. Mato said, will be a little bit of speculation on my part. I would guess, and I invite others to chime in, I would guess that the duration of antibodies with any variant will be somewhat similar to the duration of antibodies for some other variant. Uh, that being said, I think the higher the titer, the, if, even if the duration is about the same and, and call it a decay, it's not really quite a decay, but the diminution of 
the response goes down over time. If you start at a higher level, then it, you have something detectable for a longer period of time. So that would be my guess. Uh, and again, that's part of the reason for trying to get a variant specific response that is higher for an XBB lineage virus than you have now. It's such that you will boost that tighter up and hopefully it will stay at some level that contributes to protection for a longer period of time. But again, I'm speculating. I'll let others chime in. Dr. Dubofsky, would you care to speculate? Sure. So, so we we do have a fair amount of experience with with the adjuvant, uh, and I and I agree. The higher you go, the longer it's going to be around. But what we also observed is that uh, we have an increased breadth of immune response. Uh, so, uh, as far as the small changes and the small uh, changes towards the variants, we seem to have really nice neutralizing responses that carry across all of those. So that, that may be one benefit of having an adjuvanted vaccine, uh, not only against protection from the name strain, but also those from uh, drift. Dr. Das. Yes. So we do, um, you know, I, we do have some data about the durability for the BA45. And I, I think the point is well taken about the, about the question of the dose as the slide is coming up, um, uh, that the higher you start, the better. So that may be a reason against the dose ranging. But in this slide on the uh, left panel, the pre-boost titers are about eight months after receiving a BA45 bivalent vaccine. And so you see you have uh, quite good durability for the BA45 titers with, uh, with the bivalent vaccine. But, you know, the durability of the titers versus the evolution of the variant is, is certainly um, hard to balance. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Monto. Um, my question is um, actually to either uh, Dr. Weir or any of the manufacturers' representatives who are here. Um, I just was thinking back to our discussion a year ago and uh, the recommendation at the time from the WHO was, uh, if I recall correctly, to go with BA1 as being one of the two components of the bivalent. And based on the data presented, we chose to go with the BA45 along with the uh, original strain. This time, we're um, seeing a lot of data supporting the use of a monovalent BA1.5. And I'm wondering if uh, any of the manufacturers or the FDA has any data on using more than one of these variants. So 1.5 and maybe 1.16 or 1.5 and 2.3. Uh, has that been looked at by anybody? I'll have to turn that to the manufacturer. All right, uh, Dr. Right. Pfizer, got, and please raise your hands if you want to get, get, uh, give some information. So thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for the question. We did show data where we combined XBB 1.5 with the BA45 of Omicron. We did not combine the 1.5 and the 1.16 in the preclinical studies, given how antigenically similar those two Omicrons were. Thank you. Yes. And we agree with that, with that as well. Thank okay. you very much. Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so I have a question for the manufacturers. So we've been talking a lot about uh, making the, the recommendations uniform and uh, also about boosting. But one of the population of the zero to two-year-old children who uh, are, may be naive, they may have some, or they may not be. But for that group, there is quite a disparity in the different recommendations from the different manufacturers. Is there going to be any effort to, to make the uh, recommendations similar? So I think, believe now Pfizer has more recommends more shots than the Moderna. I don't know that what Novavax is doing, but is there any uh, intents to try to make that uh, more uniform across the different uh, vaccine platforms? Doc, uh, does Pfizer want to Actually, I wonder, would, would FDA want to answer first and then I can follow on? Dr. Ware? I'm going to turn this one back to somebody in the 
common room, Dr. Kozlow. I mean, yes, yes, there is effort. Sure. <laughs> yeah. been an effort for six months to simplify all of this. Over to you. Yeah, this is not an easy question. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is Dave Kozlow. Um, yes, there's a whole effort to continue to simplify the immunization schedule. Probably first and foremost is a uniform age cutoff for children transitioning from that multi-dose initial to a single dose thereafter. Um, I think as you alluded to um, and related to that kind of first topic is reducing the complexity in that four to five years of age in terms of dose and regimen and schedule. Um, we also, and I think it was touched on um, earlier, you know, reviewing the need in other populations for additional doses. And, um, and lastly, um, looking at schedules in individuals with certain kinds of, um, of immune compromise. So those are all under active consideration and um, will certainly be impacted by some of the decisions and, recomm the decisions and recommendations that come out of this, this FERPAC. So yes, work in progress. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dubofsky, do you have something to add? Yeah, just, just to point out that we're uh, authorized in the U.S. Uh, in the age group of 12 and older. We're down in children as young as six months of age now, and we use the exactly the same formulation as, you, as we use in adults, and it's it's uh, tolerable in that age group. So uh, as those studies conclude and we file for uh, authorization approval in the U.S., I think we'll have a solution that'll be quite good for those kids. And Pfizer? Yes, I think I just wanted to follow up. I, I think on your question more specifically on the pediatric population, and we do have ongoing studies evaluating the current bivalent BA45 vaccine as both a two and three dose series. So we will have forthcoming data to understand if in future um, the current primary three dose series for the youngest age group could transition to a two dose series. And Dr. Das, did you have something additional? I, yes, please. So we do have the data for a bivalent vaccine as a primary series, as a two-dose primary series, and we do support FDA's efforts certainly for harmonization. We've heard that this is a complex um, this is a complex situation, particularly for children, and whatever we can do to simplify is important. Okay, thank you. I it's three o'clock Eastern. Uh, I see three hands raised from the committee. Uh, are these questions for uh, either the manufacturers or uh, Dr. Weir? Because we have a long discussion ahead of us. Dr. Levy, is this a question? Yes. Just, just, just briefly, I know our purpose here is to focus on the composition of the vaccine for the fall. Um, I, you know, Dr. Offit brought up the topic of vaccine safety. We don't want to lose sight of that. Uh, we haven't heard a lot today about any updates regarding safety surveillance on the mRNA or Novavax vaccines uh, from CDC or the sponsors. There's not time now to take a deep dive, but I'm wondering if they would comment, because it's been a while since Verpac has met, whether any new signals emerge or whether everything is more or less as we last left it in the realm of safety. Thank you. That would be a question, I hope, for CDC, because they can give yes. an answer yes. for all the vaccines. Because we don't want to need to go Correct. to each manufacturer. Let's park that and go back. Uh, this, this, this is Peter Marks. I, I, I'm happy to, to, to respond okay. to this. I think All it's right. actually a mutual question for CDC and FDA, which All share right. vaccine safety surveillance activities for um, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so um, I think it's fair to say that there are... <clears throat> No significant new safety signals that have be, been confirmed uh, since the last updates presented to the committee. And Dr. Caslow, do you want to just confirm that my memory of that is correct? And perhaps if Dr. Forshee is listening, he could uh, chime in. Dr. Marks, that is correct. Thanks very much. Okay, Dr. McGinnis, the last question. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I have to say, I um, at this stage of development, I think we should be able to have seen dose concentration curves for with neutralizing antibody response for these vaccine candidates. 
Um, and I don't guess I saw that. Uh, and I'm a little disappointed because I think we should. We know for sure with flu vaccines that you can continue to go up in HA concentration and continue to get an antibody response. And so we really didn't see any of those data and there was some fumbling around about that. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about that in the next section. And then just one question, we've spoken that this is not flu, that we don't know its seasonality, that yet we're calling it a 23-24 vaccine decision. And I'm wondering if some other nomenclature is maybe more suitable for um, these candidates, um, because it may not be a year. I mean, maybe we're gonna be chasing this one. And so I'm just wondering about the nomenclature that has been selected. Dr. Thank Weir, you. Would you care to answer before we go on break? Yeah, I mean, we can take that back and discuss if there's a better way to, to phrase it. But back to what you mentioned earlier, Dr. McGinnis, about feeling locked in. I don't think you should feel locked in in the sense that what we're doing is only locking in our course of action now for how to proceed. And if something changes in six months or four months or nine months, we will adjust to it. And we will come back to this committee. The manufacturers have shown that they're willing to respond. And I know you folks in the committee are. And so, yes, although we take we, we start now with the expectation that this is for 2023-24, we will adjust as needed. Over. Thank you. Just one quick response to Jerry. I get it, Jerry. I know you'll do what we need to do. It sort of relates back to Bruce's comment about the word periodic and what that really means in this context of whether this is within a year. So I, I just am not sure that the nomenclature is helpful uh, for what you're trying oh. to achieve. Okay, point taken. I think the periodic, we use it and have used it to basically get across the fact that what several of us have said is that this is going to continue and we are going to do this. This yep. won't be the last time we do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you so much to everybody. Uh, Ten minute break. We come back at 315 for the discussion of the voting question. 315 Eastern.
Okay. We're now going to have a session where we will have discussion and voting. We usually have the vote as the end of the meeting. After a long discussion, this time we're going to have some discussion about the voting question and then some further discussion about the topic of what lineage should be included in the vaccine if the voting answer, if the uh, if there is a yes on the voting question. So, Dr. Ware, would you introduce the voting question, please? I'll read it if someone will put it on the screen. Yep. Okay. So this is the question that we'll ask the committee to vote on after after discussion. For the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines in the United States, does the committee recommend a periodic update of the current vaccine composition to a monovalent XBB lineage? Back to you. And when you say periodic, you mean whenever is necessary, correct? Yes. Starting with right now for the next fall season. Starting starting right now. Uh, for the next fall season. Right. Yeah. As we go into the discussion, uh, I would invite the members who we haven't heard from up to now to uh, raise your hands and participate in the discussion. The way we should be going about this is to discuss whether we think there should be a change. If the change is indicated, should we be going to a monovalent vaccine? And if we are to go to a monovalent vaccine, is XBB lineage the appropriate one? We don't have to do those in sequence. That would be a little difficult, but we should be addressing all of those components because they are the components uh, on which uh, a yes vote will depend. Dr. Offit? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I certainly think that the we should update this vaccine. I certainly think that Wuhan one no longer needs to be in this vaccine, and to include a circulating currently circulating strain makes sense. The word periodic worries me. I'm not sure what is meant by that. Because and here's what I, here's what I mean by this. I think some of the language that we've used today um, is going to confuse the American public. And and I'll give two examples. One is is the use of the term waning protection. I think we need to make it very clear what we mean by waning protection, because what we really mean is waning protection against severe disease. And in whom does that occur? This virus drifts, no doubt about it. And, and it drifts away from protection against mild disease, but it does not drift away from protection against severe disease in people who are otherwise healthy and say less than 75. So I think that's number one. Number two, we've used the word occasionally early on, the word campaign was used. That implies sort of a yearly flu-like campaign. And I don't, I just, this gets to Ofer Levy's question earlier. Um, there's abundant evidence on T-cells, both cytotoxic T-cells and T-helper cells from Alessandro Setti and Daniela Weisskopf and and uh, and uh, others at, at UCSD, as well as John Weary at Pennant, recently a paper in, in, uh, out of Australia in immunity that clearly shows the relationship between the, the uh, activation and differentiation of, of helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells in prevention against severe disease, and the epitopes that are recognized by those cells are generally conserved. So, and so the epidemiology is consistent with the immunology, which is that when Omicron came into this country and we saw a wave of infections, we didn't see as much of of an increase in hospitalizations and deaths. So I think, I mean, I'll take myself as an example, then my rant is over and you can ignore me. But I think that, I mean, I had three doses of Wuhan 1. In May 2022, I had a, a mild two-day illness, probably with BA2. So I was immunized with Wuhan 1. I got uh, infected with BA2 and had a mild two-day illness. Now, that was a drifted virus. I mean, that's why I had a mild infection, but I didn't have a severe infection because presumably I had T-cells that prevented that severe infection, which may last for years. So I think 
think we need to make sure that when we move forward here, that then I'm, I'm all up for updating this vaccine, but I think we need to define, and the CDC can help us with this, who really benefits from booster dosing? Because it's not everybody. And the last fact, the when, when we made this recommendation on June 28th last year, the CDC followed it up on September 1st by recommending that vaccine for everybody. And I think that wasn't the right recommendation. So I just hope that, that, uh, that, that this becomes clear. This is not flu. Uh, flu, you know, is strange. Specific. We missed twice in the last 10 years on H3N2. And even if you got that vaccine and then you were exposed to H3N2, you had very little protection. That's not this virus. You still have protection against serious illness. I think we need to explain that to the American public because we're confusing them. Thanks. I'm done. Thanks, Arnold. Okay. <laughs> Next, Dr. Rubin. Uh, thanks. And Dr. Offit is a tough act to follow. But um, I, I think what has been so helpful today is that there's been a consistent message from all of our discussions, from the CDC, from the FDA, and, and from the manufacturers. And I think it makes it pretty a pretty simple question here. Uh, the we um, the monovalent vaccine, there doesn't seem to be any particular advantage to a bivalent vaccine. XBB is the lineage right now, and there is good cross protection, no matter what antigen is chosen, um, according to the data that we've been uh, that we've been shown. I think that the question of periodic is a reasonable is a reason uh, whether or not the word periodic should be in there is a reasonable question. However, I think that we need a new we need a better vaccine. We should be updating it, and I think it's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Straightforward comment about a straightforward question. Dr. Lee. Yes, I just wanted to clarify all the data that we've been looking at so far, or most of it, has been on individuals who've already gotten the initial vaccine series, and in some cases, an additional booster or maybe two boosters. Are we talking solely about boosters? Are we also talking about initial vaccines for those who have not gotten them? I'm thinking in particular, there's been exceedingly low uptake among children under two. I think 90% are unvaccinated. Are we going to be recommending that for those who have not been vaccinated? I need some clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weir or Dr. Marks or Dr. Kaslow. Uh, I can start real fast. Uh, the recommendation for the composition will apply to everything. Okay. Over to you, David or Peter. No, nothing further on my end. It's it's. Yeah, no, I correct. think it's one vaccine composition because we think it makes the most sense one because size it's fits actually all. circulating. Okay, circulating. thank you. Simplification, uh, Doctor Doctor Reinhardt. That was close, uh, uh, Arnold. Thanks. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm third or fourth in line here. Um, I, I would strike the word periodic from this question. I think what we're being asked is, do we think it should be updated for this fall? And and I I agree with Paul and others that we should. But but as worded, it seems to be saying, do we agree that there's going to be a, a a regular need? Uh, to update it, and I don't think that's clear. So I, I, I would change it to an update as opposed to a periodic update. Thank you. And I would also just say, when it comes to who should get this vaccine, that's up to ACIP, basically. Dr. Sawyer. I agree that um, updating the vaccine with the monovalent strain makes the most sense. I think the data is quite clear. I'll join the choir here. I think using the word season is equally problematic. It, it links the campaign to influenza vaccine. And I understand that it may be convenient and most efficient to give the vaccines together, but you know, it's only been a few years. We don't really know what the COVID season is, and it may ultimately confuse people about when and where they should get vaccinated and how frequently. I, I don't see that it gives us an advantage to predict what we're going to do beyond this fall, or I wouldn't even say this fall, beyond the time when a new vaccine can be produced. If that's next week, we should start giving it next week. Uh, so uh, the other comment, I just follow up on Dr. Lee's comment and Dr. Reinhold's presumption that the ACIP will discuss whether this vaccine should be given to everybody or whether it's going to be a subset. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thanks. Um, I will um, echo what's already been said. I 
Oh, there you go. I'll echo what's already been said. I think um, I appreciate the straightforwardness of this question, um, asking uh, if we should be updating the current composition. Um, absolutely. To a monovalent, yes, agree. We no longer need the Wuhan strain. And to this lineage, uh, I would agree with that as well. I think I do want to be careful that we don't um, that we're clear that this is for this update, it's monovalent. It may not be monovalent um, in future updates. And I do agree. I actually think the 2023 to 2024 formula language is, is more confusing than the periodic update. I think we're recommending an update. I think the language should be, do you recommend an update now? Um, and whether or not that formula will carry through all of 2024, um, we can't really say. Um, and I, uh, that's it. Thank you. Dr. Marks, would you... Uh... Like to yeah, I, I hate to be contrarian, but, you know, from a public health perspective, people need to be able to understand what we're actually doing. And there's only so fast that our manufacturers can actually change things. So in order to make a few hundred million doses of vaccine, uh, in, essentially, practically, we're going to have one update per year, barring a heroic effort to deal with a strain that pops up that is essentially so different that it requires us to mobilize tremendous resources to address that strain change. So for practical purposes, what we're talking about here, I think we, I, we can strike periodic, but for practical purposes, so that the manufacturers can get on with this and actually label their vaccines, it's the 2023-2024 formula um, that they're making right now, and that's what's planned. That doesn't mean, just like for pandemic influenza, that something couldn't happen that could make us need to intercede here. And so I, I think it, this is I, – I, I, I'm really having trouble understanding the committee's need – to bristle against something that's similar to influenza. People understand a yearly influenza vaccine. At this point, it may not be yearly, but for all intents and purposes, it looks like probably by next fall, there'll be further drift from this um, uh, uh, and we may have to come back here. Um, so um, I, I think this is our best effort to try to help make things clear. And I have to say, we have to do better because we have not done a good job to date communicating to the American public what's going on here because they're still not getting these vaccines in, in the way we'd like to potentially see people, even those over the age of 65, get vaccinated. So this was our effort to try to clarify things. And yes, I think periodic was just meant to mean that this is not going to be what we end up with today after today will not be the final. It's not like MMR. This is not going to uh, uh, be the final formulation for this vaccine forevermore. It will probably require another update at some point. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Monto. Um Coming after that uh, statement, I, I actually respectfully uh, don't agree with the discussion that uh, Dr. Marks just said. I mean, I, I, it's not clear to me that this is a seasonal virus yet. And I, I do agree that it seems like all the stars are aligning for a monovalent vaccine rather than a bivalent uh, product. It's not clear to me, thinking from a public health perspective, how how much uh, complexity will be eased as we try to move forward with this, because I think implementation, who gets what and the number of doses and all and the communication in the public arena will be incredibly challenging, uh, primarily for the ACIP, I believe. And so for me, the word periodic is not a great term. And 2023-2024 formula suggests that this is going to be once a year. And I'm I'm not sure personally that we're we're there with this virus that's not necessarily uh seasonal. And the last comment I'll make is I, I understood that uh these platforms that the manufacturers are using allow shorter timelines for production production of vaccine. So unlike flu vaccine, uh, many made in egg, 
or egg based, I thought these the turnaround for these were uh, a shorter time frame, which would allow appropriate changes as needed. Thanks. Uh, as somebody who has been looking at the seasonal or common cold coronaviruses, they are sharply seasonal. And I think it's premature to say that this virus will not become seasonal once there is antibody in the population. So I agree we're not there yet, but we may be. And uh, to say that uh, it's not going to follow a familiar pattern may be premature as well. My two cents. Dr. Pergen. Thanks, Arnold. Um, I'm not sure I have much to add than uh, what my colleagues have said. Um, I, I guess I'm really encouraged by um, the manufacturers, the FDA, even WHO, um, working towards a um, similar idea of what um, would be in the updated monovalent. I think the data that is available um, looks as though it would be um, the right choice. I also like the idea that that we'd have a global vaccine that would fit within um, not just the American public, but also worldwide that would make this um, much easier um, for the companies to deliver and protect people around the world, um, which has been kind of the challenges up to this point. I, I guess I'm, I'm curious from the FDA's perspective, since there's all this discussion of periodicity, and I, and I agree that the periodic update, the way this is worded related to the XBB lineage in this in the committee discussion question may not be the best way to, to, to word this. I'm curious whether the FDA is thinking similarly, whether um, the committee would get together on a, you know, a bi-yearly basis to review data and evaluate whether there would be an a, a, a opportunity to update the vaccine similar to what the WHO is doing and similar to how we do this on a yearly basis uh, for flu. Dr. Marks, do you? Yeah, well, you know, actually we don't do it on a yearly basis for flu at FDA. We actually do it twice yearly because yeah, we actually well, also do it true. for the Southern Hemisphere. True, of so, course. Um, yeah. uh, we would probably, I, I think we agree with you completely that we would probably follow the WHO um, here and probably look at this twice yearly uh, as well, uh, because it probably does make sense. Um, uh, and, and I think our, our sponsors would probably like us to do this as well, because uh, I think Dr. Rai's point was very well taken, um, uh, that, that, um, uh, that, that, that um, we need to uh, think about not just the Northern Hemisphere, but uh, the Southern Hemisphere uh, middle latitudes as well. Dr. So, Gellin. Dr. Monto, can I, yeah. can I make a quick comment to Jerry? Yes, please. Uh, I, I remind you that when we laid this out in the previous meetings, we agreed to do this at least once a year. And then we would listen to, we would obviously follow the science all year long. Uh, and we will clearly take this back and discuss whether it needs to be on some regularly scheduled basis or not. But again, we, we said we would do it at least once a year at a minimum. And I think we all will, will continue to follow the science and follow the virus and see what's needed. Over. Dr. Gellin. So um, wordsmithing by committee is never a good thing to do. So um, let's, we shouldn't be doing that here. But I do think we, do, we need to think about the words that we're using. Um, campaign, booster, periodicity, up to date, fully vaccinated, what's a booster? Um, there's been a lot of confusion. And maybe that now that the pandemic is over, I think we can at least agree that they have been declared over. Uh, we can use that as an inflection point to try to think about our language going forward. There is, or used to be at the FDA, a risk communication advisory committee. It looks like they're paused for now, but somebody who should, should take a look at the way we communicate all this stuff to make sure that uh, we're sending the right messages and setting the right expectations. Thanks. Dr. Levy. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? 
We sure can. Okay. So we can't see you. Okay, you could see me now. Just getting my light on. So I think our our discussion reflects uh, the challenges of where we are now. We have safe and effective vaccines that are saving lives. We have some degree of public confusion, and we have a virus that continues to change and uncertainty about how often we're going to have to update the vaccine. And so in that framework, I, I, I'm, I'd love to hear from FDA uh, whether they continue to advocate with the other branches of our government regarding ongoing um, innovation in this space. Uh, can we develop pan-coronavirus vaccines? Can we develop vaccines that are adjuvanted and provide uh, a longer and more durable and broader immunity? Um, there are certain plans for, for ongoing research, clinical research. I'm not sure the commitment is still there on the preclinical end. And I'm, I, I'd love to hear from, from Peter Marks and others how they view the bigger picture here. Because if we're in a pattern where we have to keep making changes, chasing variants, it's a difficult pattern. Dr. Marx, do you wish to comment? It's not on the voting topic. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I think if the if the question is, do we think that we need a better generation of COVID? Is that is that I mean, I think I think no one will disagree. And I certainly won't yeah. that we need a better generation of, of, of vaccines um, that would offer a a better breath, duration, depth of protection. But I think we're here right now with what we have. Uh, and until uh, we see that next generation come, which probably is at least um, at, at least probably two years away at the, at the yeah. rate we're going. Yeah. No, thank we, you. We have Peter. we have a bridge that we need. Is that is that what you meant? I mean, yeah, I, think, that, yeah, and, and I totally and acknowledge this. And I think yeah. um, and Dr. Levy, that's a cross government question as well. Yeah. Well, I, and, I, and I think an we're hoping that well, we're FDA hoping question. that that people will continue to work on these. And I think that was, uh, there's been a fair amount of discussion around the government about trying to keep this moving through BARDA and their efforts and uh, uh, and others, because it is, it is uh, I think, a critical thing that we try to, to move these forward. Thank you. And that was as much for the U.S. public. I mean, between us, I think we know these things, but I think there's a lot of, you know, people are tired of the pandemic. People feel like we have vaccines, we're done. But I think our discussion here reflects the challenges ahead and the need for further innovation. Thank you. Dr. Sawyer, and I urge those who have not raised their hands to do so. We have a recycling of the same questioners, and some of our members have not been heard from. I'll be very brief. I just want to raise another point about the confusion that language may create. It'll depend on what ACIP recommends, but the use of seasonality and campaign automatically links this vaccine to influenza because that's the only virus for which we have a seasonal campaign at the moment, RSV pending. And so I, I do think if ACIP were to recommend this vaccine only for a subset of the population, and we're using this word campaign to talk about something influenza that everybody gets is going to create confusion and vice versa could happen if people, uh, if a subset of the population is recommended to get COVID vaccine, that same subset or those not in that subset may assume they no longer need influenza vaccine. So I think the language is important. Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, I thought I might uh, try to offer a friendly amendment to the language of the voting question, if that is allowed, uh, to say something like for the 2023, no mention of 2024, for the 2023 version, of COVID-19 vaccines in the US, does the committee recommend an update of the current vaccine composition to a monovalent XBV lineage? I believe that would take out some of the language that is troubling to my uh, fellow committee members. And I'd just like to point out there's been, yes, a number of people have mentioned seasonality and, and, and campaigns and things, but those words do not appear in the current version of the voting question. So it is important, I think, to communicate um, clearly and, and better with the public at large uh, to explain exactly what we're talking about here. But I believe that if we change the wording in the way that I suggested, 
that might take away some of the concerns that have been raised. Dr. Marks? Um, sorry, I, I would respectfully say that we we will be stuck with this for 2023, 2024, because the manufacturers will, as, as, as Novavax has said, if we decided, for instance, now even, that um, we were going to change the composition, this, this vaccine will be used into 2024. So um, with all due respect, I think we are selecting something that will be used in 2023, 2024. And for reasons that have to do with how we've worked with the manufacturers, I, th I think we are, we're selecting something that, that barring some new major development that requires agile public health response, we're dealing with a, 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 a vaccine that will be used from 2023 in through to 2024 um, for practical purposes. It's not, I, I, and, and I take, I very well take the point here that we don't want to talk about seasonality, that we don't want to talk about periodic, but for practical purposes, this is the vaccine composition for 20. I mean, if we want to say that we would, that, that do we believe in a monovalent XBB vaccine uh, for, uh, the 2023, 2024 vaccine composition, leaving aside periodic and leaving aside anything else. I think I can certainly live with that. Um, but I think it, it, for practical purposes, it's 2023, 2024. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Caslow to see if he has any, I'm uh, happy, happy if you disagree, uh, David, but, uh, let's, let's just, uh, try to make sure we're, we're on the same page on this. I, <laughs> I'm just wondering if we're all conceptually on the same page and we're, we're dealing with, you know, um, word details and, and, and that sort of thing. I think what we'd really like to hear is, is conceptually, are we all on the same page, which is we're going to move. First, we need a periodic update. Second, it's time to move from the current bivalent to monovalent. Yes, we may need to move to a bivalent in the future if the evidence suggests that, but the evidence today suggests that it's a monovalent. And, um, and that monovalent should probably be in the XBB lineage. And to Dr. Marx's point, the opportunity to change this again in 2023 or early 2024, I think is remote. Remote, but possible if there are dramatic developments. That is correct. Okay. I mean, I think, I think we have commitment from the government to uh, obviously we'll mobilize just like we would for influenza. We would mobilize and, and move as in, in dramatic measure. If it, if, if, if a variant appears that escapes the ability of our current protection, in other words, starts to uh, uh, to cause mortality in young individuals who are immune to the current um, who, who have been previously immunized or who have previously had COVID-19, in other words, an escape variant, um, I think we would we would mobilize to try to get something regardless of when it would be um, as quickly as possible. But for practical purposes, um, there, you know, I think as fast as it can be done, it's it's probably a, a a ninety to hundred day lag between when we see that variant and 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 mobilize to do so, and when we'd actually have it. So, um, even it, it, just for practical purposes, you can see that 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 this this current selection will likely take us uh, into the new year, and hopefully, we won't have something appear in the next two or three months that. Um, will require us to scramble. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to support the voting question. I'm. I think moving to a monovalent is is uh, a good idea at this point. There's no reason to continue using the Wuhan strain, and I think the evidence is good that the ex, this currently circulating XPB is the correct strain to use. Thank you, and let's follow Dr. Wharton's example and stick to the discussion of the voting question, Dr. Hildred. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, I agree with moving to a monovalent XBB lineage vaccine, but I'm also concerned that we 
remove any barriers to people choosing to use the Novavax vaccine. So I think there's great value in a heterogeneous approach to vaccination. So even those who've gotten the mRNA vaccine should have access to the Novavax if they choose to do so, as I would if I have the ability to do that. And I know what you just said, but I do want to mention the fact that now that the public health emergency has been declared over, I want to make sure that there's a provision made for those who don't have medical insurance to actually have access to the vaccines, because if they don't, they don't have access, then we can't have the public health benefit that we are all hoping for here. So those are those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Very important comments. Dr. Berger. Thanks. I will try and make my comments very specific to the three questions you asked, Arnold, and I do have a question for FDA after that. Uh, so, so should there be a change? Clearly, the, the data suggests that the old variants are no longer circulating. XBB is. So, yes, um, it makes sense. Um, should it be monovalent? It, it seems like that gives us a, a good um, response, uh, and, and there doesn't seem to be an advantage over the bivalent. So, yes, I, I, I do do think it should be monovalent. And your last question is, should it be XBB? As I said at the beginning, yes. Um, I do have a question for FDA along these lines, though, and, and especially in terms of the transparency that, Peter, you were, you were saying. Uh, I, I think the data that we're, we've seen so far, at least presented, suggests that the current vaccine actually is no longer detecting the current circulating viruses. And I'm wondering if FDA plans to make, you know, say anything about the currently available vaccines before this, and I'll use the terminology that's here, which is the 2023-2024 formulation that will consist, uh, presumably, of the monovalent XBB lineage. Question for FDA. So if this is this is Peter, I just want to make sure. So what you're what you're saying is, given the uh, the decreased effectiveness of the current vaccines relative to uh, what we expect from this new generation, what would we um, would we make some statement at this point? Yes, that that's exactly. In other what words, saying. because the vaccine is still available and being administered, the bivalent. Correct. You know, I, I think we can, I can, let me just ask David, David, Dr. Caslow, if he'd like to comment on this and then I can comment on it. I mean, currently what we have available are um, three authorized um, vaccines, two of which are bivalent, one of which is the original, which is the original monovalent. And back in April, we took a look at, as part of the um, consolidation, to look at the available evidence. And at that time, <laughs> demonstrated that that bivalent across all ages and all doses provided a favorable benefit risk. I think I think what we would probably say, the way we would say this is that in the absence of having these updated vaccines, um, that versus nothing in in an older age group this does provide uh some benefit right um I, I do think there will we will have to have some conversation um with our colleagues at cdc uh because at a certain point uh as these become available we probably want to make it clear to providers that it's not advisable to give additional boosters prior to um uh, to wanting to give one of these updated vaccines. So I think that point is well taken, if that's what the question, I think that might've been implicit in that question. And, and that that point is well taken, and we can take that back to discuss with our CDC colleagues. Yeah, that, that's where I was getting at. So thank got, you. Got it. So p p that point, thank you for, that point's very yeah, well that's taken. that's an important because, point. Yes, because we, we, would, we would agree that probably uh, sometime in the next month or two, people should stop, uh, even if they were considering. So, so totally agree, and and we can take that back uh, for a discussion. Thank you. Because for all that that is going to depend as well on the amount of time you have to wait to get the new booster. Yeah, and and we also heard I can't remember which manufacturer this was. Um, they may even have theirs available if it is the XBB one point five. Um, it could be as, it, available as soon as July. So we aren't talking far off into the future. Point well taken, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Nelson. 
Thank you, Dr. Monto. I commented earlier, but I want to go back to the four key question framework to address this question that Jerry Ware so eloquently outlined at the beginning of his remarks. So for me, yes to new circulating variants being antigenically distinct, yes to new variants being dominant, yes, data supports current vaccine is losing efficacy against emerging variants, and yes, thanks to industry and our manufacturing presenters today for conducting that at-risk manufacturing in the studies that we now have data supporting better efficacy with the candidate vaccines under discussion. To address the monovalent issue and the question, agree that for this year, given the consequence of immune imprinting with inclusion of legacy strains for this year, um, it does make perfect sense to move towards a monovalent vaccine. Whether that holds up for future years, I don't think we know at this point. Addressing the periodic issue, I get the intent of the question. So overall, yes, no matter whether you change it or not, that's probably how that will be how I'll be voting. I support periodic assessment and updating on a schedule to be determined in a generic fashion and certainly acknowledge and really don't have a whole lot of heartburn over annual planning factors. So once yearly expecting to revise this vaccine uh, due to practicality purposes, but also because the neutralization data that's been presented that shows that uh, cross reactivity does occur and it doesn't drift that much faster than over a single year. And I, too, am not ready to submit that this virus should be considered a, an exclusively fall or seasonal virus. Uh, and as I've said in the past, I don't think we should provide any language or communication that restricts its administration of the typical flu season. Uh, we currently have biphasic summer and fall peaks. Yes, they're smaller than they have been previously, but that summer peak is not going away. And I'm not sure we fully understand the risk of peak shifts as the population gets further away from their current primary boost, primary series and their booster doses, as well as their natural infections. Plus, we don't know what's going to happen to individuals who get a summertime infection, for example. Are they really going to be protected for the entire next year? So for those reasons, there's certainly a lot of work to be done with the periodic question, but the main answer to the question on the table is yes. Thank you. Dr. Hawkins. Oh, the data is not coming. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Monto. So I agree with the update. Um, as we know, persons are still dying of uh, COVID or having severe illness. We also have a substantial number of people who are vaccinated who are having uh, mild to moderate symptoms. I had a four or five in the last two weeks. Um, I, I believe that the FDA remains committed to surveillance, evaluating the science, and, and I believe they'll be as agile as possible, something that Dr. Marks mentioned a, a couple or statement back. So I have categories of patients who they're never vaccinated. They still won't take the vaccine despite what their losses are. We have a bunch of folks in my practice and in the community who will say, yes, give it to me as long as it's safe and the vaccine is safe. But we have a substantial number of maybes, folks who say, well, I'm not sure, Doc, what do you think? And so that's what the public is asking of us now. And I think that although we think about folks with mild symptoms, I wanna remind us all that some of these folks have mild symptoms that have really significant comorbidities and they exacerbate, they get hospitalized. And although they may be counted as a COVID-related death, they're, they're, they're losses too. So I think that we should, and I get the sense that we all agree, but I think that we need to be definitive in supporting this and perhaps not get caught up so much into the weeds of every word or every other word. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Two comments. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Levy raised an important point, but I, uh, as Dr. Mark said, um, BARDA is laser focused on next generation uh, vaccine and spending an enormous amount of time and effort uh, on what we can do to improve the current generation of vaccines. Secondly, um, 
I think that the reluctance among many people at this stage to get the vaccine is based on the reducing rates of severe disease. And that's what's going to drive uptake of this uh, of this uh, vaccine. And, and I agree with making a monovalent uh, XBB sublineage. But that's what's going to drive uptake. If this virus continues to decline in disease severity and in rates and approaches the four seasonal coronaviruses, then it's going to be difficult to convince many people uh, to get this vaccine. So I think that also has to be factored into the language that, that, that comes from the CDC. It has to be realistically aligned with hospitalizations and severe disease and death. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meisner. Dr. McGinnis. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I, I support um, the recommendation of an update uh, to the monovalent XBB. I, do, I remain, um, I, I don't like the periodic there. I think it's confusing two issues. I think this is a recommendation for an update. The second point is that periodic updates of available data for future strain changes should be continued. So I think these are two thoughts. I think that second sentence isn't necessary. It's what you do all the time, but if you want it there. But I don't like a periodic update to a monovalent XBB lineage. I don't think it makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm a part of the unanimity of this committee in thinking that the monovalent uh, XBB lineage update is, is necessary, uh, given the evidence that's, uh, that's presented to us today. Um, but, uh, but perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, as, a, as, a, as a minority on the on the use of 2023 or 2024, and possibly the use of the uh, the, le- the the term periodic, I, I it, you know it wasn't that long ago that we were actually talking and and uh, talking about the twindemic um, and and discussing the need to get uh, get try to get ahead of the curve. Uh, given what we know about coronavirus, given what we know about it, its seasonality, and given what we know about influenza, and uh, uh, and and the impact that, that that these diseases will have together uh, on the American public, and and we were talking about uh, how to leverage the, uh, the the system, the infrastructure that we uh, that we currently have uh, with the with the influenza vaccination uh, efforts to try to promote the uptake of the uh, of the COVID vaccine, and. And I, I really don't want us to lose, uh, for us, don't want us to lose track of that. And, uh, and the fact that we can use what we currently have, uh, we can make all these recommendations, but if there's, if the, if the system isn't set up to, uh, to promote the uptake, then I think the, the, the recommendations are, are limited. Um, so I actually am in favor of, uh, of, um, of, Using some of the language that we are using for influenza uh, to see about uh, see about adding adding more oomph to the campaign uh, to promote the uptake of the COVID vaccine along the lines of uh, influenza vaccine and anything else that we might need deem necessary uh, based on what we currently know, not necessarily based on what we expect to happen or hope to happen or the things that might happen down the line. So. Uh, so I, I think we we really do need to uh, to try to be consistent with our messaging, and that has been our message uh, in the in the last two three years. Thank you, Dr. Kim and Dr. Perlman. Last question before we vote: no more, no additional hands raised. Voting is going to come. Yeah, so I just wanted to comment because I agree with both the the import or the goal of this question and also the some of the caveats that have been raised by uh, the committee. I think that one thing I'd like to just agree with even more is the comments that 
Dr. Offit and Dr. Meisner made about who should get this vaccine, because this is part of the messaging. And in the rest of the world, I believe, I don't, I didn't hear Dr. Subaral talk about this, but I believe even the WHO said that only select populations should get the vaccine. And so we, we have to deal, I think, with both the worldwide situation and the fact that uh, so few people are getting boosted with the bivalent vaccine. So I think the messaging that the FDA and the CDC do together is really critical in moving forward. But you, I don't know that if this virus keeps circulating to high levels, it may well be that people are boosted all the time and that the need for a vaccine will be less apparent uh, for those people, not for everybody. But anyway, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. So now, can we pull up the voting question so I can read it? Uh, Dr. Monto, this is Peter Marks. Um, yep. it, 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 because I, I think I think we can certainly make one change to this to try to make it a little bit simpler for people who may be having heartburn. I, I and not that I. Uh, not, not that I want to deny the makers of calcium carbonate products um, some <laughs> uh, uh, some uh, takers, but maybe we could remove the uh, uh, the word periodic there. Just recommend an update of the current vaccine composition, and that that way some people might just feel better about this. I, right, it taken. really is unnecessary. Right. Okay. Dr. Monto, if you would be kind, let me read my um, my um, um, statement, and then we will have you read the voting question. Does that make sense? So, um, so uh, we have ten regular members and eleven temporary voting members. A total of twenty-one will be voting in today's meeting. Um, as you can see, the names on the slide. Uh, with regards to the voting process, Dr. Monto will read the voting question for the record, and afterwards right. the AV staff will move all non-voting members and FDA um, staff out of the main room. Only the voting members and the DFOs will be in the main voting room. For those non-voting members, please do not log out of the Zoom. We'll be with you after the voting has concluded. Once all non-voting members are moved out of the main room, all regular voting members and temporary voting members will be shown the polling pod on their screens. And I will ask that they cast their votes by selecting one of the three voting options, which includes yes, no, or abstain. You'll have one minute to cast your vote. After um, the question is read, please note that once you have cast your vote, uh, you will change your vote within the one minute time frame. I'll announce when the voting poll has closed. At that point, all votes will be considered final. Once all of the votes have been tallied, we will broadcast the results and read the individual votes allowed for the public record. Does anyone have any questions related to the voting question before we begin? If not, um, Dr. Monte, if you would be kind to please read the voting question for the record. Okay, are you going to put it up? There it is. Okay. For the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines in the U.S., does the committee recommend an update, no word periodic, an update of the current vaccine composition to a monovalent XBB lineage? Yes, no, or abstain? Great. Thank you. At this point, I ask the AV team, please go ahead and move all non-voting members out of the main room. Uh, please don't log out of the Zoom. We'll be with you in a few minutes.
you are ready to display. Great. Yeah, I see the Excel sheet, please. Devante, can you also move people back into the main room? I need the Excel display so for the public to see. Great, thank you. There are 21 total voting members for today's meeting. The vote is unanimous. We have 21 out of 21 yes votes. Um, here are the voting responses for each voting member. I'll read them aloud for the public record. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Mark Sawyer, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Stephen Pergam, yes. Dr. Michael Nelson, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Eric Rubin, yes. Dr. Jeanette Lee, yes. Dr. Honor Arnold Monto, yes. Dr. Arthur Rangel, yes. Dr. Cody Meissner, yes. Dr. Bruce Gellin, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, yes. Dr. Sandy Perlman, yes. Dr. James Hildreth, yes. Dr. Melinda Wharton, yes. Dr. Randy Hawkins, yes. Dr. Ofer Levy, yes. Dr. Henry Bernstein, yes. Dr. David Kim, yes. Dr. Pamela McInnes, yes. This concludes the voting portion for today's meeting. I'll now hand over the meeting back to Dr. Monto for the committee for the vote explanation and discussion topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Monto. Thank you. And uh, if any of the committee wishes to explain their votes, please raise your hands. I'm not going to go around and call on everybody because we have the discussion topic to get to yet, which is going to require uh, some of our time. So if you'd like to explain your vote, please raise your hand. Dr. Cohen. Thanks. I just, I think, um, as you can see by the vote, um, this was really very well presented and very straightforward in terms of the data uh, informing this particular question around the actual um, composition of this vaccine. Um, I do just want to say that I really appreciate FDA um, and Dr. Marx's explanation around this expectation that we should only anticipate a, a, a strain change under normal circumstances once a year. I think that actually helps frame this better in the future. And I hope that we can get to a place where there's at least a regularly scheduled knowing in advance when you're going to review um, the data with the committee um, uh, so we can get in a pretty um, uh, a, a regular routine of, of looking at this. So thank you. Thank you. Now let's move to the discussion topic. Dr. Ware, would you like to introduce that? I can if someone will flash it up. So yes. I can read it. <laughs> Although I and give us some it. guidance. Oh, okay. I don't know about the guidance part. But, uh, <laughs> because uh, we haven't, there are three men. There are three uh, yeah. okay. variants so mentioned that we have to project the discussion topic, please. Okay, based on, the, based on the evidence and other considerations presented, please discuss selection of a specific XBB lineage. For example, XBB 1.5, XBB 1.16, or XBB 2.3 for inclusion in the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines in the U.S. Uh, I don't have much guidance. You've heard everything there is to hear about the data available uh, among these three subvariants of the XBB family, for lack of a better word. Uh, I think it's fair to say it's not an easy choice. It may not even matter, but that's what we want to hear the committee discuss based on what they heard from uh, a decent amount of data from the manufacturers from their preclinical studies and one clinical study. Uh, other than that, no other guidance from me, but we'd appreciate your input and thoughts. Uh, for, over, for, over. Guidance, 
what if we decide that we don't have sufficient information to make a recommendation? What would you, you do say, then? You can say that, and that's fine, because you've already made a recommendation that the vaccine should be monovalent and XBB. Uh, you can make any comment, recommendation you want. We will take that into consideration and huddle again and see what we could, the best we can come up with to talk to the manufacturers. My final question, do you have, uh, do you envision a situation where one manufacturer may choose one variant and another manufacturer choose another, or do you wish all of the manufacturers to use the same variant? I wish they would all use the same. And before today, I would have said that's more of a possibility than after what I've heard today. But again, I guess any of this could happen. Dr. Marks. Yeah, no, I, I think ideally we'd like to have the composition be similar. And I think it's not unreasonable um, in order to guide the discussion at this hour. I, I, I think what you heard from the manufacturers um, is that um, uh, that the XBB 1.5 looks like it, it, it seems to be um, at the front of the line because of some of what uh, what is available in terms of its manufacturing and and its properties. So it might be helpful to hear a discussion of anyone who thinks about that we should consider the other variants. Uh, instead, I mean, because I think that if, if everyone, uh, just by way of full transparency, if everyone says that there's uh, there's no uh, preference in the committee, my guess is that I, I, although I can't say for sure, but my guess is we would go back and and go towards XBB 1.5. So it might be good to hear discussion of of any any thoughts for things other than 1.5, in part because. Uh, that would allow the composition to be similar for all of the vaccines to be made available in a very timely manner. Um, uh, and because the data seem to show that that uh, that that uh, particular variant seems to have very good neutralization against uh, the, uh, across this this group of XBB variants, including 2.3 over. Thank you. That's exactly what I was hoping you would say, Dr. Ru Dr. Rubin. Well, there's not that much to add to uh, to that. Um, the data we've been presented with show us really no difference among any of these, and it comes down then, I think, and they're reassuring, in fact, that uh, there is a lot of cross-neutralization uh, for, uh, at least in the animal models for 1.5 and 1.116 and in the clinical, uh, uh, and in the uh, small number of patients who've gotten them. Given that, it's a practical question. Um, the um, manufacturers have already been working with 1.5 and in some cases 1.16. Um, and the uh, WHO has given a sort of iffy endorsement of either one. Um, it seems like we should just follow, go practically and uh, whatever is simplest and best aligned. Thank you, Dr. Pergam. Yeah. I I tend to agree. I think, you know, it sounds like um, we would like to have a, a similar approach in terms of uh, the worldwide, you know, um, uh, vaccine component, if possible. I think we're in a different situation than we were last time um, when we were talking about, um, you know, BA1 versus BA4.5, where we actually had some data that suggested that BA4.5 might be a better choice. And we made that decision based on early data. Um, I don't think it seems as though the XBB viruses are that much different. My only question, and I think this is important, is if the vaccine is available and manufacturers can get it out, let's say, at the end of July, when would be the time that we would make this available for the public, knowing that there is waning of immunity if we're thinking of, again, this, if we're going to put coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 in a seasonality, um, and look for a fall winter season, what would be the timing of when we would roll this out? I think is, a, is the question that I think will be important to be thinking about. That's not up to us, it's up to ACIP and others, but I think it is gonna be an important decision. It, 
It's a very important question, but the problem is uh, I don't know that there's a very clear answer. I think the best I think the best I can suspect and and I'll ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Caslow uh, to comment too is given there's the manufacturing issues and then there's the supply issues and uh, other uh, regulatory issues. Um, my guess is we're, we're we're looking at something in the September time frame uh, for seeing a rollout, but don't hold me exactly uh, exactly to it, but I think September ish sounds correct. Dr. Caslow, thoughts? Yep, that's what I agree with you, uh, Dr. Marks. Um, and to get back to an earlier conversation, I mean, there's other evidence gaps that need to be filled in order to get these up, approved, and some of them may still be in the authorized versus uh, approved status. So September but 7th. Just, just, so right. you're, just, so you're, just so you know that our short-term recall is, in, is intact, um, I think from Dr. Pergam's question, uh, that does mean that we will recognize that in the not too distant future, we have to work with our CDC colleagues to make some statement about whether people should uh, continue to further get the uh, current uh, vaccine. So we'll take that back. So don't worry, that 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 is on the list. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Dr. Wharton. Uh, thank you. What we what we've seen suggests that um, there's not there's not much difference uh, in terms of the immune response with these uh, three specific lineages. Um, the that the 1.5 looks good. Uh, it seems like it's the most feasible to get across the finish line um, early without resulting in delays in availability. And um, the vaccine we can use is the vaccine that we can get. And so it, it feels like this would be a, a good choice. And it's, and it's great that we've actually been able to see as much information today about it as we've been able to see, including the, the one clinical study. So um, thanks to everybody for providing uh, a, a pretty robust body of data for review today. Dr. Sawyer. Putting aside the discussion of seasonality and periodicity in campaigns, uh, I do, we all expect this infection to come back in the winter time. So I, I agree with Dr. Hildreth's comments that it's important that people have the choice and that we have as many vaccines as possible. Given the timeline for the Novavax product, I would argue that we should at least include 1.5 among the recommended strains because that's the one they've already started producing. I'm indifferent as to whether we allow the other manufacturers to use 1.16 or 2.3. Thank you, Dr. Gellin. Yeah, echoing sort of what Peter was saying, I, I think consistency is a good thing, um, but I would look to, I mean, I, I was glad Jerry gave us the language from the other regulatory bodies. We might want to look at some of those because for the most part, they, um, implied fle the flexibility. So I think as uh, Dr. Rubo was saying, I think it is a practical one for which one of these work in best in the hands of the manufacturers. But I, I'd also want to make sure a couple of things, that there are systems in place down the road to actually evaluate if there are differences, what we might learn from them during the season. Um, and as far as labeling, you hate to have people say, well, I got 1.16 and you got this. So, this, so somehow we should signal that these are interchangeable, whatever the right word is, so that these are seen as equivalent. Thanks. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Monto. I would throw in my support for 1.5, five rationale for it. First, we heard data today that 1.5 is the best immunogen overall of the three under consideration. Uh, there's good cross-neutralization data is number two. Number three, inferring from the presentations, the three manufacturers clearly are preferred to proceed with this particular variant and can make it available, which improves accessibility. Number four, given that we are committed to be making evidence-based decisions, overall, the greatest data is indeed available for 1.5 and not some of the newer variants that are on the table. And then the fifth one is this issue of harmonization that uh, both globally and uh, nationally. So thank you. Dr. Levy. 
I would agree with my other colleagues that uh, the XBB 1.5 makes sense for the reasons stated. Uh, as we look to the future to improve our processes, whether investments in, in approaches at forecasting trajectories of new variants, machine learning approaches, that's something the government should look at as an area to improve so that in the future we, we get at forecasting. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so, so I agree with that recommendation too. I think one point is that we may well in the next month find that XBB 0.1.16 or XBB 0.2.3 become more dominant than XBB 0.1.5. And this doesn't matter though, because I think we have good data that there's really good cross reactivity within the S protein and that other parts of the virus may matter. So wouldn't, we, as we communicate this, we should make it clear that even though the name changes for the S protein, there's not that many changes. So this, this should work just fine. Thank you. So in summary, we, gener we in general feel that the XBB 1.5 would be uh, preferred. We don't have any strong feelings about using other variants, but the fact that uh, most of the manufacturers are ready to work on an XBB 1.5 is an added reason to select this strain or this variant uh, given uh, the immunologic data. And uh, we've always made the, pro the, the point that we're not chasing variants. And even if other variants uh, in, in this XBB lineage become more prominent, the XBB 1.5 seems to elicit appropriate antibodies. And uh, I think that is a wrap in terms of our meeting. Um, I'll turn the floor over to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, director, who I think is going to make some closing comments. Uh, th thanks, thanks, Dr. Monto. I, I first of all, let me uh, just thank people uh, for a minute. I, I want to thank. Um, all of the advisory committee members for a, a really good discussion. Um, really appreciate the input. And um, I, I think we're very sensitive here to making sure we try to do our best to get it right, to get the most people who should be vaccinated, vaccinated, to have the most confidence in those vaccines uh, that are deployed. And we'll do that working with our CDC partners. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. Um, uh, we really appreciate the input. I want to also thank um, uh, the uh, presenters today uh, from CDC, uh, WHO, uh, and our open public hearing participants, um, uh, a, 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 as well as a, a real thanks uh, to our advisory committee staff and our AV staff who have uh, really uh, pulled this off. It's really wonderful to have uh, essentially, uh, these these meetings really work nicely and flawlessly um, uh, as they did today. So thank you so much for that. Um, and finally, I just want to say uh, that, you know, just to, to say what we heard today um, um, is that uh, uh, we, we did hear uh, the uh, recommendation for uh, an updated uh, composition. Uh, to an XBB-containing uh, monovalent vaccine. Uh, we did hear the preference for an XBB 1.5 um, uh, vaccine, um, and we'll make a decision quickly regarding the specific composition to re recommend to manufacturers uh, for uh, the, the, uh, the coming uh, season. Uh, I think our, our decision obviously will incorporate uh, what uh, we've heard today, and I, I don't think it will come as any surprise <laughs> based on the discussion today. Um, uh, and then we anticipate that the manufacturers will be um, uh, moving forward uh, with uh, manufacturing and then uh, obtaining data and filings needed uh, to inform our ultimate FDA actions um, uh, in order to have 
uh, vaccines evaluated um, uh, with our safety and effectiveness uh, standards uh, for availability in the September timeframe. So I uh, really wanna appreciate um, all of the feedback um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I should also thank, uh, I did for, forget one group, uh, thank the sponsors for really doing a wonderful job um, uh, providing uh, uh, the information um, which really helped us uh, come to this uh, uh, as easily uh, as I think we were able to today. So thank you everyone and uh, really appreciate everyone's effort here. Great, thank you Dr. Marx. Um, I also wanted to thank the committee and CBER staff for working so hard to make this meeting a productive meeting. Um, I now call the meeting officially adjourned at 4.27 p.m. Eastern time. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Recording stopped.